Chapter 24 The Coral Realm The next day I woke up with my head unusually clear. Much to my surprise, I was in my stateroom. No doubt my companions had been put back in their cabin without noticing it any more than I had. Like me, they would have no idea what took place during the night, and to unravel this mystery I could count only on some future happenstance. I then considered leaving my stateroom. Was I free, or still a prisoner? Perfectly free. I opened my door, headed down the gangways, and climbed the central companionway. Hatches that had been closed the day before were now open. I arrived on the platform. Ned Land and Conseil were waiting for me. I questioned them. They knew nothing. Lost in a heavy sleep of which they had no memory, they were quite startled to be back in their cabin. As for the Nautilus, it seemed as tranquil and mysterious as ever. It was cruising on the surface of the waves at a moderate speed. Nothing seemed to have changed on board. Ned Land observed the sea with his penetrating eyes. It was deserted. The Canadian sighted nothing new on the horizon, neither sail nor shore. A breeze was blowing noisily from the west, and disheveled by the wind, long billows made the submersible roll very noticeably. After renewing its air, the Nautilus stayed at an average depth of fifteen meters, enabling it to return quickly to the surface of the waves. And, contrary to custom, it executed such a maneuver several times during that day of January 19. The chief officer would then climb onto the platform, and his usual phrase would ring through the ship's interior. As for Captain Nemo, he didn't appear. Of the other men on board, I saw only my emotionless steward, who served me with his usual moot efficiency. Near two o'clock, I was busy organizing my notes in the lounge, when the captain opened the door and appeared. I bowed to him. He gave me an almost imperceptible bow in return, without saying a word to me. I resumed my work, hoping he might give me some explanation of the previous afternoon's events. He did nothing of the sort. I stared at him. His face looked exhausted. His reddened eyes hadn't been refreshed by sleep. His facial features expressed profound sadness, real chagrin. He walked up and down, sat and stood, picked up a book at random, discarded it immediately, consulted his instruments without taking his customary notes, and seemed unable to rest easy for an instant. Finally, he came over to me and said, Are you a physician, Professor Achona? This inquiry was so unexpected that I stared at him a good while without replying. Are you a physician? he repeated. Several of your scientific colleagues took their degrees in medicine, such as Graciolet, Moncantendon, and others. That's right, I said. I am a doctor. I used to be on call at the hospitals. I was in practice for several years before joining the museum. Excellent, sir. My reply obviously pleased Captain Nemo, but not knowing what he was diving at, I waited for further questions, ready to reply as circumstances dictated. Professor Achona, the captain said to me, would you consent to give your medical attentions to one of my men? Someone is sick? Yes. I'm ready to go with you. Come. I admit that my heart was pounding. Lord knows why, but I saw a definite connection between the sick crewmen and yesterday's happenings, and the mystery of those events concerned me at least as much as the man's sickness. Captain Nemo led me to the Nautilus's stern and invited me into a cabin located next to the sailor's quarters. On a bed there lay a man some forty years old, with strongly moulded features, the very image of an Anglo-Saxon. I bent over him. Not only was he sick, he was wounded. Swathed in blood-soaked linen, his head was resting on a folded pillow. 
I undid the linen bandages, while the wounded man gazed with great staring eyes, and let me proceed without making a single complaint. It was a horrible wound. The cranium had been smashed open by some blunt instrument, leaving the naked brains exposed, and the cerebral matter had suffered deep abrasions. Blood clots had formed in this dissolving mass, taking on the color of wine dregs. Both contusion and concussion of the brain had occurred. The sick man's breathing was labored, and muscle spasms quivered in his face. Cerebral inflammation was complete, and had brought on a paralysis of movement and sensation. I took the wounded man's pulse. It was intermittent. The body's extremities were already growing cold, and I saw that death was approaching without any possibility of my holding it in check. After dressing the poor man's wound, I redid the linen bandages around his head, and I turned to Captain Nemo. How did he get this wound? I asked him. That's not important, the captain replied evasively. The Nautilus suffered a collision that cracked one of the engine levers, and it struck this man. My chief officer was standing beside him. This man leaped forward to intercept the blow. A brother lays down his life for his brother, a friend of his friend. What could be simpler? That's the law for everyone on board the Nautilus, but what's your diagnosis of his condition? I hesitated to speak my mind. You may talk freely, the captain told me. This man doesn't understand French. I took a last look at the wounded man, then I replied. This man will be dead in two hours. Nothing can save him. Nothing. Captain Nemo clenched his fists, and tears slid from his eyes, which I had thought incapable of weeping. For a few moments more I observed the dying man, whose life was ebbing little by little. He grew still more pale under the electric light that bathed his deathbed. I looked at his intelligent head, furrowed with premature wrinkles that misfortune, perhaps, misery had etched long before. I was hoping to detect the secret of his life in the last words that might escape from his lips. You may go, Professor Ahona, Captain Nemo told me. I left the captain in the dying man's cabin, and I repaired to my stateroom very moved by this scene. All day long I was a quiver with gruesome forebodings. At night I slept poorly, and between my fitful dreams I thought I heard a distant moaning, like a funeral dirge. Was it a prayer for the dead, murmured in that language I couldn't understand? The next morning I climbed on deck. Captain Nemo was already there. As soon as he saw me he came over. Professor, he said to me, Would it be convenient for you to make an underwater excursion today? With my companions, I asked. If they're agreeable. We're yours to command, Captain. Then kindly put on your diving suits. As for the dead or dying man, he hadn't come into the picture. I rejoined Ned Land and Conseil. I informed them of Captain Nemo's proposition. Conseil was eager to accept, and this time the Canadian proved perfectly amenable to going with us. It was eight o'clock in the morning. By eight-thirty we were suited up for this new stroll, and equipped with our two devices for lightning and breathing. The double door opened, and accompanied by Captain Nemo with a dozen crewmen following, we set foot on the firm seafloor where the Nautilus was resting, ten meters down. A gentle slope gravitated to an uneven bottom whose depth was about fifteen fathoms. This bottom was completely different from the one I had visited during my first excursion under the waters of the Pacific Ocean. 
Here I saw no fine grain sand, no underwater prairies, not one open sea forest. I immediately recognized the wondrous region in which Captain Nemo did the honors that day. It was the Coral Realm. In the Zoophyte branch, class Alcyonarian, one finds the order Gorgonarian, which contains three groups, sea fans, insidian polyps, and coral polyps. It's in this last that precious coral belongs, an unusual substance that, at different times, has been classified in the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms. Medicine to the ancients, jewelry to the moderns, it wasn't decisively placed in the animal kingdom until 1694 by Personnel of Marseille. A coral is a unit of tiny animals assembled over a polypary that's brittle and stony in nature. These polyps have a unique gathering mechanism that reproduces them via the budding process. And they have an individual existence while also participating in a communal life. Hence they embody a sort of natural socialism. I was familiar with the latest research on this bizarre zoophyte, which turns to stone while taking on a tree form, as some naturalists have very aptly observed. And nothing could have been more fascinating to me than to visit one of these petrified forests that nature had planted on the bottom of the sea. We turned on our Rumcorf devices and went along a coral shoal in the process of forming, which, given time, will some day close off this whole part of the Indian Ocean. Our path was bordered by hopelessly tangled bushes, formed from snarls of shrubs all covered with little star-shaped, white-streaked flowers. Only, contrary to plants on shore, these tree forms become attached to rocks on the seafloor by heading from top to bottom. Our lights produced a thousand delightful effects while playing over these brightly coloured boughs. I fancied I saw three cylindrical, membrane-filled tubes trembling beneath the water's undulations. I was tempted to gather their fresh petals, which were adorned with delicate tentacles, some newly in bloom, others barely opened, while nimble fish with fluttering fins brushed past them like flocks of birds. But if my hands came near the moving flowers of these sensitive, lively creatures, an alarm would instantly sound throughout the colony. The white petals retracted into their red sheaths, the flowers vanished before my eyes, and the bush changed into a chunk of stony nipples. Sheer chance had placed me in the presence of the most valuable specimens of this zoophyte. The coral was the equal of those fished up from the Mediterranean off the Barbary coast or the shores of France and Italy. With its bright colours, it lived up to those poetic names of blood flower and blood foam that the industry confers of its finest exhibits. Coral sells for as much as five hundred pounds per kilogram, and in this locality the liquid strata hid enough to make the fortunes of a whole host of coral fishermen. This valuable substance often merges with other polyparies, forming compact hopelessly tangled units known as Masciota, and I noted some wonderful pink samples of this coral. But as the bushes shrank, these tree forms magnified, actual petrified thickets and long alcoves from some fantastic school of architecture kept opening up before our steps. Captain Nemo entered beneath a dark gallery whose gentle slope took us to a depth of one hundred meters. The light from our glass coils produced magical effects at times, lingering on the wrinkled roughness of some natural arch, or some overhang suspended like a chandelier, which our lamps flecked with fiery sparks. Amid these shrubs of precious coral, I observed other polyps no less unusual. Melita coral, rainbow coral with jointed outgrowths, then a few tufts of genus Coralina, some green and others red, Actually, a type of seaweed encrusted with limestone salts, which, after long disputes, naturalists have finally placed in the vegetable kingdom. But as one intellectual has remarked, here, perhaps, is the actual point where life rises humbly out of slumbering stone, but without breaking away from its crude starting point. Finally, after two hours of walking, we reached a depth of about three hundred meters. 
in other words, the lowermost limit at which coral can begin to form. But here it was no longer some isolated bush or a modest grove of low timber. It was an immense forest, huge mineral vegetation, enormous petrified trees, linked by garlands of elegant hydras from the genus Pulmularia, those tropical creepers of the sea, all decked out in shades and gleams. We passed freely under their lofty boughs, lost up in the shadows of the waves, while at our feet organ pipe coral, stony coral, star coral, fungus coral, and sea anemone from the genus Caryophilia formed a carpet of flowers, all strewn with dazzling gems. What an indescribable sight! Oh, if only we could share our feelings! Why were we imprisoned behind these masks of metal and glass? Why were we forbidden to talk with each other? At least let us lead the lives of the fish that populate this liquid element, or better yet, the lives of amphibians, which can spend long hours either at sea or on shore, travelling through their double domain as their whims dictate. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo had called a halt. My companions and I stopped walking, and turning around, I saw the crewmen form a semicircle around their leader. Looking with greater care, I observed that four of them were carrying on their shoulders an object that was oblong in shape. At this locality we stood in the centre of a huge clearing surrounded by the tall tree forms of this underwater forest. Our lamps cast a sort of brilliant twilight over the area, making inordinately long shadows on the sea floor. Past the boundaries of the clearing, the darkness deepened again relieved only by little sparkles given off by the sharp crests of coral. Ned Land and Conseil stood next to me. We stared, and it dawned on me that I was about to witness a strange scene. Observing the sea floor, I saw that it swelled at certain points from low bulges that were encrusted with limestone deposits and arranged with a symmetry that betrayed the hand of man. In the middle of the clearing, on a pedestal of roughly piled rocks, there stood a cross of coral, extending long arms you would have thought were made of petrified blood. At a signal from Captain Nemo, one of his men stepped forward and, a few feet from this cross, detached a mattock from his belt and began to dig a hole. I finally understood. This clearing was a cemetery. This hole, a grave. That oblong object, the body of the man who must have died during the night. Captain Nemo and his men had come to bury their companion in this communal resting place on this inaccessible ocean floor. No, my mind was reeling as never before. Never had ideas of such impact raced through my brain. I didn't want to see what my eyes saw. Meanwhile, the grave digging went slowly. Fish fled here and there as their retreat was disturbed. I heard the pick ringing on the limestone soil, its iron tip sometimes giving off sparks when it hit a stray piece of flint on the sea bottom. The hole grew longer, wider, and soon was deep enough to receive the body. Then the pallbearers approached, wrapped in white fabric made from filaments of the fan muscle. The body was lowered into its watery grave. Captain Nemo, arms crossed over his chest, knelt in a posture of prayer, as did all the friends of him who had loved them. My two companions and I bowed reverently. The grave was then covered over with the rubble dug from the seafloor, and it formed a low mound. When this was done, Captain Nemo and his men stood up. Then they all approached the grave sank again on bended knee, and extended their hand in a sign of final farewell. Then the funeral party went back up the path to the Nautilus, returning beneath the arches of the forest, through the thickets along the coral bushes, going steadily higher. Finally the ship's rays appeared, their luminous trail guided us to the Nautilus. By one o'clock we had returned. After changing clothes, I climbed onto the platform, and in the grip of dreadfully obsessive thoughts, I sat next to the beacon. 
Captain Nemo rejoined me. I stood up and said to him, So, as I predicted, that man died during the night? Yes, Professor Arjona, Captain Nemo replied. And now he rests beside his companions in that coral cemetery? Yes, forgotten by the world, but not by us. We dig the graves, then entrust the polyps with sealing away our dead for eternity. And with a sudden gesture, the captain hid his face in his clenched fists, vainly trying to hold back a sob. Then he added, There lies our peaceful cemetery, hundreds of feet beneath the surface of the waves. At least, Captain, your dead can sleep serenely there, out of the reach of sharks. Yes, sir. Captain Nemo replied solemnly, of sharks and men. Chapter 25 The Indian Ocean Now we begin the second part of this voyage under the seas. The first ended in that moving scene at the Coral Cemetery, which left a profound impression on my mind. And so Captain Nemo would live out his life entirely in the heart of this immense sea, and even his grave lay ready in its impenetrable depths. There the last sleep of the Nautilus's occupants, friends bound together in death as in life, would be disrupted by no monster of the deep. No man either, the captain had had it. Always that same fierce, implacable defiance of human society. As for me, I was no longer content with the hypotheses that satisfied Conseil. That fine lad persisted in seeing the Nautilus's commander as merely one of those unappreciated scientists who repay humanity's indifference with contempt. For Conseil, the captain was still a misunderstood genius who, tired of the world's deceptions, had been driven to take refuge in this inaccessible environment where he was free to follow his instincts. But to my mind, this hypothesis explained only one side of Captain Nemo. In fact, the mystery of that last afternoon when we were locked in prison and put to sleep, the captain's violent precaution of snatching from my grasp a spyglass poised to scour the horizon, and the fatal wound given that man during some unexplained collision suffered by the Nautilus, all led me down a plain trail. No, Captain Nemo wasn't content simply to avoid humanity. His fearsome submersible served not only his quest for freedom, but also, perhaps, it was used in Lord knows what schemes of dreadful revenge. Right now, nothing is clear to me. I still glimpse only glimmers in the dark, and I must limit my pen, as it were, to taking dictation from events. But nothing binds us to Captain Nemo. He believes that escaping from the Nautilus is impossible. We are not even constrained by our word of honor. No promises fetter us. We're simply captives, prisoners masquerading under the name guests for the sake of everyday courtesy. Even so, Ned Land hasn't given up all hope of recovering his freedom. He's sure to take advantage of the first chance that comes his way. No doubt I will do likewise. And yet, I will feel some regret at making off with the Nautilus's secrets, so generously unveiled for us by Captain Nemo. Because ultimately, should we detest or admire this man? Is he the persecutor or the persecuted? And in all honesty, before I leave him forever... I want to finish this underwater tour of the world, whose first stages have been so magnificent. I want to observe the full series of these wonders gathered under the seas of our globe. I want to see what no man has seen yet, even if I must pay for this insatiable curiosity with my life. What are my discoveries to date? Nothing, relatively speaking, since so far we've covered only 6,000 leagues across the Pacific. Nevertheless, 
I'm well aware that the Nautilus is drawing near to populated shores, and if some chance for salvation becomes available to us, it would be sheer cruelty to sacrifice my companions to my passion for the unknown. I must go with them, perhaps even guide them, but will this opportunity ever arise? The human being, robbed of his free will, craves such an opportunity. But the scientist, forever inquisitive, dreads it. That day, January 21, 1868, the chief officer went at noon to take the sun's altitude. I climbed onto the platform, lit a cigar, and watched him at work. It seemed obvious to me that this man didn't understand French, because I made several remarks in a loud voice that were bound to provoke him to some involuntary show of interest, had he understood them. But he remained mute and emotionless. While he took his sights with his sextant, one of the Nautilus's sailors, that muscular man who had gone with us to Crespo Island during our first underwater excursion, came up to clean the glass panes of the beacon. I then examined the fittings of the mechanism, whose power was increased a hundredfold by biconvex lenses that were designed like those in a lighthouse and kept its rays productively focused. This electric lamp was so constructed as to yield its maximum illuminating power. In essence, its light was generated in a vacuum, ensuring both its steadiness and intensity. Such a vacuum also reduced wear on the graphite points between which the luminous arc expanded. This was an important savings for Captain Nemo, who couldn't easily renew them. But under these conditions, wear and tear were almost non-existent. When the Nautilus was ready to resume its underwater travels, I went below again to the lounge. The hatches closed once more, and our course was set due west. We then ploughed the waves of the Indian Ocean, vast liquid plains, with an area of 550 million hectares, whose waters are so transparent it makes you dizzy to lean over their surface. There the Nautilus generally drifted at a depth between 100 and 200 meters. It behaved in this way for some days. To anyone without my grand passion for the sea, these hours would surely have seemed long and monotonous. But my daily strolls on the platform, where I was received by the life-giving ocean air, the sights in the rich waters beyond the lounge windows, the books to be read in the library, and the composition of my memoirs, took up all my time, and left me without a moment of weariness or boredom. All in all, we enjoyed a highly satisfactory state of health. The diet on board agreed with us perfectly, and for my part, I could easily have gone without those changes of pace that Ned Land, in a spirit of protest, kept taxing his ingenuity to supply us. What's more, in this constant temperature we didn't even have to worry about catching colds. Besides, the ship had a good stock of madrepore dendrophilia, known in Provence by the name sea fennel, and a poultice made from the dissolved flesh of its polyps will furnish an excellent cough medicine. For some days we saw a large number of aquatic birds with webbed feet, known as gulls or sea mews. Some were skillfully slain, and when cooked in a certain fashion they made a very acceptable platter of water game. Among the great wind riders, carried over long distances from every shore and resting on the waves from their exhausting flights, I spotted some magnificent albatross, birds belonging to the Longipennis, long-winged family, whose discordant calls sound like the braying of an ass. The totipalms, fully webbed, family was represented by swift frigate birds, nimbly catching fish at the surface, and by numerous tropic birds of the genus Phaeton, among others the red-tailed tropic bird the size of a pigeon, its white plumage shaded with pink tints that contrasted with its dark-hued wings. The Nautilus's nets hauled up several types of sea turtle from the hawksbill genus with arching backs whose scales are highly prized. Diving easily, these reptiles can remain a good while under water by closing the fleshly valves located at the external openings of their nasal passages. When they were captured, some hawksbills were still asleep inside their carapaces, a refuge from other marine animals. 
The flesh of these turtles was nothing memorable, but their eggs made an excellent feast. As for fish, they always filled us with wonderment when, staring through the open panels, we could unveil the secrets of their aquatic lives. I noted several species I hadn't previously been able to observe. I'll mention chiefly some trunkfish unique to the Red Sea, the Sea of the East Indies, and that part of the ocean washing the coasts of the equinoctial America. Like turtles, armadillos, sea urchins, and crustaceans, these fish are protected by armor plate that's neither chalky nor stony, but actual bone. Sometimes this armor takes the shape of a solid triangle, sometimes that of a solid quadrangle. Among the triangular type, I noticed some half a decentimeter long, with brown tails, yellow fins, and wholesome, exquisitely tasty flesh. I even recommended that they be acclimatized to fresh water, a change, incidentally, that a number of saltwater fish can make with ease. I'll also mention some quadrangular trunkfish, topped by four large protuberances along the back. Trunkfish sprinkled with white spots on the undersides of the body, which make good house pets like certain birds. Boxfish armed with strings formed by extensions of their bony crusts, and whose odd grunting has earned them the nickname Sea Pigs. Then some trunkfish known as dromedaries, with tough, leathery flesh and big conical humps. From the daily notes kept by Mr. Conseil, I also retrieve certain fish from the genus Tetradon, unique to these seas. Southern puffers with red backs and white chests distinguished by three lengthwise rows of filaments, and jugfish, seven inches long, decked out in the brightest colors. Then, as specimens of other genera, blowfish resembling a dark brown egg, furrowed with white bands and lacking tails. Globefish, genuine porcupines of the sea, armed with stings, and able to inflate themselves until they look like a pincushion, bristling with needles. Seahorses common to every ocean, flying dragonfish with long snouts, and highly distended pectoral fins shaped like wings, which enable them, if not to fly, at least to spring into the air. Spatula-shaped paddlefish, whose tails are covered with many scaly rings. Snipefish with long jaws, excellent animals twenty-five centimeters long, and gleaming with the most cheerful colors. Bluish-gray dragonets with wrinkled heads, myriads of leaping blennies with black stripes, and long pectoral fins gliding over the surface of the water with prodigious speed. Delicious sailfish that can hoist their fins in a favorable current, like so many unfurled sails. Splendid nursery fish, on which nature has lavished yellow, azure, silver, and gold. Yellow mackerel with wings made of filaments, bullheads forever spattered with mud, which make distinct hissing sounds. Sea robins, whose livers are thought to be poisonous. Ladyfish that can flutter their eyelids. Finally, archerfish with long tubular snouts, real ocean-going flycatchers, armed with a rifle unforeseen by either Remington or Chaspo. It slays insects by shooting them with a simple drop of water. From the 89th fish genus in Lesseped's system of classification, belonging to his second subclass of bony fish, characterized by gill covers and bronchial membrane, I noted some scorpion fish whose heads are adorned with stings and which have only one dorsal fin. These animals are covered with small scales, or have none at all, depending on the subgenus to which they belong. The second subgenus gave us some didactylous specimens, three to four decimeters long, streaked with yellow, their heads having a phantasmagoric appearance. As for the first subgenus, it furnished several specimens of that bizarre fish aptly nicknamed toadfish whose big head is sometimes gouged with deep cavities, sometimes swollen with protuberances. Bristling with stings and strewn with nodules, it sports hideously irregular horns. Its body and tail are adorned with callosities. Its stings can inflict dangerous injuries. It's repulsive and horrible. From January 21 to the 23rd, 
The Nautilus traveled at the rate of 250 leagues in 24 hours, hence 540 miles at 22 miles per hour. If, during our trip, we were able to identify these different varieties of fish, it's because they were attracted by our electric light and tried to follow alongside. But most of them were outdistanced by our speed and soon fell behind. Temporarily, however, a few managed to keep pace in the Nautilus's waters. On the morning of the 24th, in latitude 12 degrees 5 south, and longitude 94 degrees 33, we raised Keeling Island, a madreporic upheaving planted with magnificent coconut trees, which had been visited by Mr. Darwin and Captain Fitzroy. The Nautilus cruised along a short distance off the shore of this desert island. Our dragnets brought up many specimens of polyps and echinoderms, plus some unusual shells from the branch Mollusca. Captain Nemo's treasures were enhanced by some valuable exhibits from the Defenula snail species, to which I joined some pointed star coral, a sort of parasitic pulpary that often attaches itself to seashells. Soon Keeling Island disappeared below the horizon, and our course was set to the northwest, toward the tip of the Indian Peninsula. Civilization, Ned Land told me that day. Much better than those Papuan islanders where we ran into more savages than venison. On this Indian shore, Professor, there are roads and railways, English, French, and Hindu villages. We wouldn't go five miles without bumping into a fellow countryman. Come on now. Isn't it time for our sudden departure from Captain Nemo? No, no, Ned, I replied in a very firm tone. Let's ride it out, as you seafaring fellows say. The Nautilus is approaching populated areas. It's going back toward Europe. Let it take us there. After we arrive in home waters, we can do as we see fit. Besides... I don't imagine Captain Nemo will let us go hunting on the coasts of Malabar or Coromandel as he did in the forests of New Guinea. Well, sir, can't we manage without his permission? I didn't answer the Canadian. I wanted no arguments. Deep down, I was determined to fully exploit the good fortune that had put me on board the Nautilus. After leaving Keeling Island, our pace got generally slower. It also got more unpredictable, often taking us to great depths. Several times we used our slanting fins, which internal levers could set at an oblique angle to our water line. Thus we went as deep as two or three kilometers, down but without ever verifying the lowest depths of this sea near India, which soundings of 13,000 meters have been unable to reach. As for the temperature in these lower strata, the thermometer always and invariably indicated four degrees centigrade. I merely observed that in the upper layers the water was always colder over shallows than in the open sea. On January 25, the ocean being completely deserted, the Nautilus spent the day on the surface, churning the waves with its powerful propeller and making them spurt to great heights. Under these conditions, who wouldn't have mistaken it for a gigantic cetacean? I spent three quarters of the day on the platform. I stared at the sea. Nothing on the horizon except near four o'clock in the afternoon a long steamer to the west running on our opposite track. Its masting was visible for an instant, but it couldn't have seen the Nautilus because we were lying too low in the water. I imagined that steamboat belonged to the peninsula and oriental line which provides services from the island of Ceylon to Sydney, also calling it King George Sound and Melbourne. At five o'clock in the afternoon, just before that brief twilight that links day with night in tropical zones, Conseil and I marveled at an unusual sight. It was a delightful animal, whose discovery, according to the ancients, is a sign of good luck. Aristotle, Athenaeus, Pliny, and Opian studied its habits, and lavished on its behalf all the scientific poetry of Greece and Italy. They called it Nautilus and Pompilius, but modern science has not endorsed these designations, and this mollusk is now known by the name Argonaut. 
Anyone consulting Conseil would soon learn from the gallant lad that the branch mollusca is divided into five classes. That the first class features the cephalopoda, whose members are sometimes naked, sometimes covered with a shell, which consists of two families, the debranchiata and the tetrabranchiata, which are distinguished by their number of gills. That the family debranchiata includes three genera, the argonaut, the squid, and the cuttlefish, and that the family tetrabranchiata contains only one genus, the nautilus. After this catalogue, if some recalcitrant listener confuses the argonaut, which is acetabliferous, in other words, a bearer of suction tubes, with the nautilus, which is tentaculiferous, a bearer of tentacles, it will be simply unforgivable. Now, if it was a school of argonauts then voyaging on the surface of the ocean, we could count several hundred of them. They belong to that species of argonaut covered with protuberances and exclusive to the seas near India. These graceful mollusks were swimming backward by means of their locomotive tubes, sucking water into these tubes and then expelling it. Six of their eight tentacles were long, thin, and floated on the water, while the other two were rounded into palms and spread to the wind like light sails. I could see perfectly their undulating spiral-shaped shells, which Cuvier aptly compared to an elegant cockle-boat. It's an actual boat, indeed. It transports the animal that secretes it without the animal sticking to it. The Argonaut is free to leave its shell, I told Conseil, but it never does. Not unlike Captain Nemo, Conseil replied sagely, which is why he should have christened his ship the Argonaut. For about an hour the Nautilus cruised in the midst of this school of mollusks. Then, Lord knows why, they were gripped with a sudden fear, as if, at a signal, every sail was abruptly lowered, arms folded, bodies contracted, shells turned over by changing their centre of gravity, and the whole flotilla disappeared under the waves. It was instantaneous, and no squadron of ships ever manoeuvred with greater togetherness. Just then night fell silently, and the waves barely surged in the breeze, spreading placidly around the Nautilus's side plates. The next day, January 26, we cut the equator on the 82nd meridian, and we re-entered the northern hemisphere. During that day, a fearsome school of sharks provided us with an escort. Dreadful animals that teem in these seas and make them extremely dangerous. They were Port Jackson sharks, with a brown back, a whitish belly, and eleven rows of teeth. Big eye sharks, with necks marked by a large black spot encircled in white and resembling an eye. And Isabella sharks, whose rounded snouts were strewn with dark speckles. Often these powerful animals rushed at a lounge window with a violence less than comforting. By this point, Ned Land had lost all self-control. He wanted to rise to the surface of the waves and harpoon the monsters, especially certain smooth hound sharks whose mouths were paved with teeth arranged like a mosaic, and some big five-meter tiger sharks that insisted on personally provoking him. But the Nautilus soon picked up speed and easily left astern the fastest of these man-eaters. On January 27, at the entrance of the huge Bay of Bengal, we repeatedly encountered a gruesome sight. Human corpses floating on the surface of the waves. Carried by the Ganges to the high seas, these were deceased Indian villagers who hadn't been fully devoured by vultures, the only morticians in these parts. But there was no shortage of sharks to assist them with their undertaking chores. Near seven o'clock in the evening, the Nautilus lay half-submerged, navigating in the midst of milky white waves. As far as the eye could see, the ocean seemed lactified. Was it an effect of the moon's rays? No, because the new moon was barely two days old and was still lost below the horizon in the sun's rays. The entire sky, although lit up by stellar radiation, seemed pitch black in comparison with the whiteness of these waters. 
Conseil couldn't believe his eyes, and he questioned me about the causes of this odd phenomenon. Luckily, I was in a position to answer him. That's called a milk sea, I told him, a vast expanse of white waves often seen along the coasts of Amboina and in these waterways. But, Conseil asked, couldn't Master tell me the cause of this effect? Because I presume this water hasn't really changed into milk. No, my boy, and this whiteness that amazes you is merely due to the presence of myriads of tiny creatures called infusoria, a sort of diminutive glowworm that's colorless and gelatinous in appearance, as thick as a strand of hair, and no longer than one-fifth of a millimeter. Some of these tiny creatures stick together over an area of several leagues. Several leagues? Conseil exclaimed. Yes, my boy. And don't even try to compute the number of these infusoria. You won't pull it off, because, if I'm not mistaken, certain navigators have cruised through milk seas for more than forty miles. I'm not sure that Conseil heeded my recommendation, because he seemed to be deep in thought, no doubt trying to calculate how many one-fifths of a millimeter are found in forty square miles. As for me, I continued to observe this phenomenon. For several hours the Nautilus's spur sliced through these whitish waves, and I watched it glide noiselessly over the soapy water, as if it were cruising through those foaming eddies that at bay's currents and countercurrents sometimes leave between each other. Near midnight the sea suddenly resumed its usual hue, but behind us, all the way to the horizon, the skies kept mirroring the whiteness of those waves, and for a good while seemed imbued with the hazy glow of an aurora borealis. Chapter 26 A New Proposition from Captain Nemo on January 28, in latitude 9 degrees 4 north, when the Nautilus returned at noon to the surface of the sea, it lay in sight of land some eight miles to the west. Right off I observed a cluster of mountains about 2,000 feet high, whose shapes were very whimsically sculpted. After our position fix, I re-entered the lounge, and when our bearings were reported on the chart, I saw that we were off the island of Ceylon that pearl dangling from the lower lobe of the Indian peninsula. I went looking in the library for a book about this island, one of the most fertile in the world. Sure enough, I found a volume entitled Salon and the Singhalese by H.C. Sir, Esquire. Re-entering the lounge, I first noted the bearings of Salon, on which antiquity lavished so many different names. It was located between latitude 5 degrees 55 and 9 degrees 49 north, and between longitude 79 degrees 42 and 82 degrees 4 east of the meridian of Greenwich. Its length is 275 miles, its maximum width 150 miles, its circumference 900 miles, its surface area 24,448 square miles. In other words, a little smaller than that of Ireland. Just then, Captain Nemo and his chief officer appeared. The captain glanced at the chart, then, turning to me, The island of Ceylon, he said, is famous for its pearl fisheries. Would you be interested, Professor Arconar, in visiting one of those fisheries? Oh, certainly, Captain. Fine. It's easily done. Only, when we see the fisheries, we'll see no fishermen. The annual harvest hasn't yet begun. No matter. I'll give orders to make for the Gulf of Manar, and we'll arrive there late tonight. The captain said a few words to his chief officer, who went out immediately. Soon the Nautilus re-entered its liquid element, and the pressure gauge indicated that it was staying at a depth of thirty feet. With the chart under my eyes, I looked for the Gulf of Manar. I found it by the ninth parallel off the northwestern shore of Ceylon. It was formed by the long curve of Little Manar Island. To reach it, we had to go all the way up Ceylon's west coast. Professor, Captain Nemo told me, there are pearl fisheries in the Bay of Bengal, the seas of the East Indies, the seas of China and Japan, plus those seas south of the United States, the Gulf of Panama, and the Gulf of California. 
but it's off Salon that such fishing reaps its richest rewards. No doubt we'll be arriving a little early. Fishermen gather in the Gulf of Manar only during the month of March, and for thirty days some three hundred boats concentrate on the lucrative harvest of these treasures from the sea. Each boat is manned by ten oarsmen and ten fishermen. The latter divide into two groups, dive in rotation, and descend to a depth of twelve meters with the help of a heavy stone clutched between their feet and attached by a rope to their boat. You mean, I said, that such primitive methods are still all that they use? All, oh, Captain Nemo answered me. Although these fisheries belong to the most industrialized people in the world, the English, to whom the Treaty of Amiens granted them in 1802. Yet it strikes me that diving suits like yours could perform yeoman service in such work. Yes, since those poor fishermen can't stay long underwater. On his voyage to Ceylon, the Englishman Percival made much of a Kaffir who stayed under five minutes without coming up to the surface. But I find that hard to believe. I know that some divers can last up to fifty-seven seconds, and highly skilful ones to eighty-seven. But such men are rare, and when the poor fellows climb back on board, the water coming out of their noses and ears is tinted with blood. I believe the average time under water that these fishermen can tolerate is thirty seconds, during which they hastily stuff their little nets with all the pearl oysters they can tear loose. But these fishermen generally don't live to advanced age. Their vision weakens, ulcers break out on their eyes, sores form on their bodies, and some are even stricken with apoplexy on the ocean floor. Yes, I said, it's a sad occupation and one that exists only to gratify the whims of fashion. But tell me, Captain, how many oysters can a boat fish up in a workday? About forty thousand to fifty thousand. It's even said that in 1814, when the English government went fishing on its own behalf, its divers worked just twenty days and brought up seventy-six million oysters. At least, I asked, the fishermen are well paid, aren't they? Hardly, Professor. In Panama they make just one dollar per week. In most places they earn only a penny for each oyster that has a pearl, and they bring up so many that have none. Only one penny to those poor people who make their employers rich? That's atrocious. On that note, Professor, Captain Nemo told me, you and your companions will visit the Manar Oyster Bank, and if by chance some eager fisherman arrives early, well, we can watch him at work. That suits me, Captain. By the way, Professor Arjona, you aren't afraid of sharks, are you? Sharks? I exclaimed. This struck me as a pretty needless question, to say the least. Well? Captain Nemo went on. I admit, Captain, I'm not yet on very familiar terms with that genus of fish. We're used to them, the rest of us, Captain Nemo answered. And in time you will be too. Anyhow, we'll be armed, and on our way we might hunt a man-eater or two. It's a fascinating sport. So, Professor, I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. This said in a carefree tone, Captain Nemo left the lounge. If you're invited to hunt bears in the Swiss mountains, you might say, Oh, good, I get to go bear hunting tomorrow. If you're invited to hunt lions on the Atlas Plains, or tigers in the jungles of India, you might say, Ha! Now's my chance to hunt lions and tigers. But if you're invited to hunt sharks in their native element, you might want to think it over before accepting. As for me, I passed a hand over my brow, where beads of cold sweat were busy forming. Let's think this over, I said to myself. And let's take our time. Hunting otters in underwater forests, as we did in the forests of Crespo Island, is an acceptable activity. But to roam the bottom of the sea when you are almost certain to meet man-eaters in the neighborhood, that's another story. 
I know that in certain countries, particularly the Andaman Islands, Negroes don't hesitate to attack sharks, dagger in one hand and noose in the other. But I also know that many who face those fearsome animals don't come back alive. Besides, I'm not a Negro. And even if I were a Negro, in this instance, I don't think a little hesitation on my part would be out of place. And there I was, fantasizing about sharks, envisioning huge jaws armed with multiple rows of teeth capable of cutting a man in half. I could already feel a definite pain around my pelvic girdle. And how I resented the offhand manner in which the captain had extended his deplorable invitation. You would have thought it was an issue of going into the woods on some harmless fox hunt. Thank heavens, I said to myself. Corsay will never want to come along, and that'll be my excuse for not going with the captain. As for Ned Land, I admit I felt less confident of his wisdom. Danger, however great, held a perennial attraction for his aggressive nature. I went back to reading Sir's book, but I leafed through it mechanically. Between the lines I kept seeing fearsome, wide-open jaws. Just then, Conseil and the Canadian entered with a calm, even gleeful air. Little did they know what was waiting for them. Ye gods, sir, Ned Land told me, your Captain Nemo, the devil take him, has just made us a very pleasant proposition. Oh, I said, you know about, with all due respect to master, Conseil replied. The Nautilus's commander has invited us together with Master for a visit tomorrow to Sir Lon's magnificent prayer fisheries. He did so in the most cordial terms and conducted himself like a true gentleman. He didn't tell you anything else? Nothing, sir, the Canadian replied. He said you'd already discussed this little stroll. Indeed, I said. But didn't he give you any details on? Not a one, Mr. Naturalist. You will be going with us, right? Me? Why, yes, certainly, of course. I can see that you like the idea, Mr. Land. Yes, it will be a really unusual experience. And possibly dangerous, I added in an insinuating tone. Dangerous? Ned Land replied. A simple trip to an oyster bank. Assuredly, Captain Nemo hadn't seen fit to plant the idea of sharks in the minds of my companions. For my part, I stared at them with anxious eyes, as if they were already missing a limb or two. Should I alert them? Yes, surely. But I hardly knew how to go about it. Would Master... Conseil said to me, give us some background on pearl fishing? On the fishing itself, I asked, or the occupational hazards that... On the fishing, the Canadian replied. Before we tackle the terrain, it helps to be familiar with it. All right, let's sit down, my friends, and I'll teach you everything I myself have just been taught by the Englishman H.C. Sir. Ned and Conseil took seats on a couch, and right off the Canadian said to me, Sir, just what is a pearl, exactly? My gallant Ned, I replied, for poets a pearl is a tear from the sea. For Orientals it's a drop of solidified dew. For the ladies it's a jewel they can wear on their fingers, necks, and ears that's oblong in shape, glassy in luster, and formed from mother of pearl. For chemists, it's a mixture of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate, with a little gelatin protein. And finally, for naturalists, it's a simple festering secretion from the organ that produces mother of pearl in certain bivalves. French mollusca, Conseil said, class Icephala, order Testacea. Correct, my scholarly Conseil. Now then, those testacea, capable of producing pearls, include rainbow abalone, turbo snails, giant clams, and saltwater scallops. Briefly, all those that secrete mother of pearl, in other words, that blue, azure, violet, or white substance lining the insides of their valves. Are mussels included too? The Canadian asked. Yes, 
the muscles of certain streams in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Saxony, Bohemia, and France. Good, the Canadian replied. From now on, we'll pay closer attention to them. But, I went on, for secreting pearls, the ideal mollusk is the pearl oyster Meliagrina margaritifera, that valuable shellfish. Pearls result simply from mother-of-pearl solidifying into a globular shape. Either they stick to the oyster's shell, or they become embedded in the creature's folds. On the valves, a pearl sticks fast. On the flesh, it lies loose. But its nucleus is always some small, hard object, say a sterile egg or a grain of sand, around which the mother-of-pearl is deposited in thin, concentric layers over several years in succession. Can one find several pearls in the same oyster? Conseil asked. Yes, my boy. There are some shellfish that turn into real jewelry coffers. They even mention one oyster, about which I remain dubious, that supposedly contained at least 150 sharks. 150 sharks! Ned Land yelped. Did I say sharks? I exclaimed hastily. I meant 150 pearls. Sharks would make sense. Indeed, Conseil said. But will Master now tell us how one goes about extracting these pearls? One proceeds in several ways, and often when pearls stick to the valves, fishermen even pull them loose with pliers. But usually the shellfish are spread out on mats made from esparto grass that covers the beaches. Thus they die in the open air, and by the end of ten days they've rotted sufficiently. Next they're immersed in huge tanks of salt water. Then they're opened up and washed. At this point the sorters begin their twofold task. First they remove the layer of mother pearl, which are known in the industry by the names legitimate silver, bastard white, or bastard black. And these are shipped out in cases weighing 125 to 150 kilograms. Then they remove the oyster's meaty tissue, boil it, and finally strain it, in order to extract even the smallest pearls. Do the prices of these pearls differ depending on their size? Conseil asked. Not only on their size, I replied, but also according to their shape, their water, in other words, their color, and their orient, in other words, that dappled, shimmering glow that makes them so delightful to the eye. The finest pearls are called virgin pearls, or paragons. They form in isolation within the mollusk's tissue. They are white, often opaque, but sometimes of opalescent transparency, and usually spherical or pear-shaped. The spherical ones are made into bracelets, the pear-shaped ones into earrings. And since they are the most valuable, they are priced individually. The other pearls that stick to the oyster's shell are most erratically shaped and are priced by weight. Finally, classed in the lowest order, the smallest pearls are known by the name seed pearls. They are priced by the measuring cup and are used mainly in the creation of embroidery for church vestments. But it must be a long, hard job sorting out these pearls by size, the Canadian said. No, my friend. That task is performed with eleven strainers or sieves that are pierced with different numbers of holes. Those pearls staying in the strainers with... Twenty to eighty holes are in the first order. Those not slipping through the sieves, pierced with one hundred to eight hundred holes, are in the second order. Finally, those pearls for which one uses strainers pierced with nine hundred to a thousand holes make up the seed pearls. How ingenious, Conseil said, to reduce dividing and classifying pearls to a mechanical operation? And could Master tell us the profits brought in by harvesting these banks of pearl oysters? According to Sir's book, I replied, the Ceylon fisheries are farmed annually for a total profit of three million man-eaters. Francs, Conseil rebuked. Yes, francs, three million, I went on. But I don't think these fisheries bring in returns they once did. Similarly, the Central American fisheries used to make an annual profit of four million pounds during the reign of King Charles V. But now they bring in only two-thirds of that amount. 
All in all, it's estimated that nine million pounds is the current yearly return for the whole pearl harvesting industry. But, Conseil asked, haven't certain famous pearls been quoted at extremely high prices? Yes, my boy. They say Julius Caesar gave Servilia a pearl worth 120,000 in our own currency. I've even heard stories, the Canadian said, about some lady in ancient times who drank pearls and vinegar. Cleopatra, Conseil shot back. It must have tasted pretty bad, Ned Land added. Abominable, Ned, my friend, Conseil replied. But when a little glass of vinegar is worth one million five hundred thousand, its taste is a small price to pay. I'm sorry, I didn't marry the gal, the Canadian said, throwing up his hands with an air of discouragement. Ned Land married to Cleopatra? Conseil exclaimed. But I was all set to tie the knot, Conseil, the Canadian replied in all seriousness. And it wasn't my fault the whole business fell through. I even bought a pearl necklace for my fiancée, Kate Tinder. But she married somebody else instead. Well, that necklace cost me only a dollar fifty. But you can absolutely trust me on this, Professor. Its pearls were so big. They wouldn't have gone through that strainer with twenty holes. My gallant Ned, I replied laughing. Those were artificial pearls. Ordinary glass pearls whose insides were coated with essence of Orient. Wow, the Canadian replied. That essence of Orient must sell for quite a large sum. As little as zero. It comes from the scales of a European carp. It's nothing more than a silver substance that collects in the water and is preserved in ammonia. It's worthless. Maybe that's why Kate Tinder married somebody else, replied Mr. Land philosophically. But, I said, getting back to pearls of great value, I don't think any sovereign ever possessed one superior to the pearl owned by Captain Nemo. This one? Conseil said, pointing to a magnificent jewel in its glass case. Exactly. And I'm certainly not far off when I estimate its value at two million... Uh, francs, Conseil said quickly. Yes, I said, two million francs. And no doubt all it cost our captain was the effort to pick it up. Ha! Ned Land exclaimed. During our stroll tomorrow, who says we won't run into one just like it? Bah, Conseil put in. And why not? What good would a pearl worth millions do us here on the Nautilus? Here? No, Ned Land said. But elsewhere? Oh, elsewhere, Conseil put in, shaking his head. In fact, I said, Mr. Land is right. And if we ever brought back to Europe or America a pearl worth millions... It would make the story of our adventures more authentic and much more rewarding. That's how I see it, the Canadian said. But, said Conseil, who perpetually returned to the didactic side of things, is this pearl fishing ever dangerous? No, I replied quickly, especially if one takes certain precautions. What risks would you run in a job like that? Ned Land said. Swallowing a few gulps of salt water? Whatever you say, Ned. Then, trying to imitate Captain Nemo's carefree tone, I asked, By the way, gallant Ned, are you afraid of sharks? Me? The Canadian replied. I'm a professional harpooner. It's my job to make a mockery of them. It isn't an issue, I said, of fishing for them with a swivel hook, hoisting them onto the deck of a ship, chopping off the tail with a sweep of the axe, opening the belly, ripping out the heart, and tossing it into the sea. So it's an issue of... Yes, precisely. In the water. In the water. Ye gods. Just give me a good harpoon. You see, sir, these sharks are badly designed. They have to roll their bellies over to snap you up. And in the meantime... 
Ned Land had a way of pronouncing the word snap that sent chills down the spine. Well, how about you, Conseil? What are your feelings about these man-eaters? Me, Conseil said. I'm afraid I must be frank with Master. Good for you, I thought. If Master faces these sharks, Conseil said, I think his loyal manservant should face them with him. Chapter 27 A Pearl Worth Ten Million Night fell. I went to bed. I slept pretty poorly. Man-eaters played a major role in my dreams. And I found it more or less appropriate that the French word for shark, requin, has its linguistic roots in the word requiem. The next day, at four o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by the steward whom Captain Nemo had placed expressively at my service. I got up quickly, dressed, and went into the lounge. Captain Nemo was waiting for me. Professor Arjona, he said to me, are you ready to start? I'm ready. Kindly follow me. What about my companions, Captain? They've been alerted and are waiting for us. Aren't we going to put on our diving suits? I asked. Not yet. I haven't let the Nautilus pull too near the coast, and we are fairly well out of the Manar oyster bank. But I have the skiff ready, and it will take us to the exact spot where we'll disembark, which will save us a pretty long trek. It's carrying our diving equipment, and we'll suit up just before we begin our underwater exploring. Captain Nemo took me to the central companionway, whose steps led to the platform. Ned and Conseil were there, enraptured with the pleasure trip getting underway. Oars in position, five of the Nautilus's sailors were waiting for us aboard the skiff, which was moored alongside. The night was still dark. Layers of clouds cloaked the sky and left only a few stars in view. My eyes flew to the side where land lay, but I saw only a blurred line covering three quarters of the horizon, from southwest to northwest. Going up Ceylon's west coast during the night, the Nautilus lay west of the bay, or rather, that gulf formed by the mainland of Manar Island. Under these dark waters there stretched the bank of shellfish, an inexhaustible field of pearls more than twenty miles long. Captain Nemo, Conseil, Ned Land, and I found seats in the stern of the skiff. The longboat's coxswain took the tiller. His four companions leaned into their oars. The moorings were cast off, and we pulled clear. The skiff headed southward. The oarsmen took their time. I watched their strokes vigorously catch the water, and they always waited ten seconds before rowing again, following the practice used in most navies. While the longboat coasted, drops of liquid flicked from the oars and hit the dark troughs of the waves, pitter-pattering like splashes of molten lead. Coming from well out, a mild swell made the skiff roll gently, and a few cresting billows lapped at its bow. We were silent. What was Captain Nemo thinking? Perhaps that this approaching shore was too close for comfort, contrary to the Canadian's view, in which it still seemed too far away. As for Conseil, he had come along out of simple curiosity. Near five-thirty, the first glimmers of light on the horizon defined the upper lines of the coast with greater distinctness. Fairly flat to the east, it swelled a little toward the south. Five miles still separated it from us, and its beach merged with the misty waters. Between us and the shore, the sea was deserted. Not a boat, not a diver. Profound solitude reigned over this gathering place of pearl fishermen. As Captain Nemo had commented, we were arriving in these waterways a month too soon. At six o'clock the day broke suddenly, with that speed unique to tropical regions, which experience no real dawn or dusk. The sun's rays pierced the cloud curtain, gathered on the easterly horizon, and the radiant orb rose swiftly. I could clearly see the shore, which featured a few sparse trees here and there. The skiff advanced toward Manar Island, which curved to the south. Captain Nemo stood up from his thwart and studied the sea. 
At his signal the anchor was lowered, but its chain barely ran because the bottom lay no more than a meter down, and this locality was one of the shallowest spots near the bank of shellfish. Instantly the skiff wheeled around under the ebb tide's outbound thrust. Here we are, Professor Achona, Captain Nemo then said. You observe this confined bay? A month from now in this very place the numerous fishing boats of the harvesters will gather, and these are the waters their divers will ransack so daringly. This bay is felicitously laid out for their type of fishing. It's sheltered from the strongest winds, and the sea is never very turbulent here. Highly favorable conditions for diving work. Now, let's put on our underwater suits, and we'll begin our stroll. I didn't reply, and while staring at these suspicious waves, I began to put on my heavy aquatic clothes, helped by the longboat sailors. Captain Nemo and my two companions suited up as well. None of the Nautilus's men were to go with us on this new excursion. Soon we were imprisoned up to the neck in India rubber clothing, and straps fastened the air devices onto our backs. As for the Rumcorf device, it didn't seem to be in the picture. Before inserting my head into its copper capsule, I commented on this to the captain. Our lighting equipment would be useless to us. The captain answered me. We won't be going very deep, and the sun's rays will be sufficient to light our way. Besides, it's unwise to carry electric lanterns under these waves. Their brightness might unexpectedly attract certain dangerous occupants of these waterways. As Captain Nemo pronounced these words, I turned to Conseil and Ned Land, but my two friends had already encased their craniums in their metal headgear and they could neither hear nor reply. I had one question left to address to Captain Nemo. What about our weapons? I asked him. Our rifles. Rifles? What for? Don't your mountaineers attack bears dagger in hand? And isn't steel surer than lead? Here's a sturdy blade. Slip it under your belt and let's be off. I stared at my companions. They were armed in the same fashion, and Ned Land was also brandishing an enormous harpoon he had stowed in the skiff before leaving the Nautilus. Then, following the captain's example, I let myself be crowned with my heavy copper sphere, and our air tanks immediately went into action. An instant later, the longboat sailors helped us overboard, one after the other, and we set foot on level sand in a meter and a half of water. Captain Nemo gave us a hand signal. We followed him down a gentle slope and disappeared under the waves. There the obsessive fears in my brain left me. I became surprisingly calm again. The ease with which I could move increased my confidence, and the many strange sights captivated my imagination. The sun was already sending sufficient light under these waves. The tiniest objects remained visible. After ten minutes of walking, we were in five meters of water, and the terrain had become almost flat. Like a covey of snipe over a marsh, there rose underfoot schools of unusual fish from the genus Monopterus, whose members have no fin but their tail. I recognized the Japanese eel, a genuine eight-decimeter serpent with a bluish-gray belly, which, without the gold lines over its flanks, could easily be confused with the conger eel. From the butterfish genus, whose oval bodies are very flat, I observed several adorned in brilliant colors and sporting a dorsal fin like a sickle, edible fish that, when dried and marinated, make an excellent dish known by the name caraweed. Then some sea poachers, fish belonging to the genus Aspidophoroides, whose bodies are covered with scaly armor divided into eight lengthwise sections. Meanwhile, as the sun got progressively higher, it lit up the watery mass more and more. The seafloor changed little by little. Its fine-grained sand was followed by a genuine causeway of smooth crags covered by a carpet of mollusks and zoophytes. Among other specimens in these two branches, I noted some window-pane oysters with thin valves of unequal size, a type of ostracod unique to the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Then orange-hued lucina with circular shells, all shaped auger shells, 
some of those Persian murex snails that supply the Nautilus with such wonderful dye, spiky periwinkles fifteen centimeters long that rose under the waves like hands ready to grab you, turban snails with shells made of horn and bristling all over with spines, lamp shells, edible duck clams that feed the Hindu marketplace, subtly luminous jellyfish of the species Pelagia penopria, and finally, some wonderful Oculina flabelliforma, magnificent sea fans that fashion one of the most luxuriant tree forms in this ocean. In the midst of this moving vegetation, under arbors of water plants, there raced legions of clumsy articulates, in particular, some fanged frog crabs whose carapaces form a slightly rounded triangle robber crabs exclusive to these waterways, and horrible parthenope crabs whose appearance was repulsive to the eye. One animal no less hideous, which I encountered several times, was the enormous crab that Mr. Darwin observed, to which nature has given the instinct and requisite strength to eat coconuts. It scrambles up trees on the beach and sends the coconuts tumbling. They fracture in their fall, and are opened by its powerful pincers. Here, under these clear waves, this crab raced around with matchless agility, while green turtles from the species frequenting the Malabar coast move sluggishly among the crumbling rocks. Near seven o'clock we finally surveyed the bank of shellfish, where pearl oysters reproduce by the millions. These valuable mollusks stick to rocks, where they are strongly attached by a mass of brown filaments that forbids their moving about. In this respect, oysters are inferior even to mussels, to whom nature has not denied all talent for locomotion. The shellfish Melagrina, that womb for pearls whose valves are nearly equal in size, has the shape of a round shell with thick walls and a very rough exterior. Some of these shells were furrowed with flaky greenish bands that radiated down from the top. These were the young oysters. The others had rugged black surfaces measured up to fifteen centimeters in width, and were ten or more years old. Captain Nemo pointed to this prodigious heap of shellfish, and I saw that these mines were genuinely inexhaustible, since nature's creative powers are greater than man's destructive instincts. True to those instincts, Ned Land greedily stuffed the finest of these mollusks into a net he carried at his side. But we couldn't stop. We had to follow the captain, who headed down trails seemingly known only to himself. The seafloor rose noticeably, and when I lifted my arms, sometimes they would pass above the surface of the sea. Then the level of the oyster bank would lower unpredictably. Often we went around tall pointed rocks rising like pyramids, in their dark crevices huge crustaceans, aiming their long legs like heavy artillery watched us with unblinking eyes, while underfoot there crept millipeds, blood worms, oritia worms, and annelid worms, whose antennas and tubular tentacles were incredibly long. Just then a huge cave opened up in our path, hollowed from a picturesque pile of rocks, whose smooth heights were completely hung with underwater flora. At first this cave looked pitch black to me. Inside the sun's rays seemed to diminish by degrees. Their hazy transparency was nothing more than drowned light. Captain Nemo went in. We followed him. My eyes soon grew accustomed to this comparative gloom. I distinguished the unpredictably contoured springings of a vault, supported by natural pillars firmly based on a granite foundation, like the weighty columns of Tuscan architecture. Why had our incomprehensible guide taken us into the depths of this underwater crypt? I would soon find out. After going down a fairly steep slope, our feet trod the floor of a sort of circular pit, there Captain Nemo stopped, and his hand indicated an object that I hadn't yet noticed. It was an oyster of extraordinary dimensions, a titanic giant clam, a holy waterfront that could have held a whole lake, a basin more than two meters wide, hence even bigger than the one adorning the Nautilus's lounge. I approached this phenomenal mollusk, its mass of filaments attached to it a table of granite, and there it grew by itself in the midst of the cave's calm waters. I estimated the weight of this giant clam at three hundred kilograms. 
Hence, such an oyster held fifteen kilos of meat, and you'd need the stomach of King Gargantua to eat a couple dozen. Captain Nemo was obviously familiar with the bivalve's existence. This wasn't the first time he'd paid it a visit, and I thought his sole reason for leading us to this locality was to show us a natural curiosity. I was mistaken. Captain Nemo had an explicit personal interest in checking on the current condition of this giant clam. The mollusk's two valves were partly open. The captain approached and stuck his dagger vertically between the shells to discourage any ideas about closing. Then with his hands he raised the fringed membrane-filled tunic that made up the animal's mantle. There, between its leaf-like folds, I saw a loose pearl as big as a coconut. Its globular shape, perfect clarity, and wonderful orient made it a jewel of incalculable value. Carried away by curiosity, I stretched out my hand to take it, weigh it, fondle it. But the captain stopped me, signaled no, removed his dagger in one swift motion, and let the two valves snap shut. I then understood Captain Nemo's intent. By leaving the pearl buried beneath the gigantic clam's mantle, he allowed it to grow imperceptibly. With each passing year, the mollusk's secretions added new concentric layers. The captain alone was familiar with the cave where this wonderful fruit of nature was ripening. He alone reared it, so to speak, in order to transfer it one day to his dearly beloved museum. Perhaps... Following the examples of oyster farmers in China and India, he had even predetermined the creation of this pearl by sticking under the mollusk's folds some piece of glass or metal that was gradually covered with mother of pearl. In any case, comparing this pearl to others, I already knew about, and to those shimmering in the captain's collection, I estimated that it was worth at least ten million pounds. It was a superb natural curiosity rather than a luxurious piece of jewellery, because I don't know of any female ear that could handle it. Our visit to this opulent giant clam came to an end. Captain Nemo left the cave and we climbed back up the bank of shellfish, in the midst of these clear waters not yet disturbed by divers at work. We walked by ourselves, genuine loiterers stopping or straying as our fancies dictated. For my part, I was no longer worried about those dangers my imagination had so ridiculously exaggerated. The shallows drew noticeably closer to the surface of the sea, and soon, walking in only a meter of water, my head passed well above the level of the ocean. Conseil rejoined me, and gluing his huge copper capsule to mine, his eyes gave me a friendly greeting. But this lofty plateau measured only a few fathoms, and soon we re-entered our element. I think I've now earned the right to dub it that. Ten minutes later, Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. I thought he'd called a halt so that we could turn and start back. No. With a gesture, he ordered us to crouch beside him at the foot of a wide crevice. His hand motioned toward a spot within the liquid mass, and I looked carefully. Five meters away, a shadow appeared and dropped to the sea floor. The alarming idea of sharks crossed my mind, but I was mistaken, and once again we didn't have to deal with monsters of the deep. It was a man, a living man, a black Indian fisherman, a poor devil, who no doubt had come to gather what he could before harvest time. I saw the bottom of his dinghy moored a few feet above his head. He would dive and go back up in quick succession. A stone cut in the shape of a sugar loaf, which he gripped between his feet while a rope connected it to his boat, served to lower him more quickly to the ocean floor. This was the extent of his equipment. Arriving on the sea floor at a depth of about five meters, he fell to his knees and stuffed his sack with shellfish gathered at random. Then he went back up, emptied his sack, pulled up his stone, and started all over again, the whole process lasting only thirty seconds. This diver didn't see us. A shadow cast by our crag hid us from his view. And besides, how could this poor Indian ever have guessed that human beings, creatures like himself, were near him under the waters, eavesdropping on his movements, not missing a single detail of his fishing? So he went up and down several times, 
He gathered only about ten shellfish per dive because he had to tear them from the banks, where each clung with its tough mass of filaments. And how many of these oysters for which he risked his life would have no pearl in them? I observed him with great care. His movements were systematically executed, and for half an hour no danger seemed to threaten him. So I had gotten used to the sight of this fascinating fishing, when all at once, just as the Indian was kneeling on the seafloor, I saw him make a frightened gesture, stand, and gather himself to spring back to the surface of the waves. I understood his fear. A gigantic shadow appeared above the poor diver. It was a shark of huge size, moving in diagonally, eyes ablaze, jaws wide open. I was speechless with horror, unable to make a single movement. With one vigorous stroke of its fins, the voracious animal shot toward the Indian, who jumped aside and avoided the shark's bite, but not the thrashing of its tail, because that tail struck him across the chest and stretched him out on the sea floor. The scene lasted barely a few seconds. The shark returned, rolled over on its back, and was getting ready to cut the Indian in half, when Captain Nemo, who was stationed beside me, suddenly stood up. Then he strode right toward the monster, dagger in hand, ready to fight it at close quarters. Just as it was about to snap up the poor fisherman, the man-eater saw its new adversary, repositioned itself on its belly, and headed swiftly toward him. I can see Captain Nemo's bearing to this day. Bracing himself, he waited for the fiercer man-eater with wonderful composure, and when the latter rushed at him, the captain leaped aside with prodigious quickness, avoided a collision, and sank his dagger into its belly. But that wasn't the end of the story. A dreadful battle was joined. The shark bellowed, so to speak. Blood was pouring into the waves from its wounds. The sea was dyed red, and through this opaque liquid I could see nothing else. Nothing else until the moment when, through a rift in the clouds, I saw the daring captain clinging to one of the animal's fins, fighting the monster at close quarters, belaboring his enemy's belly with stabs of the dagger, yet unable to deliver the deciding thrust. In other words, a direct hit to the heart. In its struggles, the man-eater churned the watery mass so furiously, its eddies threatened to knock me over. I wanted to run to the captain's rescue, but I was transfixed with horror, unable to move. I stared wild-eyed. I saw the fight enter a new phase. The captain fell to the seafloor, toppled by the enormous mass weighing him down. Then the shark's jaws opened astoundingly wide, like a pair of industrial shears. And that would have been the finish of Captain Nemo had not Ned Land, quick as thought, rushed forward with his harpoon and driven its dreadful point into the shark's underside. The waves were saturated with masses of blood. The water shook with the movement of the man-eater, which thrashed about with indescribable fury. Ned Land hadn't missed his target. This was the monster's death rattle. Pierced to the heart, it was struggling with dreadful spasms, whose aftershocks knocked Conseil off his feet. Meanwhile, Ned Land pulled the captain clear. Uninjured, the latter stood up, went right to the Indian, quickly cut the rope binding the man to his stone, took the fellow in his arms, and with a vigorous kick to the heel rose to the surface of the sea. The three of us followed him, and a few moments later, miraculously safe, we reached the fisherman's longboat. Captain Nemo's first concern was to revive the unfortunate man, I wasn't sure he would succeed. I hoped so, since the poor devil hadn't been under very long. But that stroke from the shark's tail could have been his death blow. Fortunately, after vigorous massaging by Conseil and the captain, I saw the nearly drowned man regain consciousness little by little. He opened his eyes. How startled he must have felt, how frightened, even, at seeing four huge copper craniums leaning over him. And above all, what must he have thought when Captain Nemo pulled a bag of pearls from a pocket in his diving suit and placed it in the fisherman's hands? This magnificent benefaction from the man of the waters to the poor Indian from Ceylon was accepted by the latter with trembling hands. His bewildered eyes indicated that he didn't know what superhuman creatures he owed both his life and his fortune. 
At the captain's signal, we returned to the bank of shellfish, and retracting our steps, we walked for half an hour until we encountered the anchor connecting the seafloor with the Nautilus's skiff. Back on board, the sailors helped divest us of our heavy copper carapaces. Captain Nemo's first words were spoken to the Canadian. Thank you, Mr. Land, he told him. Tit for tat, Captain, Ned Land replied. I owed it to you. The ghost of a smile glided across the captain's lips, and that was all. To the Nautilus, he said. The longboat flew over the waves. A few minutes later we encountered the shark's corpse again, floating. From the black markings on the tips of its fins, I recognized the dreadful squalus melanopterus from the seas of the East Indies, a variety in the species of sharks proper. It was more than twenty-five feet long. Its enormous mouth occupied a third of its body. It was an adult, as could be seen from the six rows of teeth forming an isosceles triangle in its upper jaw. Conseil looked at it with purely scientific fascination, and I'm sure he placed it not without good reason in the class of cartilaginous fish, order Chondropterygian, with fixed gills, family Salacia, genus Squalus. While I was contemplating this inert mass, suddenly a dozen of these voracious melanoptera appeared around our longboat. But, paying no attention to us, they pounced on the corpse and quarreled over every scrap of it. By 8.30 we were back on board the Nautilus. There I fell to thinking about the incidents that marked our excursion over the Manar oyster bank. Two impressions inevitably stood out. One concerned Captain Nemo's matchless bravery, the other his devotion to a human being, a representative of that race from which he had fled beneath the seas. In spite of everything, this strange man hadn't yet succeeded in completely stifling his heart. When I shared these impressions with him, he answered me in a tone touched with emotion. That Indian professor lives in the land of the oppressed, and I am to this day, and will be until my last breath, a native of that same land. Chapter 28 The Red Sea during the day of January 29, the island of Ceylon disappeared below the horizon, and at a speed of twenty miles per hour, the Nautilus glided into the labyrinthine channels that separate the Maldive and Lacadive Islands. It likewise hugged Kilton Island, a shore of madreporic origin discovered by Vasco da Gama in 1499 and one of nineteen chief islands in the island group of the Lacadives. Located between latitude 10 degrees and 14 degrees 30 north, and between longitude 50 degrees 72 and 69 degrees east. By then we had fared 16,220 miles, or 5,700 leagues, from our starting point in the seas of Japan. The next day, January 30, when the Nautilus rose to the surface of the ocean, there was no more land in sight. Setting its course for the north-northwest, the ship headed toward the Gulf of Oman, carved out between Arabia and the Indian Peninsula, and providing access to the Persian Gulf. This was obviously a blind alley with no possible outlet. So where was Captain Nemo taking us? I was unable to say, which didn't satisfy the Canadian, who that day asked me where we were going. We're going, Mr. Ned, where the captain's fancy takes us. His fancy, the Canadian replied, won't take us very far. The Persian Gulf has no outlet, and if we're to enter those waters, it won't be long before we return in our tracks. All right, we'll return, Mr. Land, and after the Persian Gulf, if the Nautilus wants to visit the Red Sea, the Strait of Bab el Mandeb is still there to let us in. I don't have to tell you, Ned Len replied, that the Red Sea is just as landlocked as the Gulf, since the Isthmus of Suez hasn't been cut all the way through yet. And even if it was, a boat as secretive as ours wouldn't risk a canal intersected with locks. So the Red Sea won't be our way back to Europe either. 
but I didn't say we'd return to Europe. What do you figure, then? I figure that after visiting these unusual waterways of Arabia and Egypt, the Nautilus will go back down to the Indian Ocean, perhaps through Mozambique Channel, perhaps off the Mascarene Islands, and then make for the Cape of Good Hope. And once we're at the Cape of Good Hope, the Canadian asked with typical persistence, well then, we'll enter the Atlantic Ocean, with which we aren't yet familiar. What's wrong, Ned, my friend? Are you tired of this voyage under the seas? Are you bored with the constantly changing sight of these underwater wonders? Speaking for myself, I'll be extremely distressed to see the end of a voyage so few men will ever have a chance to make. But don't you realize, Professor Arjona, the Canadian replied, that soon we'll have been imprisoned for three whole months aboard this Nautilus? No, Ned. I didn't realize it. I don't want to realize it, and I don't keep track of every day and every hour. But when will it be over? In its appointed time. Meanwhile, there's nothing we can do about it, and our discussions are futile. My gallant Ned, if you come and tell me a chance to escape is available to us, then I'll discuss it with you. But that isn't the case. And in all honesty, I don't think Captain Nemo ever ventures into European seas. This short dialogue reveals that in my mania for the Nautilus, I was turning into the spitting image of its commander. As for Ned Land, he ended our talk in his best speechifying style. That's all fine and dandy, but in my humble opinion, a life in jail is a life without joy. For four days until February 3, the Nautilus inspected the Gulf of Oman at various speeds and depths. It seemed to be travelling at random, as if hesitating over which course to follow, but it never crossed the Tropic of Cancer. After leaving this gulf, we raised Muscat for an instant, the most important town in the country of Oman. I marvelled at its strange appearance in the midst of the black rocks surrounding it, against which the white of its houses and forts stood out sharply. I spotted the rounded domes of its mosques, the elegant tips of its minarets, and its fresh leafy terraces. But it was only a fleeting vision, and the Nautilus soon sank beneath the dark waves of these waterways. Then our ship went along at a distance of six miles from the Arabic coasts of Mahra and Harmaraut, their undulating lines of mountains relieved by a few ancient ruins. On February 5, we finally put into the Gulf of Aden, a genuine funnel stuck into the neck of Bab el Mandeb, and bottling these Indian waters in the Red Sea. On February 6, the Nautilus cruised in sight of the city of Aden, perched on a promontory connected to the continent by a narrow isthmus, a sort of inaccessible Gibraltar, whose fortifications the English rebuilt after capturing it in 1839. I glimpsed the octagonal minarets of this town, which used to be one of the wealthiest, busiest commercial centres along this coast, as the Arab historian Idrisi tells it. I was convinced that when Captain Nemo reached this point, he would back out again. But I was mistaken, and much to my surprise, he did nothing of the sort. The next day, February 7, we entered the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb, whose name means Gate of Tears in the Arabic language. Twenty miles wide, it's only fifty-two kilometers long, and with the Nautilus launched at full speed, clearing it was the work of barely an hour. But I didn't see a thing, not even Perim Island, where the British government built fortifications to strengthen Aden's position. There were many English and French steamers ploughing this narrow passageway, liners going from Suez to Bombay, Calcutta, Melbourne, Réunion Island, and Mauritius. Far too much traffic for the Nautilus to make an appearance on the surface, so it wisely stayed in mid-water. Finally, at noon, we were ploughing the waves of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, that great lake so famous in biblical traditions, seldom replenished by rains, fed by no important rivers, continually drained by a high rate of evaporation, its water level dropping a metre and a half every year. If it were fully landlocked, like a lake, this odd gulf might dry up completely. On this score, it's inferior to its neighbours, the Caspian Sea and the Dead Sea, 
whose levels lower only to the point where their evaporation exactly equals the amount of water they take to their hearts. The Red Sea is 2,600 kilometers long, with an average width of 240. In the days of the Ptolemies and the Roman emperors, it was a great commercial artery for the world, and when its isthmus has been cut through, it will completely regain that bygone importance that the Suez railways have already brought back in part. I would not even attempt to understand the whim that induced Captain Nemo to take us into this gulf, but I wholeheartedly approve of the Nautilus's entering it. It adopted a medium pace, sometimes staying on the surface, sometimes diving to avoid some ships, and so I could observe both the inside and top side of this highly unusual sea. On February 8, as early as the first hours of daylight, Mocha appeared before us, a town now in ruins, whose walls would collapse at the mere sound of a cannon, and which shelters a few leafy date trees here and there. This once important city used to contain six public marketplaces, plus twenty-six mosques, and its walls, protected by fourteen forts, fashioned a three-kilometer girdle around it. Then the Nautilus drew near the beaches of Africa, where the sea is considerably deeper. There, through the open panels and in a midwater of crystal clarity, our ship enabled us to study wonderful bushes of shining coral and huge chunks of rock wrapped in splendid green furs of algae and fucus. What an indescribable sight! And what a variety of settings and scenery where these reefs and volcanic islands leveled off by the Libyan coast. But soon the Nautilus hugged the eastern shore where these tree forms appeared in all their glory. This was off the coast of Tihama and there such zoophyte displays not only flourished below sea level, but they also fashioned picturesque networks that unreeled as high as ten fathoms above it. The latter were more whimsical but less colorful than the former, which kept their bloom thanks to the moist vitality of the waters. How many delightful hours I spent in this way at the lounge window! How many new specimens of underwater flora and fauna I marveled at beneath the light of our electric beacon! Mushroom-shaped fungus coral, some slate-colored sea anemone, including the species Thalassianthus aster, among others. Organ pipe coral arranged like flutes and just begging for a puff from the god Pan. Shells unique to this sea that dwell in madreporic cavities and whose bases are twisted into squat spirals. And finally, a thousand samples of polypary I hadn't observed until then. The common sponge. First division in the polyp group, the class Spongiaria, has been created by scientists precisely for this unusual exhibit whose usefulness is beyond dispute. The sponge is definitely not a plant, as some naturalists still believe, but an animal of the lowest order, a polypary inferior even to coral. Its animal nature isn't in doubt, and we can't accept even the views of the ancients, who regarded it as halfway between plant and animal. But I must say that naturalists are not in agreement on the structural mode of sponges. For some, it's a polypary, and for others, such as Professor Milna et Quads, it's a simple, solitary individual. The class Spongiaria contains about 300 species that are encountered in a large number of seas and even in certain streams, where they've been given the name freshwater sponges. But their waters of choice are the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, near the Greek islands, or the coast of Syria. These waters witness the reproduction and growth of soft, delicate bath sponges, whose price run as high as 150 pounds apiece. The yellow sponge from Syria, the horn sponge from Barbary, etc. But since I had no hope of studying these zoophytes in the seaports of the Levant, from which we were separated by the insuperable isthmus of Suez, I had to be content with observing them in the waters of the Red Sea. So I called Conseil to my side, while at an average depth of eight to nine meters, the Nautilus slowly skimmed every beautiful rock on the easterly coast. There sponges grew in every shape, globular, stalk-like, leaf-like, finger-like. With reasonable accuracy they lived up to their nicknames of basket sponges, chalice sponges, distiff sponges, elkhorn sponges, lion's paws, peacock's tails, and Neptune's gloves. 
designations bestowed on them by fishermen, more poetically inclined than scientists. A gelatinous semi-fluid substance coated the fibrous tissue of these sponges, and from this tissue there escaped a steady trickle of water that, after carrying sustenance to each cell, was being expelled by a contracting movement. The jelly-like substance disappears when the polyp dies, emitting ammonia as it rots. Finally, nothing remains but the fibers, either gelatinous or make of horn, that constitute your household sponge, which takes on a russet hue and is used for various tasks depending on its degree of elasticity, permeability, or resistance to saturation. These polyparies were sticking to rocks, shells of mollusks, and even the stalks of water plants. They adorned the smallest crevices, some sprawling, others standing or hanging like coral outgrowths. I told Conseil that sponges are fished up in two ways, either by dragnet or by hand. The latter method calls for the services of a diver, but it's preferable because it spares the polyparies tissue, leaving it with a much higher market value. Other zoophytes swarming near the sponges consisted chiefly of a very elegant species of jellyfish. Mollusks were represented by varieties of squid that, according to Professor Aubigny, are unique to the Red Sea. And reptiles by vergata turtles belonging to the genus Chelonia, which furnished our table with a dainty but wholesome dish. As for fish, they were numerous and often remarkable. Here are the ones that the Nautilus's nets most frequently hauled on board. Rays, including spotted rays that were oval in shape and brick red in color, their bodies strewn with erratic blue speckles, and identifiable by their jagged double stings, silver-backed skates, common stingrays with stippled tails, butterfly rays that looked like huge two-meter cloaks flapping at mid-depth, toothless guitarfish that were a type of cartilaginous fish closer to the shark, trunkfish known as dromedaries that were one and a half feet long and had humps ending in backward curving stings, serpentine moray eels with silver tails and bluish backs, plus brown pectorals trimmed in gray piping, a species of butterfish called the fiotola decked out in thin gold stripes and the three colors of the French flag, Montague blennies four decimeter long, superb jacks handsomely embellished by seven black crosswise streaks with blue and yellow fins, plus gold and silver scales, snooks, standard mullet with yellow heads, parrotfish, wrasse, triggerfish, gobies, etc., plus a thousand other fish common to the oceans we had already crossed. On February 9, the Nautilus cruised in the widest part of the Red Sea, measuring 190 miles straight across from Swakin on the west coast, to Quinfida on the east coast. At noon that day, after our position fix, Captain Nemo climbed onto the platform where I happened to be. I vowed not to let him go below again without at least sounding him on his future plans. As soon as he saw me, he came over, graciously offered me a cigar, and he said to me, Well, Professor, are you pleased with this Red Sea? Have you seen enough of its hidden wonders, its fish and zoophytes, its gardens of sponges and forests of coral? Have you glimpsed the towns built on its shores? Yes, Captain Nemo, I replied. And the Nautilus is wonderfully suited to this whole survey. Ah, it's a clever boat. Yes, sir, clever, daring, and invulnerable. It fears neither the Red Sea's dreadful storms nor its currents and reefs. Indeed, I said. This sea is mentioned as one of the worst, and in the days of the ancients, if I'm not mistaken, it had an abominable reputation. Thoroughly abominable, Professor Achona. The Greek and Latin historians can find nothing to say in its favor, and the Greek geographer Strabo adds that it's especially rough during the rainy season, and the period of summer prevailing winds. The Arab Indrisi, referring to it by the name Gulf of Kolzum, relates that ships perished in large numbers on its sandbanks, and that no one risked navigating it by night. This, he claims, is a sea subject to fearful hurricanes strewn with inhospitable islands, and with nothing good to offer, either on its surface or in its depths. As a matter of fact, 
The same views can also be found in Arian, Agatharchides, and Artemidorus. One can easily see, I answered, that those historians didn't navigate aboard the Nautilus. Indeed, the captain replied with a smile. And in this respect, the moderns aren't much farther along than the ancients. It took many centuries to discover the mechanical power of steam. Who knows whether we'll see a second Nautilus within the next one hundred years. Progress is slow, Professor Archona. It's true, I replied. Your ship is a century ahead of its time, perhaps several centuries. It would be most unfortunate if such a secret were to die with its inventor. Captain Nemo did not reply. After some minutes of silence, we were discussing, he said, the views of ancient historians on the dangers of navigating this Red Sea. True, I replied, but weren't their fears exaggerated? Yes and no, Professor Achona, answered Captain Nemo, who seemed to know his Red Sea by heart. To a modern ship, well-rigged, solidly constructed, and in control of its course, thanks to obedient steam, some conditions are no longer hazardous, that offered all sorts of dangers to the vessels of the ancients. Picture those early navigators venturing forth in sailboats built from planks lashed together with palm-tree ropes, caulked with powdered resin, and coated with dogfish grease. They didn't even have instruments for taking their bearings. They went by guesswork in the midst of currents they barely knew. Under such conditions, shipwrecks had to be numerous, but nowadays, steamers providing service between Suez and the South Seas have nothing to fear from the fury of this gulf, despite the contrary wind of its monsoons. Their captains and passengers no longer prepare for departure with sacrifices to placate the gods. And after returning, they don't traipse in wreaths and gold ribbons to say thanks at the local temple. Agreed, I said. And steam seems to have killed off all gratitude in seamen's hearts. But since you seem to have made a special study of this sea, Captain, can you tell me how it got its name? Many explanations exist on the subject, Professor Achona. Would you like to hear the views of one chronicler in the fourteenth century? Gladly. The fanciful fellow claims the sea was given its name after the crossing of the Israelites, when the pharaoh perished in those waves that came together again at Moses' command. To mark that miraculous sequel, the sea turned a red without equal. Thus no other course would do but to name it for its hue. An artistic explanation, Captain Nemo, I replied, but I'm unable to rest content with it, so I'll ask you for your own personal views. Here they come. To my thinking, Professor Achona, this Red Sea designation must be regarded as a translation of the Hebrew word Edrom and if the ancients gave it that name, it was because of the unique color of its waters. Until now, however, I've seen only clear waves without any unique hue. Surely, but as we move ahead to the far end of this gulf, you'll note its odd appearance. I recall seeing the Bay of El Tour completely red, like a lake of blood. And you attribute this color to the presence of microscopic algae? Yes. It's a purplish mucilaginous substance produced by those tiny buds known by the name Trichondesmia, 40,000 of which are needed to occupy the space of one square millimeter. Perhaps you'll encounter them when we reach El Tour. Hence, Captain Nemo, this isn't the first time you've gone through the Red Sea aboard the Nautilus? No, sir. Then, since you've already mentioned the crossing of the Israelites and the catastrophe that befell the Egyptians... I would ask if you've ever discovered any traces under the waters of that great historic event. No, Professor, and for an excellent reason. What's that? It's because that same locality where Moses crossed with all his people is now so clogged with sand camels can barely get their legs wet. You can understand that my Nautilus wouldn't have enough water for itself. 
And that locality is? I asked. The locality lies a little above Suez, in a sound that used to form a deep estuary when the Red Sea stretched as far as the Bitter Lakes. Now, whether or not their crossing was literally miraculous, the Israelites did cross there in returning to the Promised Land, and the Pharaoh's army did perish at precisely that locality. So I think that excavating those sands would bring to light a great many weapons and tools of Egyptian origin. Obviously, I replied, and for the sake of archaeology, let's hope that sooner or later such excavations do take place, once new towns are settled on the Isthmus after the Suez Canal has been cut through. A canal, by the way, of little use to a ship such as the Nautilus. Surely, but of great use to the world at large. Captain Nemo said. The ancients well understood the usefulness to commerce of connecting the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, but they never dreamed of cutting a canal between the two, and instead they picked the Nile as their link. If we can trust tradition, it was probably Egypt's king, Sesostris, who started digging the canal needed to join the Nile with the Red Sea. What's certain is that in 615 B.C., King Necho II was hard at work on a canal that was fed by Nile water and ran through the Egyptian plains opposite Arabia. The canal could be travelled in four days, and it was so wide two triple-tiered galleys could pass through it abreast. Its construction was continued by Darius the Great, son of Histaspes, and probably completed by King Ptolemy II. Strabo saw it used for shipping, but the weakness of its slope between its starting point near Bubastis and the Red Sea left it navigable only a few months out of the year. This canal served commerce until the century of Rome's Antonin emperors. It was then abandoned and covered with sand, subsequently reinstated by Arabia's Caliph Omar I and finally filled in for good in 761 or 762 A.D., by Caliph al-Mansur, in an effort to prevent supplies from reaching Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who had rebelled against him. During his Egyptian campaign, your general Napoleon Bonaparte discovered traces of this old canal in the Suez Desert, and when the tide caught him by surprise, he well nigh perished, just a few hours before rejoining his regiment at Hajaroth, the very place where Moses had pitched camp three thousand three hundred years before him. Well, Captain, what the ancients hesitated to undertake, Mr. de Lesseps is now finishing up. His joining of these two seas will shorten the route from Cadiz to the East Indies by 9,000 kilometers, and he'll soon change Africa into an immense island. Yes, Professor Achona, and you have every right to be proud of your fellow countrymen. Such a man brings a nation more honor than the greatest commanders. Like so many others, he began with difficulties and setbacks, but he triumphed because he had the volunteer spirit. And it's sad to think that this deed, which should have been an international deed, which would have ensured that any administration went down in history, will succeed only through the efforts of one man. So, all hail to Mr. de Lesseps. Yes, all hail to that great French citizen, I replied quite startled by how emphatically Captain Nemo had just spoken. Unfortunately, he went on, I can't take you through that Suez Canal, but the day after tomorrow you'll be able to see the long jetties of Port Said when we're in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean? I exclaimed. Yes, Professor. Does that amaze you? What amazes me is thinking we'll be there the day after tomorrow. Oh, really? Yes, Captain, although since I've been aboard your vessel, I should have formed the habit of not being amazed by anything. But what is it that startles you? The thought of how hideously fast the Nautilus will need to go, if it's to double the Cape of Good Hope, circle around Africa, and lie in the open Mediterranean by the day after tomorrow. And who says it will circle Africa, Professor? What's this talk about doubling the Cape of Good Hope? But unless the Nautilus navigates on dry land and crosses over the Isthmus, or under it, Professor Achona. 
under it. Surely, Captain Nemo replied serenely. Under that tongue of land, nature long ago made what man today is making on its surface. What? There's a passageway? Yes, an underground passageway that I've named the Arabian Tunnel. It starts below Suez and leads to the Bay of Belusim. But isn't that isthmus only composed of quicksand? To a certain depth. But at merely fifty meters one encounters a firm foundation of rock. And it's by luck that you've discovered this passageway? I asked more and more startled. Luck plus logic, Professor. And logic even more than luck. Captain, I hear you, but I can't believe my ears. Oh, sir, the old saying still holds. Ores habiant et non odiant. Not only does this passageway exist, but I've taken advantage of it on several occasions. Without it, I wouldn't have ventured today into such a blind alley as the Red Sea. Is it indiscreet to ask how you discovered this tunnel? Sir, the captain answered me. There can be no secrets between men who will never leave each other. I ignored this innuendo and waited for Captain Nemo's explanation. Professor, he told me, the simple logic of the naturalist led me to discover this passageway, and I alone am familiar with it. I'd noted that in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean there exist a number of absolutely identical species of fish. Eels, butterfish, greenfish, bass, jewelfish, flying fish. Certain of this fact, I wondered if there weren't a connection between the two seas. If there were, its underground current had to go from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, simply because of their difference in level. So I caught a large number of fish in the vicinity of Suez. I slipped copper rings around their tails and tossed them back into the sea. A few months later, off the coast of Syria, I recaptured a few specimens of my fish, adorned with their tail-tail rings. So this proved to me that some connection existed between the two seas. I searched for it with my nautilus. I discovered it. I ventured into it. And soon, Professor, you will also have cleared my Arabic tunnel. Chapter 29 Arabian Tunnel The same day I reported to Conseil and Ned Land that part of the foregoing conversation directly concerning them. When I told them we would be lying in Mediterranean waters within two days, Conseil clapped his hands, but the Canadian shrugged his shoulders. An underwater tunnel, he exclaimed. A connection between two seas. Who ever heard of such malarkey? Ned, my friend, Conseil replied. Had you ever heard of the Nautilus? No, yet here it is. So don't shrug your shoulders so blithely, and don't discount something with the feeble excuse that you've never heard of it. We'll soon see, Ned Land shot back, shaking his head. After all, I'd like nothing better than to believe in your captain's little passageway, and may heaven grant it really does take us to the Mediterranean. The same evening, at latitude 21 degrees 30 north, the Nautilus was afloat on the surface of the sea and drawing nearer to the Arab coast. I spotted Jidda, an important financial center for Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and the East Indies. I could distinguish, with reasonable clarity, the overall effect of its buildings, the ships made fast along its wharves, and those bigger vessels whose draft of water required them to drop anchor at the port's offshore mooring. The sun, fairly low on the horizon, struck full force on the houses in this town, accenting their whiteness. Outside the city limits, some wood or reed huts indicated the quarter where the Bedouins lived. Soon Jidda faded into the shadows of evening, and the Nautilus went back beneath the mildly phosphorescent waters. The next day, February 10, several ships appeared running on our opposite track. The Nautilus resumed its underwater navigating, but at the moment of our noon sights, the sea was deserted, and the ship rose again to its water line. With Ned and Conseil, I went to sit on the platform. The coast to the east looked like a slightly blurred mass in a damp fog. 
leaning against the sides of the skiff, we were chatting of one thing and another, when Ned Land stretched his hand toward a point in the water, saying to me, "'See anything out there, Professor?' "'No, Ned,' I replied. "'But you know I don't have your eyes.' "'Take a good look,' Ned went on. "'There, ahead to starboard, almost level with the beacon. "'Don't you see a mass that seems to be moving around?' "'Right,' I said after observing carefully. "'I can make out something like a long blackish object on the surface of the water.' "'A second Nautilus?' Conseil said. "'No,' the Canadian replied. "'Unless I'm badly mistaken, that's some marine animal.' "'Are there whales in the Red Sea?' Conseil asked. "'Yes, my boy,' I replied. "'They're sometimes found here.' "'That's no whale.' continued Ned Land, whose eyes never strayed from the object they had sighted. We're old chums, Wales and I, and I couldn't mistake their little ways. Let's wait and see, Conseil said. The Nautilus is heading that direction, and we'll soon know what we're in for. In fact, that blackish object was soon only a mile away from us. It looked like a huge reef stranded in mid-ocean. What was it? I still couldn't make up my mind. Oh, it's moving off. It's diving! Ned Land exclaimed. Damnation! What can that animal be? It doesn't have a forked tail like baleen whales or sperm whales, and its fins look like sawed-off limbs. Uh, but in that case, I put in. Good Lord! The Canadian went on. It's rolled over on its back, and it's raising its breasts in the air. He says sarin! Conseil exclaimed. With all due respect to master, it's an actual mermaid. That word siren put me back on track, and I realized that the animal belonged to the order Serenia, marine creatures that legends have turned into mermaids, half woman, half fish. No, I told Conseil, that's no mermaid, it's an unusual creature of which only a few specimens are left in the Red Sea. That's a dugon. Order Serenia, group Pisciforma, subclass Monodelphia, class Mamelhia, branch Vertebrata, Conseil replied. And when Conseil has spoken, there's nothing else to be said. Meanwhile, Ned Land kept staring. His eyes were gleaming with desire at the sight of that animal. His hands were ready to hurl a harpoon. You would have thought he was waiting for the right moment to jump overboard and attack the creature in its own element. Oh, sir... He told me in a voice trembling with excitement. I've never killed anything like that. His whole being was concentrated in this last word. Just then, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. He spotted the dugong. He understood the Canadian's frame of mind and addressed him directly. If you held a harpoon, Mr. Land, wouldn't your hand be itching to put it to work? Positively, sir. And just for one day, would it displease you to return to your fisherman's trade and add this cetacean to the list of those you've already hunted down? It wouldn't displease me one bit. All right. You can try your luck. Thank you, sir, Ned Land replied, his eyes ablaze. Only, the captain went on, I urge you to aim carefully at this animal in your own personal interest. Is the dugong dangerous to attack? I asked, despite the Canadian's shrug of the shoulders. Yes, sometimes, the captain replied. These animals have been known to turn on their assailants and capsize their longboats. But with Mr. Land, that danger isn't to be feared. His eye is sharp, his arm is sure. If I recommend that he aim carefully at this dugong, it's because the animal is justly regarded as fine game. And I know Mr. Land doesn't despise a choice morsel. Aha! The Canadian put in. This beast offers the added luxury of being good to eat? Yes, Mr. Land. Its flesh is actual red meat, highly prized, and set aside throughout Malaysia for the tables of aristocrats. Accordingly... This excellent animal has been hunted so bloodthirstily that, like its manatee relatives, it has become more and more scarce. 
In that case, Captain, Conseil said in all seriousness, on the off chance that this creature might be the last of its line, wouldn't it be advisable to spare its life in the interest of science? Maybe, the Canadian answered. It would be better to hunt it down in the interests of mealtime. Then proceed, Mr. Land, Captain Nemo replied. Just then, as mute and emotionless as ever, seven crewmen climbed onto the platform. One carried a harpoon and line similar to those used in whale fishing. Its deck paneling opened, the skiff was wrenched from its socket, and launched to sea. Six rowers sat on the thwarts, and the coxswain took the tiller. Ned, Conseil, and I found seats in the stern. Aren't you coming, Captain? I asked. No, sir, but I wish you happy hunting. The skiff pulled clear, and carried off by its six oars, it headed swiftly toward the dugong, which by then was floating two miles from the Nautilus. Arriving within a few cable lengths of the cetacean, our longboat slowed down, and the skulls dipped noiselessly into the tranquil waters. Harpoon in hand, Ned Land went to take his stand in the skiff's bow. Harpoons used for hunting whales are usually attached to a very long rope that pays out quickly when the wounded animal drags it with him. But this rope measured no more than about ten fathoms, and its end had simply been fastened to a small barrel that, while floating, would indicate the dugong's movements beneath the waters. I stood up and could clearly observe the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also boasts the name Halicor, closely resembled a manatee. Its oblong body ended in a very long caudal fin, and its lateral fins in actual fingers. It differs from the manatee in that its upper jaw is armed with two long pointed teeth that form diverging tusks on either side. This dugong that Ned Land was preparing to attack was of colossal dimensions. Easily exceeding seven meters in length, it didn't stir and seemed to be sleeping on the surface of the waves a circumstance that should have made it easier to capture. The skiff approached cautiously to within three fathoms of the animal. The oars hung suspended above their rowlocks. I was crouching. His body leaning slightly back, Ned Land brandished the harpoon with expert hands. Suddenly, a hissing sound was audible, and the dugong disappeared. Although the harpoon had been forcefully hurled, it apparently had hit only water. Damnation! exclaimed the furious Canadian. I missed it! No, I said. The animal's wounded. There's its blood. But your weapon didn't stick in its body. My harpoon! Get my harpoon! Ned Land exclaimed. The sailors went back to their sculling, and the coxswain steered the longboat toward the floating barrel. We fished up the harpoon, and the skiff started off in pursuit of the animal. The latter returned from time to time to breathe at the surface of the sea, its wound hadn't weakened it, because it went with tremendous speed. Driven by energetic arms, the longboat flew on its trail. Several times we got within a few fathoms of it, and the Canadian hovered in readiness to strike. But then the dugong would steal away with a sudden dive, and it proved impossible to overtake the beast. I'll let you assess the degree of anger consuming our impatient Ned Land. He hurled at the hapless animal the most potent swear words in the English language. For my part, I was simply distressed to see this dugong outwit our every scheme. We chased it unflaggingly for a full hour, and I'd begun to think it would prove too difficult to capture, when the animal got the untimely idea of taking revenge on us, a notion it would soon have cause to regret. It wheeled on the skiff to assault us in its turn. The maneuver did not escape the Canadian. Watch out, he said. The coxswain pronounced a few words in his bizarre language, and no doubt he alerted his men to keep on their guard. Arriving within twenty feet of the skiff, the dugong stopped, sharply sniffing the air with its huge nostrils, pierced not at the tip of its muzzle, but on its top side. Then it gathered itself and sprang at us. The skiff couldn't avoid the collision. Half overturned, it shipped a ton or two of water that we had to bail out. But thanks to our skillful coxswain, we were fouled on the bias rather than broadside, so we didn't capsize.
clinging to the stem post, Ned Land thrust his harpoon again and again into the gigantic animal, which embedded its teeth in our gunwale and lifted the longboat out of the water as a lion would lift a deer. We were thrown on top of each other, and I had no idea how the venture would have ended had not the Canadian, still thirsting for the beast's blood, finally pierced it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on sheet iron, and the dugong disappeared, taking our harpoon along with it. But the barrel soon popped up on the surface, and a few moments later the animal's body appeared and rolled over on its back. Our skiff rejoined it, took it in tow, and headed to the Nautilus. It took pulleys of great strength to hoist this dugong onto the platform. The beast weighed 5,000 kilograms. It was carved up in sight of the Canadian, who remained to watch every detail of the operation. At dinner the same day, my steward served me some slices of this flesh, skillfully dressed by the ship's cook. I found it excellent, even better than veal, if not beef. The next morning, February 11, the Nautilus's pantry was enriched by more dainty game. A covey of terns alighted on the Nautilus. They were a species of sterner nilotica, unique to Egypt. Beak black, head gray, and stippled, eyes surrounded by white dots, back, wings, and tail grayish, belly and throat white, feet red. Also caught were a couple dozen Nile duck, superior-tasting wild fowl, whose neck and crown of the head are white speckled with black. By then the Nautilus had reduced speed. It moved ahead at a saunter, so to speak. I observed that the Red Sea's water was becoming less salty the closer we got to Suez. Near five o'clock in the afternoon, we sighted Cape Ras Mohammed to the north. This cape forms the tip of Arabia Petraea, which lies between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus entered the Strait of Jubal, which leads to the Gulf of Suez. I could clearly make out a high mountain crowning Ras Mohammed between the two gulfs. It was Mount Horeb, that biblical Mount Sinai, on whose summit Moses met God face to face, that summit the mind's eye always pictures as wreathed in lightning. At six o'clock, sometimes afloat and sometimes submerged, the Nautilus passed well out of El Tour, which sat at the far end of a bay whose waters seemed to be dyed red as Captain Nemo had already mentioned. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence occasionally broken by the calls of pelicans and nocturnal birds, by the sound of scurf chafing against rocks, or by the distant moan of a steamer churning the waves of the gulf with noisy blades. From eight to nine o'clock, the Nautilus stayed a few meters beneath the waters. According to my calculations, we had to be quite close to Suez. Through the panels in the lounge, I spotted rocky bottoms brightly lit by our electric rays. It seemed to me that the strait was getting narrower and narrower. At 9.15, when our boat returned to the surface, I climbed onto the platform. I was quite impatient to clear Captain Nemo's tunnel, couldn't sit still and wanted to breathe the fresh night air. Soon, in the shadows, I spotted a pale signal light glimmering a mile away, half discolored by mist. A floating lighthouse, said someone next to me. I turned and discovered the captain. That's the floating signal light of Suez, he went on. It won't be long before we reach the entrance to the tunnel. It can't be very easy to enter it. No, sir. Accordingly, I am in the habit of staying in the pilot house and directing maneuvers myself. And now, if you'll kindly go below, Professor Achona, the Nautilus is about to sink beneath the waves, and it will only return to the surface after we've cleared the Arabian Tunnel. I followed Captain Nemo, the hatch closed, the ballast tanks filled with water, and the submersible sank some ten meters down. Just as I was about to repair to my steam room, the captain stopped me. Professor, he said to me, would you like to go with me to the wheelhouse? I was afraid to ask, I replied. Come along, then. This way, you'll learn the full story about this combination underwater and undergoing navigating. Captain Nemo led me to the central companionway. 
In mid-stair, he opened a door, went along the upper gangways, and arrived at the wheelhouse, which, as you know, stands at one end of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square, and closely resembling those occupied by the helmsmen of steamboats on the Mississippi or Hudson Rivers. In the center stood an upright wheel geared to rudder cables running to the Nautilus's stern. Set in the cabin's walls were four deadlights, windows of biconvex glass, that enabled the man at the helm to see in every direction. The cabin was dark, but my eyes soon grew accustomed to its darkness, and I saw the pilot, a muscular man whose hands rested on the pegs of the wheel. Outside, the sea was brightly lit by the beacon shining behind the captain at the other end of the platform. Now, Captain Nemo said, let's look for our passageway. Electric wires linked the pilot house with the engine room, and from this cabin the captain could simultaneously signal heading and speed to his nautilus. He pressed a metal button, and at once the propeller slowed down significantly. I stared in silence at the high, sheer wall we were skirting just then, the firm base of the sandy mountains on the coast. For an hour we went along it in this fashion, staying only a few meters away. Captain Nemo never took his eyes off the two concentric circles of the compass hanging in the cabin. At a mere gesture from him, the helmsman would instantly change the Nautilus's heading. Standing by the port deadlight, I spotted magnificent coral substructures, zoophytes, algae, and crustaceans, with enormous quivering claws that stretched forth from crevices in the rock. At 10.15, Captain Nemo himself took the helm. Dark and deep, a wide gallery opened ahead of us. The Nautilus was brazenly swallowed up. Strange rumblings were audible along our sides. It was the water of the Red Sea hurled toward the Mediterranean by the tunnel slope. Our engines tried to offer resistance by churning the waves with propeller in reverse, but the Nautilus went with the torrent, as swift as an arrow. Along the narrow walls of this passageway, I saw only brilliant streaks, hard lines, fiery furrows, all scrawled by our speeding electric light. With my hand I tried to curb the pounding of my heart. At 10.35, Captain Nemo left the steering wheel and turned to me. The Mediterranean, he told me. In less than twenty minutes, swept along by the torrent, the Nautilus had just cleared the Isthmus of Suez. Chapter 30 The Greek Islands at sunrise the next morning, February 12, the Nautilus rose to the surface of the waves. I rushed onto the platform. The hazy silhouette of Pelusium was outlined three miles to the south. A torrent had carried us from one sea to the other, but although that tunnel was easy to descend, going back up must have been impossible. Near seven o'clock, Ned and Conseil joined me. Those two inseparable companions had slept serenely utterly unaware of the Nautilus's feet. "'Well, Mr. Naturalist,' the Canadian asked in a gently mocking tone, "'and how about that Mediterranean?' "'We're floating on its surface, Ned, my friend.' "'What?' Conseil put in. "'Last night—' "'Yes, last night, in a matter of minutes, "'we cleared that insuperable isthmus.' "'I don't believe a word of it,' the Canadian replied. And you're in the wrong, Mr. Land, I went on. That flat coastline curving southward is the coast of Egypt. Tell it to the Marines, sir, answered the stubborn Canadian. But if Master says so, Conseil told him, then so be it. What's more, Ned, I said, Captain Nemo himself did the honors in his tunnel, and I stood beside him in the pilot house while he steered the Nautilus through the narrow passageway. You hear, Ned? Conseil said. And you, Ned, who have such good eyes, I added, you can spot the jetties of Port Said stretching out to sea. The Canadian looked carefully. Correct, he said. You're right, Professor, and your captain's a superman. We're in the Mediterranean, fine. 
So now let's have a chat about our little doings, if you please, but in such a way that nobody overhears. I could easily see what the Canadian was driving at. In any event, I thought it best to let him have his chat, and we all three went to sit next to the beacon, where we were less exposed to the damp spray from the billows. Now, Ned, we're all ears, I said. What have you to tell us? What I've got to tell you is very simple, the Canadian replied. We're in Europe, and before Captain Nemo's whims take us deep into the polar seas or back to Oceania, I say we should leave this Nautilus. I confess that such discussions with the Canadian always baffled me. I didn't want to restrict my companion's freedom in any way, and yet I had no desire to leave Captain Nemo. Thanks to him and his submersible, I was finishing my undersea research by the day, and I was rewriting my book on the great ocean depths in the midst of its very element. Would I ever again have such an opportunity to observe the ocean's wonders? Absolutely not! So I couldn't entertain this idea of leaving the Nautilus before completing our course of inquiry. Ned, my friend, I said, answer me honestly. Are you bored with this ship? Are you sorry that fate has cast you into Captain Nemo's hands? The Canadian paused for a short while before replying. Then, crossing his arms, Honestly, he said, I'm not sorry about this voyage under the seas. I'll be glad to have done it, but in order to have done it, it has to finish. That's my feeling. It will finish, Ned. Where and when? Where, I don't know. When, I can't say. Or, rather, I suppose it will be over when these seas have nothing more to teach us. Everything that begins in this world must inevitably come to an end. I think as Master does, Conseil replied. And it's extremely possible that after crossing every sea on the globe, Captain Nemo will bid the three of us a fond farewell. Bid us a fond farewell? The Canadian exclaimed. You mean beat us to a fare thee well. Let's not exaggerate, Mr. Land, I went on. We have nothing to fear from the captain, but neither do I share Conseil's views. We're privy to the Nautilus's secrets, and I don't expect that its commander, just to set us free, will meekly stand by while we spread those secrets all over the world. But in that case, what do you expect? The Canadian asked that will encounter advantageous conditions for escaping just as readily in six months as now. Great Scott! Ned Land put in. And where, if you please, will we be in six months, Mr. Naturalist? Perhaps here, perhaps in China. You know how quickly the Nautilus moves. It crosses oceans like swallows cross the air, or express trains continents. It doesn't fear heavily traveled seas. Who can say it won't hug the coasts of France, England, or America? where an escape attempt could be carried out just as effectively as here. Professor Achona, the Canadian replied, your arguments are rotten to the core. You talk way off in the future. We'll be here, we'll be there. Me, I'm talking about right now. We are here, and we must take advantage of it. I was hard-pressed by Ned Land's common sense, and I felt myself losing ground. I no longer knew what arguments to put forward on my behalf. Sir, Ned went on, let's suppose that by some impossibility Captain Nemo offered your freedom to you this very day. Would you accept? I don't know, I replied. And suppose he adds that this offer he's making you today won't ever be repeated. Then would you accept? I did not reply. And what thinks our friend Conseil? Ned Land asked. Your friend Conseil, the fine lad replied serenely, has nothing to say for himself. He's a completely disinterested party on this question. Like his master, like his comrade Ned, he's a bachelor. Neither wife, parents, nor children are waiting for him back home. He's in master's employ. He thinks like master. He speaks like master, and much to his regret, he can't be counted on to form a majority. Only two persons face each other here. Master on one side, Ned Land on the other. That said, your friend Conseil is listening, and he's ready to keep score. 
I couldn't help smiling as Conseil wiped himself out of existence. Deep down, the Canadian must have been overjoyed at not having to contend with him. Then, sir, Ned Land said, since Conseil is no more, we'll have this discussion between just the two of us. I've talked, you've listened. What's your reply? It was obvious that the matter had to be settled, and evasions were distasteful to me. Ned, my friend, I said, here's my reply. You have right on your side, and my arguments can't stand up to yours. It will never do to count on Captain Nemo's benevolence. The most ordinary good sense would forbid him to set us free. On the other hand, good sense decrees that we take advantage of our first opportunity to leave the Nautilus. Fine, Professor Arjona. That's wisely said. But one proviso, I said. Just one. The opportunity must be the real thing. Our first attempt to escape must succeed, because if it misfires, we won't get a second chance. And Captain Nemo will never forgive us. That's also well put, the Canadian replied. But your proviso applies to any escape attempt, whether it happens in two years or two days. So this is still the question. If a promising opportunity comes up, we have to grab it. Agreed. And now, Ned, will you tell me what you mean by a promising opportunity? One that leads the Nautilus on a cloudy night within a short distance of some European coast. And you'll try to get away by swimming? Yes, if we're close enough to shore and the ship's afloat on the surface. No, if we're well out and the ship's navigating under the waters. And in that event? In that event, I'll try to get hold of the skiff. I know how to handle it. We'll stick ourselves inside, undo the bolts, and rise to the surface, without the helmsman in the bow seeing a thing. Fine, Ned. Stay on the lookout for such an opportunity. But don't forget, one slip-up will finish us. I won't forget, sir. And now, Ned, would you like to know my overall thinking on your plan? Gladly, Professor Achona. Well, then, I think... And I don't mean, I hope, that your promising opportunity won't ever arise. Why not? Because Captain Nemo recognizes that we haven't given up all hope of recovering our freedom, and he'll keep on his guard, above all in seas within sight of the coasts of Europe. I'm of Master's opinion, Conseil said. We'll soon see, Ned Land replied, shaking his head with a determined expression. And now, Ned Land... I added, let's leave it at that. Not another word on any of this. The day you're ready, alert us and we're with you. I turn it all over to you. That's how we ended this conversation, which later was to have such serious consequences. At first, I must say, events seemed to confirm my forecasts, much to the Canadians' despair. Did Captain Nemo view us with distrust in these heavily travelled seas, or did he simply want to hide from us the sight of those ships of every nation that ploughed the Mediterranean? I have no idea, but usually he stayed in midwater and well out from any coast. Either the Nautilus surfaced only enough to let its pilot house emerge, or it slipped away to the lower depths. Although, between the Greek islands and Asia Minor, we didn't find bottom even at 2,000 meters down. Accordingly, I became aware of the Isle of Carpathos, one of the Sporides Islands, only when Captain Nemo placed his finger over a spot on the world map and quoted me this verse from Virgil. Est in Carpathio Neptune gurgite vates caerulius Proteus. It was indeed that bygone abode of Proteus, the old shepherd king of Neptune's flocks, an island located between Rhodes and Crete, which Greeks now call Carpathos, Italians Scarpanto. Through the lounge window I could see only its granite bedrock. The next day, February 14, I decided to spend a few hours studying the fish of this island group. But for whatever reason, the panels remained hermetically sealed. After determining the Nautilus's heading, I noted that it was proceeding toward the ancient island of Crete, also called Candida. 
At the time I had shipped aboard the Abraham Lincoln, this whole island was in rebellion against its tyrannical rulers, the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. But since then I had absolutely no idea what happened to this revolution, and Captain Nemo, deprived of all contact with the shore, was hardly the man to keep me informed. So I didn't allude to this event when, that evening, I chanced to be alone with the captain in the lounge. Besides, he seemed silent and preoccupied. Then, contrary to custom, he ordered that both panels in the lounge be opened, and going from the one to the other, he carefully observed the watery mass. For what purpose? I hadn't a guess, and for my part I spent my time studying the fish that passed before my eyes. Among others I noted that sand goby mentioned by Aristotle, and commonly known by the name sea loach which is encountered exclusively in the salty waters next to the Nile Delta. Near them some semi-phosphorescent red porgy rolled by, a variety of gilthead that the Egyptians ranked among their sacred animals, lauding them in religious ceremonies when their arrival in the river's waters announced the fertile flood season. I also noticed some wrasse known as the tapiro, Three decimeters long, bony fish with transparent scales whose bluish-gray color is mixed with red spots. They are enthusiastic eaters of marine vegetables, which give them an exquisite flavor. Hence, these tapiro were much in demand by the epicures of ancient Rome, and their entrails were dressed with brains of peacock, tongue of flamingo, and testes of moray to make that divine platter that so enraptured the Roman emperor Vitellius. Another resident of these seas caught my attention and revived all my memories of antiquity. This was the remora, which travels attached to the bellies of sharks. As the ancients tell it, when these little fish cling to the undersides of a ship, they can bring it to a halt, and by so impeding Mark Antony's vessel during the Battle of Actium. One of them facilitated the victory of Augustus Caesar. From such slender threads hang the destinies of nations. I also observed some wonderful snappers belonging to the order Lutianidia, sacred fish for the Greeks, who claimed they could drive off sea monsters from the waters they frequent. Their Greek name, Antheus, means flower, and they live up to it in the play of their colors and in those fleeting reflections that turn their dorsal fins into watered silk. Their hues are confined to a gamut of reds, from the pallor of pink to the glow of ruby. I couldn't take my eyes off these marine wonders, when I was suddenly jolted by an unexpected apparition. In the midst of the waters, a man appeared, a diver carrying a little leather bag at his belt. It was no corpse lost in the waves, it was a living man, swimming vigorously, sometimes disappearing to breathe at the surface, then instantly diving again. I turned to Captain Nemo, and in an agitated voice, A man! A, a castaway! I exclaimed. We must rescue him at all cost! The captain didn't reply, but went to lean against the window. The man drew near, and gluing his face to the panel, he stared at us. To my deep astonishment, Captain Nemo gave him a signal. The diver answered with his hand, immediately swam up to the surface of the sea, and didn't reappear. Don't be alarmed, the captain told me. That's Nicholas from Cape Matapan, nicknamed Il Pesce. He's well known throughout the Cyclades Islands. A bold diver, water in his true element, and he lives in the sea more than on shore, going constantly from one island to another, even to Crete. You know him, captain? Why not, Professor Achorna? This said... Captain Nemo went to a cabinet standing near the lounge's left panel. Next to this cabinet, I saw a chest bound with hoops of iron, its lid bearing a copper plaque that displayed the Nautilus's monogram, with its motto, Mobilis in Mobili. Just then, ignoring my presence, the captain opened this cabinet, a sort of safe that contained a large number of ingots. They were gold ingots, and they represented an enormous sum of money. Where had this precious metal come from? How had the captain amassed this gold, and what was he about to do with it? I didn't pronounce a word. I gaped. 
Captain Nemo took out the ingots one by one and arranged them methodically inside the chest, filling it to the top, at which point I estimate that it held more than 1,000 kilograms of gold, in other words, close to 5 million pounds. After securely fastening the chest, Captain Nemo wrote an address on its lid in characters that must have been modern Greek. This done, the captain pressed a button whose wiring was in communication with the crew's quarters. Four men appeared and, not without difficulty, pushed the chest out of the lounge. Then I heard them hoisted up the iron companionway by means of pulleys. Just then, Captain Nemo turned to me. You were saying, Professor? He asked me. I wasn't saying a thing, Captain. Then, sir, with your permission, I'll bid you good evening. And with that, Captain Nemo left the lounge. I re-entered my stateroom, very puzzled, as you can imagine. I tried in vain to fall asleep. I kept searching for a relationship between the appearance of the diver and that chest filled with gold. Soon, from certain rolling and pitching movements, I sensed that the Nautilus had left the lower strata and was back on the surface of the water. Then I heard the sound of footsteps on the platform. I realized that the skiff was being detached and launched to sea. For an instant, it bumped the Nautilus aside, then all sounds ceased. Two hours later, the same noises, the same comings and goings were repeated. Hoisted on board, the longboat was readjusted into its socket, and the Nautilus plunged back beneath the waves. So those millions had been delivered to their address. At what spot on the continent? Who was the recipient of Captain Nemo's gold? The next day I related the night's events to Conseil and the Canadian, events that had aroused my curiosity to a fever pitch. My companions were as startled as I was. But where does he get those millions? Ned Land asked. To this no reply was possible. After breakfast I made my way to the lounge and went about my work. I wrote up my notes until five o'clock in the afternoon. Just then, was it due to some personal indisposition? I felt extremely hot and had to take off my jacket made of fan muscle fabric. A perplexing circumstance because we weren't in the low latitudes, and besides, once the Nautilus was submerged, it shouldn't be subject to any rise in temperature. I looked at the pressure gauge. It marked a depth of sixty feet, a depth beyond the reach of atmospheric heat. I kept on working, but the temperatures rose to the point of becoming unbearable. Could there be a fire on board, I wondered? I was about to leave the lounge when Captain Nemo entered. He approached the thermometer, consulted it, and turned to me. Forty-two degrees centigrade, he said. I've detected as much, Captain, I replied, and if it gets even slightly hotter, we won't be able to stand it. Oh, Professor, it won't get any hotter unless we want it to. You mean you can control this heat? No, but I can back away from the fireplace producing it. So it's outside? Surely. We're cruising in a current of boiling water. It can't be, I exclaimed. Look. The panels had opened, and I could see a completely white sea around the Nautilus. Steaming sulfurous fumes uncoiled in the midst of waves bubbling like water in a boiler. I leaned my hand against one of the windows, but the heat was so great I had to snatch it back. Where are we? I asked. Near the island of Santorini, Professor, the captain answered me, and right in the channel that separates the volcanic islets of Neocameni and Paleocameni. I wanted to offer you the unusual sight of an underwater eruption. I thought, I said, that the foundation of such new islands had come to an end. Nothing ever comes to an end in these volcanic waterways, Captain Nemo replied, and thanks to its underground fires, our globe is continuously under construction in these regions. According to the Latin historians Cassiodorus and Pliny, by the year 19 of the Christian era, a new island, the divine Thera, had already appeared in the very place these islets have more recently formed. Then Thera sank under the waves, only to rise and sink once more in the year 69 A.D. From that day to this, such plutonic construction work has been in abeyance. 
But on February 3, 1866, a new islet named George Island emerged in the midst of sulfurous steam near Nia Kamini and was fused to it on the 6th of the same month. Seven days later, on February 13, the island of Afroessa appeared, leaving a ten-meter channel between itself and Nia Kameni. It was in these seas when that phenomenon occurred, and I was able to observe its every phase. The islet of Afroessa was circular in shape, measuring three hundred feet in diameter and thirty feet in height. It was made of black glassy lava mixed with bits of feldspar. Finally, on March 10, a smaller islet called Rekka appeared next to Nia Kameni, and since then these three islets have fused to form one single selfsame island. What about this channel we're in right now? I asked. Here it is, Captain Nemo replied, showing me a chart of the Greek islands. You observe that I've entered the new islets in their place. But will this channel fill up one day? Very likely, Professor Achona, because since 1866, eight little lava islets have surged up in front of the port of St. Nicholas on Pelea Kameni. So it's obvious that Nia and Pelea will join in days to come. In the middle of the Pacific, tiny infusoria build continents, but here they're built by volcanic phenomena. Look, sir, look at the construction work going on under these waves. I returned to the window. The Nautilus was no longer moving. The heat had become unbearable. From the white it had recently been, the sea was turning red, a coloration caused by the presence of iron salts. Although the lounge was hermetically sealed, it was filling with an intolerable stink of sulfur, and I could see scarlet flames of such brightness they overpowered our electric light. I was swimming in perspiration. I was stifling. I was about to be cooked. Yes, I felt my cooking in actual fact. We can't stay any longer in this boiling water, I told the captain. No, it wouldn't be advisable, replied Nemo, the emotionless. He gave an order. The Nautilus tacked about and retreated from this furnace. It couldn't brave with impunity. A quarter of an hour later, we were breathing fresh air on the surface of the waves. It then occurred to me that if Ned had chosen these waterways for our escape attempt, we wouldn't have come out alive from this sea of fire. The next day, February 16, we left this basin, which tallies depths of 3,000 meters, between Rhodes and Alexandria, and passing well out from Cerigo Island after doubling Cape Matapan, the Nautilus left the Greek islands behind. Chapter 31. The Mediterranean in 48 Hours The Mediterranean, your ideal blue sea, to the Greeks simply the sea, to Hebrews the great sea, to Romans mare nostrum, bordered by orange trees, aloes, cactus, and maritime pine trees, perfumed with the scent of myrtle, framed by rugged mountains, saturated with clean, transparent air, but continuously under construction by fires in the earth. This sea is a genuine battlefield, where Neptune and Pluto still struggle for world domination. Here on these beaches and waters, says the French historian Michelet, a man is revived by one of the most invigorating climates in the world. But as beautiful as it was, I could get only a quick look at this basin whose surface area comprises two million square kilometers. Even Captain Nemo's personal insights were denied me, because that mystifying individual didn't appear one single time during our high-speed crossing. I estimate that the Nautilus covered a track of some six hundred leagues under the waves of this sea, and the voyage was accomplished in just twenty-four hours, times two. Departing from the waterways of Greece on the morning of February 16, we cleared the Strait of Gibraltar by sunrise on the 18th. It was obvious to me that this Mediterranean, pinned in the middle of those shores he wanted to avoid, gave Captain Nemo no pleasure. Its waves and breezes brought back too many memories, if not too many regrets. Here he no longer had the ease of movement and freedom of maneuver that the oceans allowed him and his Nautilus felt cramped so close to the coasts of both Africa and Europe. 
Accordingly, our speed was twenty-five miles, that is, twelve four-kilometer leagues, per hour. Needless to say, Ned Land had to give up his escape plans much to his distress. Swept along at the rate of twelve to thirteen meters per second, he could hardly make use of the skiff. Leaving the Nautilus under these conditions would have been like jumping off a train racing at this speed, a rash move if there ever was one. Moreover, to renew our air supply, the submersible rose to the surface of the waves only at night, and relying solely on compass and log, it steered by dead reckoning. Inside the Mediterranean, then, I could catch no more of its fast-passing scenery than a traveller might see from an express train. In other words, I could view only the distant horizons because the foregrounds flashed by like lightning. But Conseil and I were able to observe those Mediterranean fish whose powerful fins kept pace for a while in the Nautilus's waters. We stayed on watch before the lounge windows, and our notes enabled me to reconstruct, in a few words, the ichthyology of this sea. Among the various fish inhabiting it, some I viewed, others I glimpsed, and the rest I missed completely because of the Nautilus's speed. Kindly allow me to sort them out using this whimsical system of classification. It will at least convey the quickness of my observations. In the midst of the watery mass, brightly lit by our electric beams, they are snaked past those one-meter lampreys that are common to nearly every climb. A type of ray from the genus Oxyrhynchus, five feet wide, had a white belly with a spotted ash-gray back and was carried along by the currents like a huge wide-open shawl. Other rays passed by so quickly, I couldn't tell if they deserved that name Eagle Ray, coined by the ancient Greeks, or those designations of Rat Ray, Bat Ray, and Toad Ray that modern fishermen have inflicted on them. Dogfish, known as topes, twelve feet long and especially feared by divers, were racing with each other. Looking like big bluish shadows, thresher sharks went by, eight feet long and gifted with an extremely acute sense of smell. Dorados from the genus Sparus, some measuring up to thirteen decimeters, appeared in silver and azure costumes, encircled with ribbons, which contrasted with the dark color of their fins. Fish sacred to the goddess Venus, their eyes set in brows of gold, a valuable species that patronizes all waters, fresh or salt, equally at home in rivers, lakes, and oceans, living in every clime, Tolerating any temperature, their line dating back to prehistoric times on this earth, yet preserving all its beauty from those far-off days. Magnificent sturgeons, nine to ten meters long and extremely fast, banged their powerful tails against the glass of our panels, showing bluish backs with small brown spots. They resemble sharks, without equaling their strength, and are encountered in every sea. In the spring, they delight in swimming up the great rivers, fighting the currents of the Volga, Danube, Po, Rhine, Loire, and Oder, while feeding on herring, mackerel, salmon, and codfish. Although they belong to the class of cartilaginous fish, they rate as a delicacy. They're eaten fresh, dried, marinated, or salt-preserved, and in old times they were borne in triumph to the table of the Roman epicure Lucullus. But whenever the Nautilus drew near the surface, those denizens of the Mediterranean I could observe most productively belonged to the 63rd genus of bony fish. These were tuna from the genus Scomber, blue-black on top, silver on the belly armor, their dorsal stripes giving off a golden gleam. They are said to follow ships in search of refreshing shade from the hot tropical sun. And they did just that with the Nautilus, as they had once done with the vessels of Count de la Perrouse. For long hours they competed in speed with our submersible. I couldn't stop marveling at these animals so perfectly cut out for racing, their heads small, their bodies sleek, spindle-shaped, and in some cases over three meters long, their pectoral fins gifted with remarkable strength, their caudal fins forked. Like certain flocks of birds, whose speed they equal, these tuna swim in triangle formation, which prompted the ancients to say they'd boned up on geometry and military strategy. And yet they can't escape the Provencal fishermen, who prized them as highly as did the ancient inhabitants of Turkey and Italy. 
and these valuable animals, as oblivious as if they were deaf and blind, leap right into the Marseille tuna nets and perish by the thousands. Just for the record, I'll mention those Mediterranean fish that Conseil and I barely glimpsed. There were whitish eels of the species Gymnotus fasciatus that passed like elusive wisps of steam, conger eels three to four meters long, that were tricked out in green, blue, and yellow, three-foot hake with a liver that makes a dainty morsel, worm fish drifting like thin seaweed, sea robins that poets call lyrefish, and seamen pipers, and whose snouts have two jagged triangular plates shaped like old Homer's lyre. Swallowfish swimming as fast as a bird they're named after. Red-headed groupers whose dorsal fins are trimmed with filaments, some shad spotted with black, grey, brown, blue, yellow, and green that actually respond to tinkling handbells. Splendid diamond-shaped turbot that were like aquatic pheasants with yellowish fins stippled in brown and the left top side mostly marbled in brown and yellow. Finally, schools of wonderful red mullet, real oceanic birds of paradise that ancient Romans bought for as much as ten thousand sesterces apiece, and which they killed at the table so they could heartlessly watch it change color from cinnabar red when alive to pallid white when dead. And as for other fish common to the Atlantic and Mediterranean, I was unable to observe mirelets, triggerfish, puffers, seahorses, jewelfish, trumpetfish, blennies, grey mullet, wrasse, smelt, flying fish, anchovies, sea bream, porgies, garfish, or any of the chief representatives of the order Pleurorecta, such as sole, flounder, place, dab, and brill, simply because of the dizzying speed with which the Nautilus hustled through these opulent waters. As for marine mammals, on passing by the mouth of the Adriatic Sea, I thought I recognized two or three sperm whales equipped with a single dorsal fin, denoting the genus Physeter. Some pilot whales from the genus Globicephalus exclusive to the Mediterranean, the forepart of the head striped with small distinct lines, and also a dozen seals with white bellies and black coats, known by the name monk seals, and just as solemn as if they were three-meter Dominicans. For his part, Conseil thought he spotted a turtle six feet wide and adorned with three protruding ridges that ran lengthwise. I was sorry to miss this reptile, because from Conseil's description, I believe, I recognized the leatherback turtle, a pretty rare species. For my part, I noted only some loggerhead turtles with long carapaces. As for zoophytes, for a few moments I was able to marvel at a wonderful orange-hued hydra from the genus Gariolaria that clung to the glass of our port panel. It consisted of a long, lean filament that spread out into countless branches and ended in the most delicate lace ever spun by the followers of Arachne. Unfortunately, I couldn't fish up this wonderful specimen, and surely no other Mediterranean zoophytes would have been offered to my gaze if, on the evening of the 16th, the Nautilus hadn't slowed down in an odd fashion. This was the situation. By then we were passing between Sicily and the coast of Tunisia, in the cramped space between Cape Bon and the Strait of Messina. The sea bottom rises almost all at once. It forms an actual ridge, with only seventeen meters of water remaining above it, while the depth on either side is 170 meters. Consequently, the Nautilus had to maneuver with caution so as not to bump into this underwater barrier. I showed Conseil the position of this long reef on our chart of the Mediterranean. But with all due respect to Master, Conseil ventured to observe, it's like an actual isthmus connecting Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy, I replied. It cuts across the whole strait of Sicily and Smith's soundings prove that in the past these two continents were genuinely connected between Cape Boyo and Cape Farina. I can easily believe it, Conseil said. And I might add, I went on, that there's a similar barrier between Gibraltar and Ceuta, and in prehistoric times it closed off the Mediterranean completely. Gracious, Conseil put in. Suppose one day some volcanic upheaval raises these two barriers back above the waves. That's most unlikely, Conseil. If Master will allow me to finish, I mean that if this phenomenon occurs, it might prove distressing to Mr. de Lesseps, who has gone to such pains to cut through his isthmus. 
Agreed, but I repeat, Conseil, such a phenomenon won't occur. The intensity of these underground forces continues to diminish. Volcanoes were quite numerous in the world's early days, but they're going extinct one by one. The heat inside the Earth is growing weaker. The temperature in the globe's lower strata is cooling appreciably every century. And to our globe's detriment, because its heat is its life. But the sun, the sun isn't enough, Conseil. Can it restore heat to a corpse? Not that I've heard. Well, my friend, some day the Earth will be just such a cold corpse. Like the moon, which long ago lost its vital heat, our globe will become lifeless and unlivable. In how many centuries? Conseil asked. In hundreds of thousands of years, my boy. Then we have ample time to finish our voyage, Conseil replied, if Ned Land doesn't mess things up. Thus reassured, Conseil went back to studying the shallows that the Nautilus was skimming at moderate speed. On the rocky volcanic seafloor there bloomed quite a collection of moving flora, sponges, sea cucumbers, jellyfish called sea gooseberries, that were adorned with reddish tendrils and gave off a subtle phosphorescence, members of the genus Burro, that are commonly known by the name melon jellyfish, and are bathed in the shimmer of the whole solar spectrum, free-swimming crinoids, one meter wide that reddened the waters with their crimson hue. Tree-like basket stars of the greatest beauty, sea fans from the genus Pavonacea, with long stems. Numerous edible sea urchins of various species, plus green sea anemones, with a grayish trunk and a brown disc lost beneath the olive-colored tresses of their tentacles. Conseil kept especially busy observing mollusks and articulates, and although his catalog is a little dry, I wouldn't want to wrong the gallant lad by leaving out his personal observations. From the branch mollusca, he mentions numerous comb-shaped scallops, hoof-like spiny oysters piled on top of each other, triangular coquina, three-pronged glass snails with yellow fins and transparent shells, orange snails from the genus Pleurobranchus that look like eggs spotted or speckled with greenish dots, members of the genus Aplesia, also known by the name sea hares, other sea hares from the genus Dolabella, plump paper bubble shells, umbrella shells exclusive to the Mediterranean, abalone whose shell produces a mother of pearl much in demand, pilgrim scallops, saddle shells that diners in the French province of Languedoc are said to like better than oysters, some of those cockle shells so dear to the citizens of Marseille, fat white Venus shells that are among the clams so abundant off the coasts of North America and eaten in such quantities by New Yorkers, variously colored comb shells with gill covers, burrowing date mussels with a peppery flavor I relish, furrowed heart cockles whose shells have rib-like ridges on their arching summits, triton shells pocked with scarlet bumps, carnieria snails with Backward curving tips that make them resemble flimsy gondolas, crowned ferula snails, Atlantis snails with spiral shells, grey nudibranches branches from the genus Tethys, that were spotted with white and covered by fringed mantles, nudibranches branches from the suborder Aeolidia that look like small slugs, sea butterflies crawling on their backs, seashells from the genus Auricula, including the oval shaped Auricula myosotis. Tan wintle trap snails, common periwinkles, violet snails, cineraria snails, rock borers, ear shells, cabinchon snails, Pandora shells, etc. As for the articulates, in his notes, Conseil has very appropriately divided them into six classes, three of which belong to the marine world. These classes are the Crustacea, Cirripedia, and Annelida. Crustaceans are subdivided into nine orders and the first of these consist of the decapods, in other words, animals whose head and thorax are usually fused, whose cheek and mouth mechanism is made up of several pairs of appendages, and whose thorax has four, five, or six pairs of walking legs. Conseil used the methods of our mentor, Professor Milna Edwards, who puts the decapods in three divisions, Brachiura, Macrura, and Animura. These names may look a tad fierce, but they are accurate and appropriate. 
Among the Brachyura, Conseil mentioned some Amanthia crabs whose fronts were armed with two big diverging tips. Those innocuous scorpions that, Lord knows why, symbolized wisdom to the ancient Greeks. Spider crabs of the Messina and Spinamane varieties that had probably gone astray in these shallows because they usually live in the lower depths. Xanthid crabs, Palumna crabs, rhomboid crabs, granular box crabs, easy on the digestion, as Conseil ventured to observe. Toothless masked crabs, Abelia crabs, Semipolia crabs, woolly handed crabs, etc. Among the Macrura, which are subdivided into five families, hard shells, burrowers, crayfish, prawns, and ghost crabs, Conseil mentioned some common spiny lobsters whose females supply a meat highly prized, slipper lobsters or common shrimp, waterside jebia shrimp, and all sorts of edible species, but he says nothing of the crayfish subdivision that includes the true lobster, because spiny lobsters are the only type in the Mediterranean. Finally, among the Anamura, he saw common Drusina crabs dwelling inside whatever abandoned seashells they could take over, Homola crabs with spiny fronts, hermit crabs, hairy porcelain crabs, etc. There, Conseil's work came to a halt. He didn't have time to finish off the class Crustacea through an examination of its stomatopods, amphipods, homopods, isopods, trilobites, branchiopods, ostracods, and intermostrations. And in order to complete his study of marine articulates, he needed to mention the class Cirripedia, which contains water fleas and carp lice, plus the class Annelida, which he would have divided without fail into tubifex worms and dorsibranchian worms. But having gone past the shallows of the Strait of Sicily, the Nautilus resumed its usual deep water speed. From then on, no more mollusks, no more zoophytes, no more articulates just a few large fish sweeping by like shadows. During the night of February 16 to 17, we entered the second Mediterranean basin, whose maximum depth we found at 3,000 meters. The Nautilus, driven downward by its propeller and slanting fins, descended to the lowest strata of this sea. There, in place of natural wonders, the watery mass offered some thrilling and dreadful scenes to my eyes. In essence, we were then crossing that part of the whole Mediterranean so fertile in casualties. From the coast of Algiers to the beaches of Provence, how many ships have wrecked, how many vessels have vanished? Compared to the vast liquid plains of the Pacific, the Mediterranean is a mere lake. But it's an unpredictable lake with fickle waves, today kindly and affectionate to those frail single masters drifting between a double ultramarine of sky and water. Tomorrow, bad-tempered and turbulent, agitated by the winds, demolishing the strongest ships beneath sudden waves that smash down with a headlong wallop. So, in our swift cruise through these deep strata, how many vessels I saw lying on the seafloor, some already caked with coral, others clad only in a layer of rust. Plus anchors, cannons, shells, iron fittings, propeller blades, parts of engines, Cracked cylinders, staved-in boilers, then hulls floating in mid-water, here upright, there overturned. Some of these wrecked ships had perished in collisions, others from hitting granite reefs. I saw a few that had sunk straight down, their masting still upright, their rigging stiffened by the water. They looked like they were at anchor by some immense open offshore mooring, where they were waiting for their departure time. When the Nautilus passed between them, covering them with sheets of electricity, they seemed ready to salute us with their colors and send us their serial numbers. But no, nothing but silence and death filled this field of catastrophes. I observed that these Mediterranean depths became more and more cluttered with such gruesome wreckage as the Nautilus drew nearer to the Strait of Gibraltar. By then the shores of Africa and Europe were converging, and in this narrow space collisions were commonplace. There I saw numerous iron undersides, the phantasmagoric ruins of steamers, some lying down, others rearing up like fearsome animals. One of these boats made a dreadful first impression. Sides torn open, funnel bent, paddle wheels stripped to the mountings, 
rudder separated from the stern post and still hanging from an iron chain, the board on its stern eaten away by marine salts. How many lives were dashed in this shipwreck? How many victims were swept under the waves? Had some sailor on board lived to tell the story of this dreadful disaster? Or do the waves still keep this casualty a secret? It occurred to me, Lord knows why, that this boat buried under the sea might have been the Atlas, lost with all hands some twenty years ago, and never heard from again. Oh, what a gruesome tale these Mediterranean depths could tell, this huge boneyard where so much wealth has been lost, where so many victims have met their deaths. Meanwhile, briskly unconcerned, the Nautilus ran at full propeller through the midst of these ruins. On February 18, near three o'clock in the morning, it hove before the entrance to the Strait of Gibraltar. There are two currents here, an upper current, long known to exist, that carries the ocean's waters into the Mediterranean basin. Then a lower countercurrent, the only present-day proof of its existence being logic. In essence, the Mediterranean receives a continual influx of water, not only from the Atlantic, but from rivers emptying into it. Since local evaporation isn't enough to restore the balance, the total amount of added water should make this sea's level higher every year. Yet this isn't the case, and we're naturally forced to believe in the existence of some lower current that carries the Mediterranean surplus through the Strait of Gibraltar and into the Atlantic Basin. And so it turned out. The Nautilus took full advantage of this countercurrent. It advanced swiftly through this narrow passageway. For an instant I could glimpse the wonderful ruins of the Temple of Hercules, buried under sea as Pliny and Avianus have mentioned, together with the flat island they stand on. And a few minutes later, we were floating on the waves of the Atlantic. Chapter 32 The Bay of Vigo The Atlantic, a vast expanse of water whose surface area is 25 million square miles with a length of 9,000 miles and an average width of 2,700. A major sea nearly unknown to the ancients, except perhaps the Carthaginians, those Dutchmen of antiquity who went along the west coasts of Europe and Africa on their commercial junkets. An ocean whose parallel winding shores form an immense perimeter fed by the world's greatest rivers, the St. Lawrence, Mississippi, Amazon, Plata, Orinoco, Niger, Senegal, Elbe, Luhuar, and Rhine, which bring its waters from the most civilized countries, as well as the most undeveloped areas. A magnificent plain of waves ploughed continuously by ships of every nation, shaded by every flag in the world, and ending in those two dreadful headlands so feared by navigators. Cape Horn and the Cape of Tempests. The Nautilus broke these waters with the edge of its spur after doing nearly ten thousand leagues in three and a half months, a track longer than a great circle of the earth. Where were we heading now, and what did the future have in store for us? Emerging from the Strait of Gibraltar, the Nautilus took to the high seas. It returned to the surface of the waves, so our daily strolls on the platform were restored to us. I climbed onto it instantly, Ned Land and Conseil along with me. Twelve miles away, Cape St. Vincent was hazily visible, the southwestern tip of the Hispanic Peninsula. The wind was blowing a pretty strong gust from the south. The sea was swelling and surging. Its waves made the Nautilus roll and jerk violently. It was nearly impossible to stand up on the platform, which was continuously buffeted by this enormously heavy sea. After inhaling a few breaths of air, we went below once more. I repaired to my stateroom. Conseil returned to his cabin. But the Canadian, looking rather worried, followed me. Our quick trip through the Mediterranean hadn't allowed him to put his plans into execution, and he could barely conceal his disappointment. After the door to my stateroom was closed, he sat and stared at me silently. Ned, my friend, I told him, I know how you feel, but you mustn't blame yourself. 
Given the way the Nautilus was navigating, it would have been sheer insanity to think of escaping. Ned Land didn't reply. His pursed lips and frowning brow indicated that he was in the grip of his monomania. Look here, I went on. As yet there's no cause for despair. We're going up the coast of Portugal. France and England aren't far off, and there we'll easily find refuge. Oh, I grant you, if the Nautilus had emerged from the Strait of Gibraltar and made for that cape in the south, if it were taking us toward those regions that have no continents, then I'd share your alarm. But we now know that Captain Nemo doesn't avoid the seas of civilization, and in a few days I think we can safely take action. Ned Land stared at me still more intently and finally unpursed his lips. We'll do it this evening, he said. I straightened suddenly. I admit that I was less than ready for this announcement. I wanted to reply to the Canadian, but words failed me. We agreed to wait for the right circumstances. Ned Land went on. Now we've got those circumstances. This evening, we'll be just a few miles off the coast of Spain. It'll be cloudy tonight, the wind's blowing toward shore. You gave me your promise, Professor Ahona, and I'm counting on you. Since I didn't say anything, the Canadian stood up and approached me. We'll do it this evening at nine o'clock, he said. I've alerted Conseil. By that time, Captain Nemo will be locked in his room and probably in bed. Neither the mechanics or the crewmen will be able to see us. Conseil and I will go to the central companionway. As for you, Professor Achona, you'll stay in the library two steps away and wait for my signal. The oars, mast, and sail are in the skiff. I've even managed to stow some provisions inside. I've gotten hold of a monkey wrench to unscrew the nuts, bolting the skiff to the Nautilus's hull. So everything's ready. I'll see you this evening. The sea is rough, I said. Admitted, the Canadian replied. But we've got to risk it. Freedom is worth paying for. Besides, the longboat's solidly built, and a few miles with the wind behind us is no big deal. By tomorrow, who knows if this ship won't be a hundred leagues out to sea. If circumstances are in our favor, between ten and eleven this evening we'll be landing on some piece of solid ground, or we'll be dead. So we're in God's hands, and I'll see you this evening. This said, the Canadian withdrew, leaving me close to dumbfounded. I had imagined that if it came to this I would have time to think about it, to talk it over. My stubborn companion hadn't granted me this courtesy. But after all, what would I have said to him? Ned Land was right a hundred times over. These were near ideal circumstances, and he was taking full advantage of them. In my selfish personal interests, could I go back on my word and be responsible for ruining the future lives of my companions? Tomorrow, might not Captain Nemo take us far away from any shore? Just then a fairly loud hissing told me that the ballast tanks were filling, and the Nautilus sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic. I stayed in my stateroom. I wanted to avoid the captain to hide from his eyes the agitation overwhelming me. What an agonizing day I spent, torn between my desire to regain my free will and my regret at abandoning this marvelous Nautilus, leaving my underwater research incomplete. How could I relinquish this ocean, my own Atlantic, as I like to call it, without observing its lower strata, without wresting from it the kinds of secrets that had been revealed to me by the seas of the East Indies and the Pacific? I was putting down my novel half-read. I was waking up as my dream neared its climax. How painfully these hours passed, as I sometimes envisioned myself safe on shore with my companions, or despite my better judgment, as I sometimes wished that some unforeseen circumstances would prevent Ned Land from carrying out his plans. Twice I went to the lounge, 
I wanted to consult the compass. I wanted to see if the Nautilus's heading was actually taking us closer to the coast or spiriting us farther away. But no. The Nautilus was still in Portuguese waters, heading north. It was cruising along the ocean's beaches. So I had to resign myself to my fate and get ready to escape. My baggage wasn't heavy, my notes, nothing more. As for Captain Nemo, I wondered what he would make of our escaping, what concern or perhaps what distress it might cause him, and what he would do in the twofold event of our attempt either failing or being found out. Certainly I had no complaints to register with him, on the contrary. Never was hospitality more wholehearted than his. Yet in leaving him I couldn't be accused of ingratitude. No solemn promises bound us to him. In order to keep us captive, he had counted only on the force of circumstances, and not on our word of honor. But his avowed intention to imprison us forever on his ship justified our every effort. I hadn't seen the captain since our visit to the island of Santorini. Would fate bring me into his presence before our departure? I both desired and dreaded it. I listened for footsteps in the stateroom adjoining mine. Not a sound reached my ear. His stateroom had to be deserted. Then I began to wonder if this electric individual was even on board. Since that night when the skiff had left the Nautilus on some mysterious mission, my ideas about him had suddenly changed. In spite of everything, I thought that Captain Nemo must have kept up some type of relationship with the shore. Did he himself never leave the Nautilus? Whole weeks had often gone by without my encountering him. What was he doing all the while? During all those times, I thought he was convalescing in the grip of some misanthropic fit. Was he instead far away from the ship, involved in some secret activity whose nature still eluded me? All these ideas and a thousand others assaulted me at the same time. In these strange circumstances, the scope for conjecture was unlimited. I felt an unbearable queasiness. This day of waiting seemed endless. The hours struck too slowly to keep up with my impatience. As usual, dinner was served me in my stateroom. Full of anxiety, I ate little. I left the table at seven o'clock, one hundred and twenty minutes. I was keeping track of them. Still separated me from the moment I was to rejoin Ned Land. My agitation increased. My pulse was throbbing violently. I couldn't stand still. I walked up and down, hoping to calm my troubled mind with movement. The possibility of perishing in our reckless undertaking was the least of my worries. My heart was pounding at the thought that our plans might be discovered before we had left the Nautilus, at the thought of being hauled in front of Captain Nemo and finding him angered, or worse, saddened by my deserting him. I wanted to see the lounge one last time. I went down the gangways and arrived at the museum where I had spent so many pleasant and productive hours. I stared at all its wealth, all its treasures, like a man on the eve of his eternal exile, a man departing to return no more. For so many days now these natural wonders and artistic masterworks had been central to my life, and I was about to leave them behind forever. I wanted to plunge my eyes through the lounge window and into these Atlantic waters, but the panels were hermetically sealed, and a mantle of sheet iron separated me from this ocean with which I was still unfamiliar. Crossing through the lounge, I arrived at the door, contrived in one of the canted corners, that opened into the captain's stateroom. Much to my astonishment, this door was ajar. I instinctively recoiled. If Captain Nemo was in his stateroom, he might see me. But... Not hearing any sounds, I approached. The stateroom was deserted. I pushed the door open. I took a few steps inside. Still the same austere, monastic appearance. Just then my eye was caught by some etchings hanging on the wall, which I hadn't noticed during my first visit. They were portraits of great men of history who had spent their lives in perpetual devotion to a great human ideal. Thaddeus Kosciusko, the hero whose dying words had been Finis Polinie, Marcos Batsaris, for modern Greece the reincarnation of Sparta's King Leonidas, Daniel O'Connell, 
Ireland's defender, George Washington, founder of the American Union. Daniele Manin, the Italian patriot, Abraham Lincoln, dead from the bullet of a believer in slavery. And finally, that martyr for the redemption of the black race, John Brown, hanging from his gallows as Victor Hugo's pencil has so terrifyingly depicted. What was the bond between these heroic souls and the soul of Captain Nemo? From this collection of portraits, could I finally unravel the mystery of his existence? Was he a fighter for oppressed peoples, a liberator of enslaved races? Had he figured in the recent political or social upheavals of this century? Was he a hero of that dreadful civil war in America, a war lamentable yet forever glorious? Suddenly, the clock struck eight. The first stroke of its hammer on the chime snapped me out of my musings. I shuddered as if some invisible eye had plunged into my innermost thoughts, and I rushed outside the stateroom. There my eyes fell upon the compass. Our heading was still northerly. The log indicated a moderate speed, the pressure gauge a depth of about sixty feet. So circumstances were in favor of the Canadian's plans. I stayed in my stateroom. I dressed warmly. Fishing boots, otter cap, coat of fan muscle fabric lined with sealskin. I was ready. I was waiting. Only the propeller's vibrations disturbed the deep silence reigning on board. I cocked an ear and listened. Would a sudden outburst of voices tell me that Ned Land's escape plans had just been detected? A ghastly uneasiness stole through me. I tried in vain to recover my composure. A few minutes before nine o'clock I glued my ear to the captain's door. Not a sound. I left my stateroom and returned to the lounge, which was deserted and plunged in near darkness. I opened the door leading to the library. The same inadequate light, the same solitude. I went to man my post near the door opening into the well of the central companionway. I waited for Ned Land's signal. At this point, the propeller's vibration slowed down appreciably. Then they died out altogether. Why was the Nautilus stopping? Whether this layover would help or hinder Ned Land's schemes, I couldn't have said. The silence was further disturbed only by the pounding of my heart. Suddenly I felt a mild jolt. I realized the Nautilus had come to rest on the ocean floor. My alarm increased. The Canadian signal hadn't reached me. I longed to rejoin Ned Land and urge him to postpone his attempt. I sensed that we were no longer navigating under normal conditions. Just then the door to the main lounge opened and Captain Nemo appeared. He saw me and without further preamble, Ah, Professor, he said in an affable tone, I've been looking for you. Do you know your Spanish history? Even if he knew it by heart, a man in my disturbed, befuddled condition couldn't have quoted a syllable of his own country's history. Well? Captain Nemo went on. Did you hear my question? Do you know the history of Spain? Very little of it, I replied. The most learned men, the captain said, still have much to learn. Have a seat, he added, and I'll tell you about an unusual episode in this body of history. The captain stretched out on a couch, and I mechanically took a seat near him but half in the shadows. Professor, he said, listen carefully. This piece of history concerns you in one definite respect, because it will answer a question you've no doubt been unable to resolve. I'm listening, Captain, I said, not knowing what my partner in this dialogue was driving at, and wondering if this incident related to our escape plans. Professor, Captain Nemo went on. If you're amenable, we'll go back in time to 1702. You're aware of the fact that in those days your King Louis the Fourteenth thought an imperial gesture would suffice to humble the Pyrenees in the dust. So he inflicted his grandson, the Duke of Anjou, on the Spaniards. Reigning more or less poorly under the name King Philip V, this aristocrat had to deal with mighty opponents aboard. 
In essence, the year before, the royal houses of Holland, Austria, and England had signed a treaty of alliance at The Hague, aiming to wrest the Spanish crown from King Philip V, and to place it on the head of an archduke, whom they prematurely dubbed King Charles III. Spain had to withstand these allies. But the country had practically no army or navy, yet it wasn't short of money, provided that its galleons, laden with gold and silver from America, could enter its ports. Now then, late in 1702, Spain was expecting a rich convoy, which France ventured to escort with a fleet of 23 vessels under the command of Admiral de Chateau Renault because by that time the Allied navies were roving the Atlantic. This convoy was supposed to put into Cadiz, but after learning that the English fleet lay across those waterways, the Admiral decided to make for a French port. The Spanish commanders in the convoy objected to this decision. They wanted to be taken to a Spanish port, if not to Cadiz, then to the Bay of Vigo located on Spain's northwest coast, and not blockaded. Admiral de Chateau Renal was so indecisive as to obey this directive, and the galleons entered the Bay of Vigo. Unfortunately, this bay forms an open offshore mooring that's impossible to defend, so it was essential to hurry and empty the galleons before the Allied fleets arrived, and there would have been ample time for this unloading, if a wretched question of trade agreements hadn't suddenly come up. Are you clear on the chain of events? Captain Nemo asked me. Perfectly clear, I said, not yet knowing why I was being given this history lesson. Then I'll continue. Here's what came to pass. The tradesmen of Cadiz had negotiated a charter whereby they were to receive all merchandise coming from the West Indies. Now then, unloading the ingots from those galleons at the port of Vigo would have been a violation of their rights. So they lodged a complaint in Madrid, and they obtained an order from the indecisive King Philip V. Without unloading, the convoy would stay in custody at the offshore mooring of Vigo until the enemy fleets had retreated. Now then, just as this decision was being handed down, English vessels arrived in the Bay of Vigo on October 22, 1702. Despite his inferior forces, Admiral de Chateau Renal fought courageously, but when he saw that the convoy's wealth was about to fall into enemy hands, he burned and scuttled the galleons, which went to the bottom with their immense treasures. Captain Nemo stopped. I admit it, I still couldn't see how this piece of history concerned me. Well, I asked him. Well, Professor Achona, Captain Nemo answered me. We're actually in that Bay of Vigo, and all that's left is for you to probe the mysteries of the place. The captain stood up and invited me to follow him. I had time to collect myself. I did so. The lounge was dark, but the sea's waves sparkled through the transparent windows. I stared. Around the Nautilus for half a mile radius, the water seemed saturated with electric light. The sandy bottom was clear and bright. Dressed in diving suits, crewmen were busy cleaning away half-rotted barrels and disemboweled trunks in the midst of the dingy hulks of ships. Out of these trunks and kegs spilled ingots of gold and silver, cascades of jewels, pieces of eight. The sand was heaped with them. Then, laden with these valuable spoils, the men returned to the Nautilus, dropped off their burdens inside, and went to resume this inexhaustible fishing for silver and gold. I understood. This was the setting of that battle on October 22nd, 1702. Here, in this very place, those galleons carrying treasure to the Spanish government had gone to the bottom. Here, whenever he needed, Captain Nemo came to withdraw these millions to ballast his Nautilus. It was for him, for him alone, that America had yielded up its precious metals. He was the direct sole heir to these treasures, 
wrested from the Incas and those peoples conquered by Hernando Cortes. Did you know, Professor, he asked me with a smile, that the sea contains such wealth? I know it's estimated, I replied, that there are two million metric tons of silver held in suspension in seawater. Surely, but in extracting that silver, your expenses would outweigh your profits. Here, by contrast, I have only to pick up what other men have lost, and not only in this Bay of Vigo, but at a thousand other sites where ships have gone down, whose positions are marked on my underwater chart. Do you understand now that I'm rich to the tune of billions? I understand, Captain. Nevertheless, allow me to inform you that by harvesting this very Bay of Vigo, you're simply forestalling the efforts of a rival organization. What organization? A company chartered by the Spanish government to search for these sunken galleons. The company's investors were lured by the bait of enormous gains, because this scuttled treasure is estimated to be worth five hundred million pounds. It was five hundred million francs, Captain Nemo replied. But no more. Right, I said. Hence, a timely warning to those investors would be an act of charity. Yet who knows if it would be well received? Usually what gamblers regret the most isn't the loss of their money, so much as the loss of their insane hopes. But ultimately I feel less sorry for them than for the thousands of unfortunate people who would have benefited from a fair distribution of this wealth, whereas now it will be of no help to them. No sooner had I voiced this regret than I felt it must have wounded Captain Nemo. No help, he replied with a growing animation. Sir, what makes you assume this wealth goes to waste when I'm the one amassing it? Do you think I toil to gather this treasure out of selfishness? Who says I don't put it to good use? Do you think I'm unaware of the suffering beings and oppressed races living on this earth, poor people to comfort, victims to avenge? Don't you understand? Captain Nemo stopped on these last words, perhaps sorry that he had said too much. But I had guessed. Whatever motives had driven him to seek independence under the seas, he remained a human being before all else. His heart still throbbed for suffering humanity, and his immense philanthropy went out both to downtrodden races and to individuals. And now I know where Captain Nemo had delivered those millions, when the Nautilus navigated the waters where Crete was in rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. Chapter 33 Sperm Whales and Baleen Whales During the night of March 13 through 14, the Nautilus resumed its southward heading. Once it was abreast of Cape Horn, I thought it would strike west of the Cape, make for Pacific seas, and complete its tour of the world. It did nothing of the sort, and kept moving toward the southernmost regions. So where was it bound? The Pole? That was insanity. I was beginning to think that the captain's recklessness more than justified Ned Land's worst fears. For a good while, the Canadian had said nothing more to me about his escape plans. He had become less sociable, almost sullen. I could see how heavily this protracted imprisonment was weighing on him. I could feel the anger building in him. Whenever he encountered the captain, his eyes would flicker with dark fire and I was in constant dread that his natural vehemence would cause him to do something rash. That day, March 14, he and Conseil managed to find me in my stateroom. I asked them the purpose of their visit. To put a simple question to you, sir. The Canadian answered me. Go on, Ned. How many men do you think are on board the Nautilus? I am unable to say, my friend. It seems to me, Ned Land went on, that it wouldn't take much of a crew to run a ship like this one. Correct, I replied. Under existing conditions, some ten men at most should be enough to operate it. All right, the Canadian said. Then why should there be any more than that? Why, I answered. 
I stared at Ned Land, whose motives were easy to guess. Because, I said, if I can trust my hunches, if I truly understand the captain's way of life, his Nautilus isn't simply a ship. It's meant to be a refuge for people like its commander, people who have severed all ties with the shore. Perhaps, Conseil said, but in a nutshell, the Nautilus can hold only a certain number of men, so couldn't master estimate their maximum? How, Conseil? By calculating it. Master is familiar with the ship's capacity, hence the amount of air it contains. On the other hand, Master knows how much the air each man consumes in the act of breathing, and he can compare his data with the fact that the Nautilus must rise to the surface every twenty-four hours. Conseil didn't finish his sentence, but I could easily see what he was driving at. I follow you, I said. But while they're simple to do, such calculations can give only a very uncertain figure. No problem, the Canadian went on insistently. Then here's how to calculate it, I replied. In one hour, each man consumes the oxygen contained in 100 liters of air. Hence, during 24 hours, the oxygen contained in 2400 liters. Therefore, we must look for the multiple of 2400 liters of air that gives us the amount found in the Nautilus. Precisely, Conseil said. Now then, I went on, the Nautilus's capacity is 1,500 metric tons, and that a ton of air is a 1,000 liters, so the Nautilus holds 1,500,000 liters of air, which, divided by 2,400, I did a quick pencil calculation, gives us the quotient of 625 which is tantamount to saying that the air contained in the Nautilus would be exactly enough for 625 men over 24 hours. 625, Ned repeated. But rest assured, I added, that between passengers, seamen, or officers, we don't total one-tenth of that figure. Which is still too many for three men, Conseil muttered. So, my poor Ned, I can only counsel patience. And? Conseil replied, even more than patience, resignation. Conseil had said the true word. Even so, he went on, Captain Nemo can't go south forever. He'll surely have to stop, if only at the ice bank, and he'll return to the seas of civilization. Then it will be time to resume Ned Land's plans. The Canadian shook his head, passed his hand over his brow, made no reply, and left us. With master's permission, I'll make an observation to him, Conseil then told me. Our poor Ned broods about all the things he can't have. He's haunted by his former life. He seems to miss everything that's denied us. He's obsessed by his old memories, and it's breaking his heart. We must understand him. What does he have to occupy him here? Nothing. He isn't a scientist like Master, and he doesn't share our enthusiasm for the sea's wonders. He would risk anything just to enter a tavern in his own country. To be sure, the monotony of life on board must have seemed unbearable to the Canadian, who was accustomed to freedom and activity. It was a rare event that could excite him. That day, however, a development occurred that reminded him of his happy years as a harpooner. Near eleven o'clock in the morning, while on the surface of the ocean, the Nautilus fell in with a herd of baleen whales. This encounter didn't surprise me, because I knew these animals were being hunted so relentlessly that they took refuge in the ocean basins of the high latitudes. In the maritime world, and in the realm of geographic exploration, whales have played a major role. This is the animal that first dragged the Basques in its wake then Asturian Spaniards, Englishmen and Dutchmen, emboldening them against the ocean's perils and leading them to the ends of the earth. Baleen whales like to frequent the southernmost and northernmost seas. Old legends even claim that these cetaceans led fishermen to within a mere seven leagues of the North Pole. Although this feat is fictitious, it will some day come true, because it's likely that by hunting whales in the Arctic or Antarctic regions, Man will finally reach this unknown spot on the globe. We were seated on the platform next to a tranquil sea. The month of March, since it's the equivalent of October in these latitudes, 
was giving us some fine autumn days. It was the Canadian on this topic, he was never mistaken, who sighted a baleen whale on the eastern horizon. If you looked carefully, you could see its blackish back alternately rise and fall above the waves five miles from the Nautilus. Wow! Ned Land exclaimed. If I were on board a whaler, there's an encounter that would be great fun. That's one big animal. Look how high its blowholes are spouting all that air and steam. Damnation! Why am I chained to this hunk of sheet iron? Why, Ned, I replied, you still aren't over your old fishing urges. How could a whale fisherman forget his old trade, sir? Who could ever get tired of such exciting hunting? You've never fished these seas, Ned? Never, sir. Just the northernmost seas, equally in the Bering Strait and the Davis Strait. So the southern right whale is still unknown to you. Until now it's the bowhead whale you've hunted. And it won't risk going past the warm waters of the equator. Oh, Professor, what are you feeding me? The Canadian answered in a tolerably sceptical tone. I'm feeding you the facts. By thunder! In sixty-five, just two and a half years ago, I to whom you speak, I myself stepped onto the carcass of a whale near Greenland, and its flank still carried the marked harpoon of a whaling ship from the Bering Sea. Now I ask you, after it had been wounded west of America, how could this animal be killed in the east, unless it had cleared the equator and doubled Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope? I agree with our friend Ned, Conseil said and I'm waiting to hear how Master will reply to him. Master will reply, my friends, that baleen whales are localized according to species within certain seas that they never leave. And if one of these animals went from the Bering Strait to the Davis Strait, it's quite simply because there's some passageway from the one sea to the other, either along the coasts of Canada or Siberia. You expect us to fall for that? The Canadian asked, tipping me a wink. If master says so, Conseil replied. Which means, the Canadian went on, since I've never fished these waterways, I don't know the whales that frequent them. That's what I've been telling you, Ned. All the more reason to get to know them, Conseil answered. Look, look, the Canadian exclaimed, his voice full of excitement. It's approaching. It's coming toward us. It's thumbing its nose at me. It knows I can't do a blessed thing to it. Ned stamped his foot, brandishing an imaginary harpoon. His hands positively trembled. These cetaceans, he asked, are they as big as the ones in the northernmost seas? Pretty nearly, Ned. Because I've seen big baleen whales, sir. Whales measuring up to 100 feet long. I've even heard that those rockwool whales off the Aleutian Islands sometimes get over 150 feet. That strikes me as exaggerated, I replied. Those animals are only members of the genus Balanoptera, furnished with dorsal fins, and like sperm whales, they're generally smaller than the bowhead whale. Oh, exclaimed the Canadian, whose eyes hadn't left the ocean. It's getting closer. It's coming into the Nautilus's waters. Then, going on with his conversation, You talk about sperm whales, he said, as if they were little beasts. But there are stories of gigantic sperm whales. They're shrewd cetaceans. I hear that some will cover themselves with algae and fucus plants. People mistake them for islets. They pitch camp on top, make themselves at home, light a fire, build houses, Conseil said. <laughs> yes, funny man, Ned Land replied. Then one fine day the animal dives and drags all its occupants down into the depths. <laughs> like in the voyages of Sinbad the Sailor, I answered laughing. Oh, Mr. Land, you're addicted to tall tales. What sperm whales you're handing us. I hope you don't really believe in them. Mr. Naturalist, the Canadian replied in all seriousness. When it comes to whales, you can't believe anything. Look at that one move. Look at it stealing away. People claim these animals can circle around the world in just 15 days. I don't say nay. But what you undoubtedly don't know, Professor Achona, is that at the beginning of the world, whales traveled even quicker. Oh, really, Ned? And why so? Because in those days, their tails moved side to side like those on fish. In other words, their tails were straight up, thrashing the water from left to right, right to left. 
but spotting that they swam too fast, our creator twisted their tails, and ever since they've been thrashing the waves up and down at the expense of their speed. Fine, Ned, I said, then resurrected one of the Canadian's expressions. You expect us to fall for that? Not too terribly, Ned Land replied. And no more than if I told you there are whales that are three hundred feet long and weigh one million pounds. That's indeed considerable, I said. But you must admit that certain cetaceans do grow to significant size, since they're said to supply as much as one hundred and twenty metric tons of oil. That I've seen, the Canadian said. I can easily believe it, Ned, just as I can believe that certain baleen whales equal one hundred elephants in bulk. Imagine the impact of such a mass if it were launched at full speed. Is it true, Conseil asked, that they can sink ships? Ships? I doubt it, I replied. However, they say that in 1820, right in these southern seas, a baleen whale rushed at the Essex and pushed it backward at a speed of four meters per second. Its stern was flooded, and the Essex went down fast. Ned looked at me with a bantering expression. Speaking for myself, he said, I once got walloped by a whale's tail. In my longboat, needless to say, my companions and I were launched to an altitude of six meters, but next to the professor's whale, mine was just a baby. Do these animals live a long time? Conseil asked. A thousand years, the Canadian replied without hesitation. And how, Ned, I asked, do you know that's so? Because people say so. And why do people say so? Because people know so. No, Ned, people don't know so. They suppose so. And here's the logic with which they back up their beliefs. When fishermen first hunted whales 400 years ago, these animals grew to bigger sizes than they do today. Reasonably enough, it's assumed that today's whales are smaller because they haven't had time to reach their full growth. That's why the Count de Buffon's encyclopedia says that cetaceans can live, and even must live, for a thousand years. You understand? Ned Land didn't understand. He no longer even heard me. That baleen whale kept coming closer. His eyes devoured it. Oh, he exclaimed. It's not just one whale. It's ten. Twenty, a whole gam. I can't do a thing. I'm tied hand and foot. But Ned, my friend, Conseil said, why not ask Captain Nemo for permission to hunt? Before Conseil could finish his sentence, Ned Land scooted down the hatch and ran to look for the captain. A few moments later, the two of them reappeared on the platform. Captain Nemo observed the herd of cetaceans cavorting on the waters a mile from the Nautilus. They're southern right whales, he said. There goes the fortune of a whole whaling fleet. Well, sir, the Canadian asked, couldn't I hunt them, just so I don't forget my old harpooning trade? Hunt them? What for? Captain Nemo replied. Simply to destroy them? We have no use for whale oil on this ship. But, sir, the Canadian went on, in the Red Sea you authorized us to chase a dugong. There it was an issue of obtaining fresh meat for my crew. Here it would be killing for the sake of killing. I'm well aware that's a privilege reserved for mankind, but I don't allow such murderous pastimes. When your peers, Mr. Land, destroy decent harmless creatures like the southern right whale or the bowhead whale, they commit a reprehensible offense. Thus they've already depopulated all of Baffin Bay, and they'll wipe out a whole class of useful animals. So leave these poor cetaceans alone. They have quite enough natural enemies such as sperm whales, swordfish, and sawfish, without you meddling with them. I'll let the reader decide what faces the Canadian made during this lecture on hunting ethics. Furnishing such arguments to a professional harpooner was a waste of words. Ned Land stared at Captain Nebo and obviously missed his meaning. But the captain was right. Thanks to the mindless, barbaric bloodthirstiness of fishermen, the last baleen whale will some day disappear from the ocean. Ned Land whistled Yankee Doodle between his teeth, stuffed his hands in his pockets, and turned his back on us.
Meanwhile, Captain Nemo studied the herd of cetaceans, then addressed me. I was right to claim that baleen whales have enough natural enemies without counting man. These specimens will soon have to deal with mighty opponents. Eight miles to leeward, Professor Achona, can you see those blackish specks moving about? Yes, Captain, I replied. Those are sperm whales, dreadful animals that I've sometimes encountered in herds of two hundred or three hundred. As for them, they're cruel, destructive beasts, and they deserve to be exterminated. The Canadian turned swiftly at these last words. Well, Captain, I said, on behalf of the baleen whales, there's still time. It's pointless to run any risks, Professor. The Nautilus will suffice to disperse these sperm whales. It's armed with a steel spur quite equal to Mr. Land's harpoon, I imagine. The Canadian didn't even bother shrugging his shoulders, attacking cetaceans with thrusts from a spur. Who ever heard of such malarkey? Wait and see, Professor Achona, Captain Nemo said. We'll show you a style of hunting with which you aren't yet familiar. We'll take no pity on these ferocious cetaceans. They're merely mouth and teeth. Mouth and teeth? There's no better way to describe the long-skulled sperm whale, whose length sometimes exceeds twenty-five meters. The enormous head of this cetacean occupies about a third of its body, better armed than a baleen whale, whose upper jaw is adorned solely with whalebone. The sperm whale is equipped with twenty-five huge teeth that are twenty centimeters high, have cylindrical conical summits, and weigh two pounds each. In the top part of this enormous head, inside big cavities separated by cartilage, you'll find three hundred to four hundred kilograms of that valuable oil called spermaceti. The sperm whale is an awkward animal, more tadpole than fish, as Professor Fred Doyle has noted. It's poorly constructed being defective, so to speak, over the whole left side of its frame, with good eyesight only in its right eye. Meanwhile, that monstrous herd kept coming closer. It had seen the baleen whales and was preparing to attack. You could tell in advance that the sperm whales would be victorious, not only because they were better built for fighting than their harmless adversaries, but also because they could stay longer under water before returning to breathe at the surface. There was just time to run to the rescue of the baleen whales. The Nautilus proceeded to midwater. Conseil, Ned, and I sat in front of the lounge windows. Captain Nemo made his way to the helmsman's side to operate his submersible as an engine of destruction. Soon I felt the beats of our propeller getting faster, and we picked up speed. The battle between sperm whales and baleen whales had already begun when the Nautilus arrived. It maneuvered to cut into the herd of long skulled predators. At first the latter showed little concern at the sight of this new monster meddling in the battle, but they soon had to sidestep its thrusts. What a struggle! Ned Land quickly grew enthusiastic and even ended up applauding. Brandished in its captain's hands, the Nautilus was simply a fearsome harpoon. He hurled it at those fleshly masses and ran them clean through, leaving behind two squirming animal halves. As for those daunting strokes of the tail hitting our sides, the ship never felt them, no more than the collisions it caused. One sperm whale exterminated, it ran at another. Tacked on the spot so as not to miss its prey, went ahead or astern, obeyed its rudder, dived when the cetacean sank to deeper strata, rose with it when it returned to the surface, struck it head on or slantwise, hacked at it or tore it, and from every direction and at any speed, skewered it with its dreadful spur. What bloodshed! What a hubbub on the surface of the waves! What sharp hisses and snorts, unique to those frightened animals! Their tails churn the normally peaceful strata into actual billows. This homeric slaughter dragged on for an hour, and the long-skulled predators couldn't get away. Several times, ten or twelve of them teamed up trying to crush the Nautilus with their sheer mass. Through the windows you could see their enormous mouths paved with teeth, their fearsome eyes losing all self-control. Ned Land hurled threats and insults at them. You could feel them clinging to the submersible like hounds atop a wild boar in the underbrush. But by forcing the pace of its propeller, the Nautilus carried them off, dragged them under, or brought them back to the upper level of the waters, untroubled by their enormous weight or their powerful grip. Finally, this mass of sperm whales thinned out. The waves grew tranquil again. 
I felt us rising to the surface of the ocean. The hatch opened, and we rushed onto the platform. The sea was covered with mutilated corpses. A fearsome explosion couldn't have slashed, torn, or shredded these fleshly masses with greater violence. We were floating in the midst of gigantic bodies, bluish on the back, whitish on the belly, and all deformed by enormous protuberances. A few frightened sperm whales were fleeing toward the horizon. The waves were dyed red over an area of several miles, and the Nautilus was floating in the middle of a sea of blood. Captain Nemo rejoined us. Well, Mr. Land, he said. Well, sir, replied the Canadian, whose enthusiasm had subsided. It's a dreadful sight for sure. But I'm a hunter, not a butcher. And this is plain butchery. It was a slaughter of destructive animals, the captain replied. And the Nautilus is no butcher knife. I prefer my harpoon, the Canadian answered. To each his own, the captain replied, staring intently at Ned Land. I was in dread the latter would give way to some violent outburst that might have had deplorable consequences. But his anger was diverted by the sight of a baleen whale that the Nautilus had pulled alongside of just then. This animal had been unable to escape the teeth of those sperm whales. I recognized the southern right whale, its head squat, its body dark all over. Anatomically, it's distinguished from the white whale and the black right whale by the fusion of its seven cervical vertebrae, and it numbers two more ribs than its relatives. Floating on its side, its belly riddled with bites, the poor cetacean was dead. Still hanging from the tip of its mutilated fin was a little baby whale that it had been unable to rescue from the slaughter. Its open mouth let water flow through its whalebone like a murmuring surf. Captain Nemo guided the Nautilus next to the animal's corpse. Two of his men climbed onto the whale's flank, and to my astonishment, I saw them draw from its udders all the milk they held, in other words, enough to fill two or three casks. The captain offered me a cup of the still warm milk. I couldn't help showing my distaste for such a beverage. He assured me that this milk was excellent, no different from cow's milk. I sampled it and agreed. So this milk was a worthwhile reserve ration for us, because in the form of salt butter or cheese, it would provide a pleasant change of pace from our standard fare. From that day on, I noted with some uneasiness that Ned Land's attitudes toward Captain Nemo grew worse and worse and I decided to keep a close watch on the Canadian's movements and activities. Chapter 34 A Lost Continent The next morning, February 19, I beheld the Canadian entering my stateroom. I was expecting this visit. He wore an expression of great disappointment. Well, sir, he said to me. Well, Ned, the fates were against us yesterday. Yes, that damned captain had to call a halt just as we were going to escape from his boat. Yes, Ned, he had business with his bankers. His bankers? Or, rather, his bank vaults, by which I mean this ocean where his wealth is safer than any national treasury. I then related the evening's incidents to the Canadian, secretly hoping he would come around to the idea of not deserting the captain. But my narrative had no result other than Ned's voicing deep regret that he hadn't strolled across the Vigo battlefield on his own behalf. Anyhow, he said, it's not over yet. My first harpoon missed, that's all. We'll succeed the next time, and as soon as this evening, if need be. What's the Nautilus's heading, I asked. I've no idea, Ned replied. All right, at noon we'll find out what our position is. The Canadian returned to Conseil's side. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the lounge. The compass wasn't encouraging. The Nautilus's course was south-southwest. 
we were turning our backs on Europe. I could hardly wait until our position was reported on the chart. Near 11.30, the ballast tanks emptied, and the submersible rose to the surface of the ocean. I leaped onto the platform, and land was already there. No more shore in sight, nothing but the immenseness of the sea. A few sails were on the horizon, no doubt ships going as far as Cap Sarroque, to find favourable wind for doubling the Cape of Good Hope. The sky was overcast, a squall was on the way. Furious, Ned tried to see through the mists on the horizon. He still hoped that behind all that fog there lay those shores he longed for. At noon the sun made a momentary appearance. Taking advantage of this rift in the clouds, the chief officer took the orb's altitude. Then the sea grew turbulent. We went below again, and the hatch closed once more. When I consulted the chart an hour later, I saw that the Nautilus's position was marked at longitude 16 degrees 17 and latitude 33 degrees 22, a good 150 leagues from the nearest coast. It wouldn't do to even dream of escaping, and I'll let the reader decide how promptly the Canadian threw a tantrum when I ventured to tell him our situation. As for me, I wasn't exactly grief-stricken. I felt as if a heavy weight had been lifted from me, and I was able to resume my regular tasks in a state of comparative calm. Near eleven o'clock in the evening, I received a most unexpected visit from Captain Nemo. He asked me very graciously if I felt exhausted from our vigil the night before. I said no. Then, Professor Arjona, I propose an unusual excursion. Propose away, Captain. So far, you visited the ocean depths only by day and under sunlight. Would you like to see these depths on a dark night? Very much. I warn you, this will be an exhausting stroll. We'll need to walk long hours and scale a mountain. The roads aren't terribly well kept up. Everything you say, Captain, just increases my curiosity. I am ready to go with you. Then come along, Professor, and we'll go put on our diving suits. Arriving at the wardrobe, I saw that neither my companions nor any crewmen would be coming with us on this excursion. Captain Nemo hadn't even suggested my fetching Ned or Conseil. In a few moments we had put on our equipment. Air tanks, abundantly charged, were placed on our backs, but the electric lamps were not in readiness. I commented on this to the captain. They'll be useless to us, he replied. I thought I hadn't heard him right, but I couldn't repeat my comment because the captain's head had already disappeared into its metal covering. I finished harnessing myself. I felt an alpenstock being placed in my hand. In a few minutes later, after the usual procedures, we set foot on the floor of the Atlantic, three hundred meters down. Midnight was approaching. The waters were profoundly dark, but Captain Nemo pointed to a reddish spot in the distance, a sort of wide glow shimmering about two miles from the Nautilus. What this fire was, what substances fed it, how and why it kept burning in the liquid mass, I couldn't say. Anyhow, it lit our way, although hazily, but I soon grew accustomed to this unique gloom, and in these circumstances I understood the uselessness of the Rumkorf device. Side by side, Captain Nemo and I walked directly toward this conspicuous flame. The level sea floor rose imperceptibly. We took long strides, helped by our alpen stocks, but in general our progress was slow, because our feet kept sinking into a kind of slimy mud mixed with seaweed and assorted flat stones. As we moved forward, I heard a kind of pitter-patter above my head. Sometimes this noise increased and became a continuous crackle. I soon realized the cause. It was a heavy rainfall, rattling on the surface of the waves. Instinctively, I worried that I might get soaked. By water in the midst of water, I couldn't help smiling at this outlandish notion. But to tell the truth, wearing these heavy diving suits, you no longer feel the liquid element. You simply think you're in the midst of air, a little denser than air on land. That's all. After half an hour of walking, the seafloor grew rocky. Jellyfish, microscopic crustaceans, and sea-pin coral lit it faintly with their phosphorescent glimmers. I glimpsed piles of stones covered by a couple million zoophytes and tangles of algae. 
My feet often slipped on this viscous seaweed carpet, and without my alpenstock I would have fallen more than once. When I turned around, I could still see the Nautilus's whitish beacon, which was starting to grow pale in the distance. Those piles of stones just mentioned were laid out on the ocean floor with a distinct but inexplicable symmetry. I spotted gigantic furrows trailing off into the distant darkness, their length incalculable. There also were other peculiarities I couldn't make sense of. It seemed to me that my heavy lead soles were crushing a litter of bones that made a dry, crackling noise. So what were these vast plains we were now crossing? I wanted to ask the captain, but I still didn't grasp that sign language that allows him to chat with his companions when they went with him on his underwater excursions. Meanwhile, the reddish light guiding us had expanded and inflamed the horizon. The presence of this furnace under the waters had me extremely puzzled. Was it some sort of electrical discharge? Was I approaching some natural phenomenon still unknown to scientists on shore? Or, rather, and this thought did cross my mind, had the hand of man intervened in that blaze? Had human beings fanned those flames? In these deep strata, would I meet up with more of Captain Nemo's companions, friends he was about to visit who led lives as strange as his own? Would I find a whole colony of exiles down here, men tired of the world's woes, men who had sought and found independence in the ocean's lower depths? All these insane, inadmissible ideas dogged me, and in this frame of mind, continually excited by the series of wonders passing before my eyes, I wouldn't have been surprised to find on this sea bottom one of those underwater towns Captain Nemo dreamed about. Our path was getting brighter and brighter. The red glow had turned white and was radiating from a mountain peak about 800 feet high. But what I saw was simply a reflection produced by the crystal waters of these strata. The furnace that was the source of this inexplicable light occupied the far side of the mountain. In the midst of the stone mazes furrowing this Atlantic seafloor, Captain Nemo moved forward without hesitation. He knew this dark path. No doubt he had often traveled it and was incapable of losing his way. I followed him with unshakable confidence. He seemed like some spirit of the sea, and as he walked ahead of me, I marveled at his tall figure, which stood out in black against the glowing background of the horizon. It was one o'clock in the morning. We arrived at the mountain's lower gradients, but in grappling with them, we had to venture up difficult trails through a huge thicket. Yes, a thicket of dead trees, trees without leaves, without sap, turned to stone by the action of the waters, and crowned here and there by gigantic pines. It was like a still erect coal field, its roots clutching broken soil, its boughs clearly outlined against the ceiling of the waters like thin black paper cutouts. Picture a forest clinging to the sides of a peak in the Hartz Mountains, but a submerged forest. The trails were cluttered with algae and fucus plants, hosts of crustaceans swarming among them. I plunged on, scaling rocks, straddling fallen tree trunks, snapping marine creepers that swayed from one tree to another, startling the fish that flitted from branch to branch. Carried away, I didn't feel exhausted any more. I followed a guide who was immune to exhaustion. What a sight! How can I describe it? How can I portray these woods and rocks in this liquid setting? their lower parts dark and sullen, their upper parts tinted red in this light, whose intensity was doubled by the reflecting power of the waters. We scaled rocks that crumbled behind us, collapsing in enormous sections, with the hollow rumble of an avalanche. To our right and left there were carved gloomy galleries, where the eye lost its way. Huge glades opened up, seemingly cleared by the hand of man. And I sometimes wondered whether some residents of these underwater regions would suddenly appear before me. But Captain Nemo kept climbing. I didn't want to fall behind. I followed him boldly. My alpenstock was a great help. One wrong step would have been disastrous on the narrow paths cut into the side of these chasms. But I walked along with a firm tread, and without the slightest feeling of dizziness. 
Sometimes I leaped over a crevice whose depth would have made me recoil had I been in the midst of glaciers on shore. Sometimes I ventured out on a wobbling tree trunk fallen across a gorge, without looking down having eyes only for marvelling at the wild scenery of this region. There, leaning on erratically cut foundations, monumental rocks seemed to defy the laws of balance. From between their stony knees, trees sprang up like jets under fearsome pressure, supporting other trees that supported them in turn. Next, natural towers with wide, steeply carved battlements leaned at angles that, on dry land, the laws of gravity would never have authorized. And I, too, could feel the difference created by the water's powerful density. Despite my heavy clothing, copper headpiece, and metal soles, I climbed the most impossibly steep gradients with all the nimbness, I swear it, of a chamois or a Pyrenees mountain goat. As for my account on this excursion under the waters, I'm well aware that it sounds incredible. I'm the chronicler of deeds seemingly impossible and yet incontestably real. This was no fantasy. This was what I saw and felt. Two hours after leaving the Nautilus, we had cleared the timber line and one hundred feet above our heads stood the mountain peak, forming a dark silhouette against the brilliant glare that came from its far slope. Petrified shrubs rambled here and there in sprawling zigzags. Fish rose in a body at our feet like birds startled in tall grass. The rocky mass was gouged with impenetrable crevices, deep caves, unfathomable holes at whose far ends I could hear fearsome things moving around. My blood would curdle as I watched some enormous antenna bar my path, or saw some frightful pincer snap shut in the shadow of some cavity. A thousand specks of light glittered in the midst of the gloom. They were the eyes of gigantic crustaceans crouching in their lairs, giant lobsters rearing up like spear carriers and moving their claws with a scrap iron clanking, titanic crabs aiming their bodies like cannons on their carriages, and hideous devilfish intertwining their tentacles like bushes of writhing snakes. What was this astounding world that I didn't yet know? In what order did these articulates belong, these creatures from which the rocks provided a second carapace? Where had nature learned the secret of their vegetating existence, and for how many centuries had they lived in the ocean's lower strata? But I couldn't linger. Captain Nemo, on familiar terms with these dreadful animals, no longer minded them. We arrived at a preliminary plateau, where still other surprises were waiting for me. Their picturesque ruins took shape, betraying the hand of man, not our creator. They were huge stacks of stones in which you could distinguish the indistinct forms of palaces and temples, now arrayed in hosts of blossoming zoophytes, and over it all, not ivy, but a heavy mantle of algae and fucus plants. But what part of the globe could this be, this land swallowed by cataclysms? Who had set up these rocks and stones like the dolmens of prehistoric times? Where was I? Where had Captain Nemo's fancies taken me? I wanted to ask him. Unable to, I stopped him. I seized his arm, but he shook his head, pointed to the mountain's topmost peak, and seemed to tell me, Come on, come with me, come higher. I followed him with one last burst of energy, and in a few minutes... I had scaled the peak, which crowned the whole rocky mass, by some ten meters. I looked back down the side we had just cleared. There the mountain rose only seven hundred to eight hundred feet above the plains, but on its far slope it crowned the receding bottom of this part of the Atlantic by a height twice that. My eyes scanned the distance and took in a vast area lit by intense flashes of light. In essence, this mountain was a volcano. Fifty feet below its peak, amid a shower of stones and slag, a wide crater vomited torrents of lava that were dispersed in fiery cascades into the heart of the liquid mass. So situated, this volcano was an immense torch that lit up the lower plains all the way to the horizon. As I said, this underwater crater spewed lava but not flames. Flames need oxygen from the air and are unable to spread under water but a lava flow which contains in itself the principle of its incandescence can rise to a white heat, overpower the liquid element, and turn it into steam on contact. 
Swift currents swept away all this diffuse gas, and torrents of lava slid to the floor of the mountain, like the disgorgings of a Mount Vesuvius over the city limits of a second Torre del Greco. In fact, there beneath my eyes was a town in ruins, demolished, overwhelmed, laid low, its roofs caved in, its temples pulled down, its arches dislocated, its columns stretching over the earth. In these ruins you could still detect the solid proportions of a sort of Tuscan architecture. Farther off, the remains of a gigantic aqueduct. Here, the caked heights of an acropolis along with the fluid forms of a Parthenon. There, the remains of a wharf. As if some bygone port had long ago harbored merchant vessels and triple-tiered war galleys on the shores of some lost ocean. Still farther off, long rows of collapsing walls, deserted thoroughfares, a whole Pompeii buried under the waters, which Captain Nemo had resurrected before my eyes. Where was I? Where was I? I had to find out at all cost. I wanted to speak. I wanted to rip off the copper sphere imprisoning my head. But Captain Nemo came over and stopped me with a gesture. Then... Picking up a piece of chalky stone, he advanced to a black basaltic rock and scrawled this one word. Atlantis. What lightning flashed through my mind? Atlantis, that ancient land of Meropis, mentioned by the historian Theopompus. Plato's Atlantis. The continent whose very existence has been denied by such philosophers and scientists as Origen, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Donville, Montbrun, and Humboldt, who entered its disappearance in the ledger of myths and folk tales. The country whose reality has nevertheless been accepted by such other thinkers as Poseidonus, Pliny, Amyanus, Marcellinus, Tertullian, Engel, Scherer, Tunierfond, Buffon, and Avezac. I had this land right under my eyes, furnishing its own unimpeachable evidence of the catastrophe that had overtaken it. So this was the submerged region that had existed outside Europe, Asia, and Libya, beyond the pillars of Hercules, home of those powerful Atlantean people against whom ancient Greece had waged its earliest wars. The writer whose narratives record the lofty deeds of those heroic times is Plato himself. His dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, were drafted with the poet and legislator Solon as their inspiration, as it were. One day Solon was conversing with some elderly wise men in the Egyptian capital of Sais, a town already eight thousand years of age, as documented by the annals engraved on the sacred walls of its temples. One of these elders related the history of another town, one thousand years older still. This original city of Athens, ninety centuries old, had been invaded and partly destroyed by the Atlanteans. These Atlanteans, he said, resided on an immense continent greater than Africa and Asia combined, taking in an area that lay between latitude twelve degrees and forty degrees north. Their dominion extended even to Egypt, they tried to enforce their rule as far as Greece, but they had to retreat before the indomitable resistance of the Hellenic people. Centuries passed. A cataclysm occurred, floods, earthquakes. A single night and day were enough to obliterate this Atlantis, whose highest peaks, Madeira, the Azores, the Canaries, the Cape Verde Islands, still emerge above the waves. These were the historical memories that Captain Nemo's scrawl sent rushing through my mind. Thus, led by the strangest of fates, I was treading underfoot one of the mountains of that continent. My hands were touching ruins many thousands of years old, contemporary with prehistoric times. I was walking in the very place where contemporaries of early man had walked. My heavy soles were crushing the skeletons of animals from the age of fable. Animals that used to take cover in the shade of these trees now turn to stone. Oh, why was I so short of time? I would have gone down the steep slopes of this mountain, crossed this entire immense continent, which surely connects Africa with America, and visited its great prehistoric cities. Under my eyes there perhaps lay the warlike town of Machimos, or the pious village of Eusebes, 
whose gigantic inhabitants lived for whole centuries and had the strength to raise blocks of stone that still withstood the action of the waters. One day, perhaps, some volcanic phenomenon will bring these sunken ruins back to the surface of the waves. Numerous underwater volcanoes have been sighted in this part of the ocean, and many ships have felt terrific tremors when passing over these turbulent depths. A few have heard hollow noises that announced some struggle of the elements far below. Others have hauled in volcanic ash hurled above the waves. As far as the equator, this whole seafloor is still under construction by plutonic forces. And in some remote epoch, built up by volcanic disgorgings and successive layers of lava, who knows whether the peaks of these fire-belching mountains may reappear above the surface of the Atlantic? As I mused in this way, trying to establish in my memory every detail of this impressive landscape, Captain Nemo was leaning his elbows on a moss-covered monument, motionless as if petrified in some mute trance. Was he dreaming of those lost generations, asking them for the secret of human destiny? Was it here that this strange man came to revive himself, basking in historical memories, reliving that bygone life, he who had no desire for our modern one? I would have given anything to know his thoughts, to share them, understand them. We stayed in this place an entire hour, contemplating its vast plains and the lava's glow, which sometimes took on a startling intensity. Inner boiling sent quick shivers running through the mountain's crust. Noises from deep underneath clearly transmitted by the liquid medium reverberated with majestic amplitude. Just then the moon appeared for an instant through the watery mass, casting a few pale rays over this submerged continent. It was only a fleeting glimmer, but its effect was indescribable. The captain stood up and took one last look at these immense plains. Then his hand signaled me to follow him. We went swiftly down the mountain. Once past the petrified forest, I could see the Nautilus's beacon twinkling like a star. The captain walked straight toward it, and we were back on board just as the first glimmers of dawn were whitening the surface of the ocean. Chapter 35 The Underwater Coal Fields The next day, February 20, I overslept. I was so exhausted from the night before, I didn't get up until eleven o'clock. I dressed quickly. I hurried to find out the Nautilus's heading. The instruments indicated that it was running southward at a speed of twenty miles per hour, and a depth of one hundred meters. Corset entered. I described our nocturnal excursion to him, and since the panels were open, he could still catch a glimpse of this submerged continent. In fact, the Nautilus was skimming only ten meters over the soil of these Atlantis plains. The ship scuttled along like an air balloon borne by the wind over some prairie on land. But it would be more accurate to say that we sat in the lounge as if we were riding in a coach on an express train. As for the foregrounds passing before our eyes, they were fantastically carved rocks, forests of trees that had crossed over from the vegetable kingdom into the mineral kingdom their motionless silhouettes sprawling beneath the waves. There also were stony masses buried beneath carpets of exedia and sea anemone, bristling with long vertical water plants, then strangely contoured blocks of lava that testified to all the fury of those plutonic developments. While this bizarre scenery was glittering under our electric beams, I told Conseil the story of the Atlanteans who had inspired the old French scientist Jean Bailly to write so many entertaining, albeit utterly fictitious, pages. I told the lad about the wars of these heroic people. I discussed the question of Atlantis with the fervor of a man who no longer had any doubts. But Conseil was so distracted he barely heard me, and his lack of interest in any commentary on this historical topic was soon explained. In essence, numerous fish had caught his eye, and when fish pass by, Conseil vanishes into his world of classifying and leaves real life behind. In which case, I could only tag along and resume our ichthyological research. Even so, these Atlantic fish were not noticeably different from those we had observed earlier. There were rays of gigantic size, five meters long and with muscles so powerful they could leap above the waves. Sharks of various species, including a 15-foot glaucous shark, 
with sharp triangular teeth, and so transparent it was almost invisible amid the waters. Brown lantern sharks, prism-shaped humantin sharks armored with protuberant hides, sturgeons resembling their relatives in the Mediterranean, trumpet-snouted pipefish a foot and a half long, yellowish-brown with small gray fins, and no teeth or tongue, unreeling like slim, supple snakes. Among bony fish, Conseil noticed some blackish marlin three meters long with a sharp sword jutted from their upper jaw, bright-colored weavers known in Aristotle's day as sea dragons, and whose dorsal stingers make them quite dangerous to pick up. Then dolphin fish with brown backs striped in blue and edged in gold, handsome dorados, moon-like opers that look like azure discs, but which the sun's rays turn into spots of silver, finally eight-meter swordfish from the genus Zephyrus, swimming in schools, sporting yellowish sickle-shaped fins and six-foot broadswords. Stalwart animals, plant-eaters rather than fish-eaters, obeying the tiniest signals from their females, like hen-pecked husbands. But while observing these different specimens of marine fauna, I didn't stop examining the long plains of Atlantis. Sometimes an unpredictable irregularity in the seafloor would force the Nautilus to slow down, and then it would glide into the narrow channels between the hills with the cetacean's dexterity. If the labyrinth became hopelessly tangled, the submersible would rise above it like an airship, and after clearing the obstacle, it would resume its speedy course just a few meters above the ocean floor. It was an enjoyable and impressive way of navigating that did indeed recall the maneuvers of an airship ride, with the major difference that the Nautilus faithfully obeyed the hands of its helmsman. The terrain consisted mostly of thick slime mixed with petrified branches, but it changed little by little near four o'clock in the afternoon. It grew rockier, and seemed to be strewn with pudding stones and a basaltic gravel called tuff, together with bits of lava and sulfurous obsidian. I expected these long plains to change into mountain regions, and, in fact, as the Nautilus was executing certain turns, I noticed that the southerly horizon was blocked by a high wall that seemed to close off every exit. Its summit obviously poked above the level of the ocean, it had to be a continent, or at least an island, either one of the Canaries or one of the Cape Verde Islands. Our bearings hadn't been marked on the chart, perhaps deliberately, and I had no idea what our position was. In any case, this wall seemed to signal the end of Atlantis, of which, all in all, we had crossed only a small part. Nightfall didn't interrupt my observations. I was left to myself. Conseil had repaired to his cabin. The Nautilus slowed down, hovering above the muddled masses on the seafloor, sometimes grazing them as if wanting to come to rest, sometimes rising unpredictably to the surface of the waves. Then I glimpsed a few bright constellations through the crystal waters, specifically five or six of those zodiacal stars trailing from the tail end of Orion. I would have stayed longer at my window, marveling at these beauties of sea and sky but the panels closed. Just then the Nautilus had arrived at the perpendicular face of that high wall. How the ship would maneuver, I hadn't a guess. I repaired to my stateroom. The Nautilus did not stir. I fell asleep with the firm intention of waking up in just a few hours, but it was eight o'clock the next day when I returned to the lounge. I stared at the pressure gauge. It told me that the Nautilus was afloat on the surface of the ocean. Furthermore, I heard the sound of footsteps on the platform. Yet there were no rolling movements to indicate the presence of waves undulating above me. I climbed as far as the hatch. It was open. But instead of the broad daylight I was expecting, I found that I was surrounded by total darkness. Where were we? Had I been mistaken? Was it still night? No, not one star was twinkling, and night time is never so utterly black. I wasn't sure what to think when a voice said to me, Is that you, Professor? Ah, Captain Nemo, I replied. Where are we? Underground, Professor. Underground, I exclaimed. And the Nautilus is still floating. It always floats. But I don't understand. Wait a little while, 
Our beacon is about to go on, and if you want some light on the subject, you'll be satisfied. I set foot on the platform and waited. The darkness was so profound I couldn't see even Captain Nemo. However, looking at the zenith directly overhead, I thought I caught sight of a feeble glimmer. A sort of twilight flittering through a circular hole. Just then the beacon suddenly went on, and its intense brightness made that hazy light vanish. This stream of electricity dazzled my eyes, and after momentarily shutting them, I looked around. The Nautilus was stationary. It was floating next to an embankment shaped like a wharf. As for the water now buoying the ship, it was a lake completely encircled by an inner wall about two miles in diameter, hence six miles around. Its level, as indicated by the pressure gauge, would be the same as the outside level, because some connection had to exist between this lake and the sea. Slanting inward over their base, these high walls converged to form a vault shape like an immense upside-down funnel that measured five hundred or six hundred meters in height. At its summit there gaped the circular opening through which I had detected that faint glimmer, obviously daylight. Before more carefully examining the interior features of this enormous cavern, and before deciding if it was the work of nature or humankind, I went over to Captain Nemo. Where are we? I said. In the very heart of an extinct volcano, the captain answered me. A volcano whose interior was invaded by the sea after some convulsion in the earth. While you were sleeping, Professor, the Nautilus entered this lagoon through a natural channel that opens ten meters below the surface of the ocean. This is our home port, secure, convenient, secret, and sheltered against winds from any direction. Along the coasts of your continents or islands, show me any offshore mooring that can equal this safe refuge from withstanding the fury of hurricanes. Indeed, I replied. Here you're in perfect safety, Captain Nemo. Who could reach you in the heart of a volcano? But don't I see an opening at its summit? Yes, its crater, a crater formerly filled with lava, steam, and flames, but which now lets in this life-giving air we're breathing. But which volcano mountain is this, I asked? It's the one of the many islets with which the sea is strewn, for ships a mere reef, for us an immense cavern. I discovered it by chance, and chance served me well. But couldn't someone enter through the mouth of its crater? No more than I could exit through it. You can climb about a hundred feet up the inner base of this mountain, but then the walls overhang. They lean too far in to be scaled. I can see, Captain, that nature is your obedient servant, any time or any place. You're safe on this lake, and nobody else can visit its waters. But what's the purpose of this refuge? The Nautilus doesn't need a harbor. No, Professor. But it needs electricity to run, batteries to generate its electricity, sodium to feed its batteries, coal to make its sodium, and coal fields from which to dig its coal. Now then, right at this spot the sea covers entire forests that sank underwater in prehistoric times. Today, turned to stone transformed into carbon fuel, they offer me inexhaustible coal mines. So, Captain, your men practice the trade of miners here? Precisely. These mines extend under the waves like the coal fields at Newcastle. Here, dressed in diving suits, pick and mattock in hand, my men go out and dig this carbon fuel for which I don't need a single mine on land. When I burn this combustible to produce sodium, the smoke escaping from the mountain's crater gives it the appearance of a still active volcano. And will we see your companions at work? No, at least not this time, because I'm eager to continue our underwater tour of the world. Accordingly, I'll rest content with drawing on my reserve stock of sodium. We'll stay here long enough to load it on board. In other words, a single work day. Then we'll resume our voyage. So, Professor Achona, if you'd like to explore this cavern and circle its lagoon, seize the day. I thanked the captain and went to look for my two companions, who hadn't yet left their cabin.
I invited them to follow me, not telling them where we were. They climbed onto the platform. Conseil, whom nothing could startle, saw it as a perfectly natural thing to fall asleep under the waves and wake up under a mountain. But Ned Land had no idea in his head other than to see if this cavern offered some way out. After breakfast, near ten o'clock, we went down onto the embankment. So here we are, back on shore, Conseil said. I'd hardly call this a shore, the Canadian replied. And besides, we aren't on it, but under it. A sandy beach unfolded before us, measuring five hundred feet at its widest point, between the waters of the lake and the foot of the mountain's walls. Via this strand you could easily circle the lake, but the base of these high walls consisted of broken soil over which there lay picturesque piles of volcanic blocks and enormous pumice stones. All these crumbling masses were covered with an enamel polished by the action of underground fires, and they glistened under the steam of electric light from our beacon. Stirred up by our footsteps, the mica-rich dust on this beach flew into the air like a cloud of sparks. The ground rose appreciably as it moved away from the sand flats by the waves, and we soon arrived at some long, winding gradients, genuinely steep paths that allowed us to climb little by little. But we had to tread cautiously in the midst of pudding stones that weren't cemented together, and our feet kept skidding on glassy trachyte, made of feldspar and quartz crystals. The volcanic nature of this enormous pit was apparent all around us. I ventured to comment on it to my companions. Can you picture, I asked them, what this funnel must have been like when it was filled with boiling lava, and the level of that incandescent liquid rose right to the mountain's mouth, like cast iron up the insides of a furnace? I can picture it perfectly, Conseil replied. But will Master tell me why this huge smelter suspended operations, and how it is that an oven was replaced by the tranquil waters of a lake? In all likelihood, Conseil, because some convulsion created an opening below the surface of the ocean, the opening that serves as a passageway for the Nautilus. Then the waters of the Atlantic rushed inside the mountain. There ensued a dreadful struggle between the elements of fire and water, a struggle ending in King Neptune's favor. But many centuries have passed since then, and this submerged volcano has changed into a peaceful cavern. That's fine. Ned Land answered. I accept the explanation, but in our personal interests, I'm sorry this opening the professor mentions wasn't made above sea level. But Ned, my friend, Conseil answered, if it weren't an underwater passageway, the Nautilus couldn't enter it. And I might add, Mr. Land, I said, that the waters wouldn't have rushed under the mountain, and the volcano would still be a volcano, so you have nothing to be sorry about. Our climb continued. The gradients got steeper and narrower. Sometimes they were cut across by deep pits that had to be cleared. Masses of overhanging rock had to be gotten around. You slid on your knees, you crept on your belly. But helped by the Canadian strength and Conseil's dexterity, we overcame every obstacle. At an elevation of about thirty meters, the nature of the terrain changed without becoming any easier. Pudding stones and trachyte gave way to black basaltic rock, here lying in slabs all swollen with blisters, there shaped like actual prisms and arranged into a series of columns that supported the springings of this immense vault, a wonderful sample of natural architecture. Then, among the basaltic rock, there snaked long, hardened lava flows inlaid with veins of bituminous coal and in places covered by wide carpets of sulphur. The sunshine coming through the crater had grown stronger, shedding a hazy light over all this volcanic waste forever buried in the heart of the sixteenth mountain. But when we ascended to an elevation of about two hundred and fifty feet, we were stopped by insurmountable obstacles. The converging inside walls changed into overhangs, and our climb into a circular stroll. At this topmost level the vegetable kingdom began to change the mineral kingdom. Shrubs, and even a few trees, emerged from the crevices in the walls. I recognized some spurges that let their caustic, purgative sap trickle out. There were helotropes, very remiss at living up to their sun-worshipping reputations, since no sunlight ever reached them. 
their clusters of flowers drooped sadly, their colours and scents were faded. Here and there chrysanthemums sprouted timidly at the feet of aloes with long, sad, sickly leaves. But between these lava flows I spotted little violets that still gave off a subtle fragrance, and I confess that I inhaled it with delight. The soul of a flower is its scent, and those splendid water plants, flowers of the sea, have no souls. We had arrived at the foot of a sturdy clump of dragon trees, which were splitting the rocks with extortions of their muscular roots, when Ned Land exclaimed, Oh, sir, a hive! A hive, I answered, with a gesture of utter disbelief. Yes, a hive! The Canadian repeated, with bees buzzing around! I went closer and was forced to recognize the obvious. At the mouth of a hole cut in the trunk of a dragon tree, there swarmed thousands of these ingenious insects so common to all the Canary Islands, where their output is especially prized. Naturally enough, the Canadian wanted to lay in a supple of honey, and it would have been ill-mannered of me to say no. He mixed sulphur with some dry leaves, set them on fire with a spark from his tinderbox, and proceeded to smoke the bees out. Little by little the buzzing died down, and the disemboweled hive yielded several pounds of sweet honey. Ned Land stuffed his haversack with it. When I mix this honey with our breadfruit batter, he told us, I'll be ready to serve you a delectable piece of cake. But of course, Conseil put in, it will be gingerbread. I'm all for gingerbread, I said, but let's resume this fascinating stroll. At certain turns in the trail we were going along, the lake appeared in its full expanse. The ship's beacon lit up that whole placid surface, which experienced neither ripples nor undulations. The Nautilus lay perfectly still. On its platform and on the embankment, crewmen were bustling around, black shadows that stood out clearly in the midst of the luminous air. Just then we went around the highest ridge of these rocky foothills that supported the vault. Then I saw that bees weren't the animal kingdom's only representatives inside this volcano. Here and in the shadows, birds of prey soared and whirled, flying away from nests perched on the tips of rock. There were sparrow hawks with white bellies and screeching kestrels. With all the speed their silt-like legs could muster, fine fat bustards scampered over the slopes. I'll let the reader decide whether the Canadian's appetite was aroused by the sight of this tasty game, and whether he regretted having no rifle in his hands. He tried to make stones do the work of bullets, and after several fruitless attempts he managed to wound one of these magnificent bustards. To say he risked his life twenty times in order to capture this bird is simply the unadulterated truth. But he fared so well the animal went into his sack to join the honeycombs. By then we were forced to go back down to the beach, because the ridge had become impossible. Above us the yawning crater looked like the wide mouth of a well. From where we stood, the sky was pretty easy to see, and I watched clouds race by, dishevelled by the west wind, letting tatters of mist trail over the mountain summit. Proof positive that those clouds kept at a moderate altitude, because this volcano didn't rise more than eighteen hundred feet above the level of the ocean. Half an hour after the Canadian's latest exploits, we were back on the inner beach. There the local flora was represented by a wide carpet of samphire, a small umbelliferous plant that keeps quite nicely, which also boasts the names glasswort, saxifrage, and sea fennel. Conseil picked a couple bunches. As for the local fauna, it included thousands of crustaceans of every type, Lobsters, hermit crabs, prawns, missage shrimps, daddy longlegs, rock crabs, and a prodigious number of seashells, such as cowries, murex snails, and limpets. In this locality there gaped the mouth of a magnificent cave. My companions and I took great pleasure in stretching out on its fine-grained sand. Fire had polished the sparkling enamel of its inner walls, sprinkled all over with mica-rich dust. Ned Land tapped these walls and tried to probe their thickness. I couldn't help smiling. Our conversation then turned to his everlasting escape plans, and without going too far, I felt I could offer him this hope. Captain Nemo had gone down south only to replenish his sodium supplies, so I hoped he would now hug the coasts of Europe and America, 
which would allow the Canadian to try again with a greater chance of success. We were stretched out in this delightful cave for an hour. Our conversation, lively at the onset, then languished. A definite drowsiness overcame us. Since I saw no good reason to resist the call of sleep, I fell into a heavy doze. I dreamed, one doesn't choose his dreams, that my life had been reduced to the vegetating existence of a simple mollusk. It seemed to me that this cave made up my double-valve shell. Suddenly, Corset's voice startled me awake. Get up! Get up! shouted the fine lad. What is it? I asked. In a sitting position, the water's coming up to us. I got back on my feet. Like a torrent, the sea was rushing into our retreat, and since we definitely were not mollusks, we had to clear out. In a few seconds, we were safe on top of the cave. What happened? Conse asked. Some new phenomenon? Not quite, my friends, I replied. It was the tide, merely the tide, which well nigh caught us by surprise, just as it did Sir Walter Scott's hero. The ocean outside is rising, and by a perfectly natural law of balance, the level of this lake is also rising. We've gotten off with a mild dunking. Let's go change clothes on the Nautilus. Three quarters of an hour later, we had completed our circular stroll and were back on board. Just then, the crewmen finished loading the sodium supplies, and the Nautilus could have departed immediately. But Captain Nemo gave no orders. Would he wait for nightfall and exit through his underwater passageway in secrecy? Perhaps. But that as it may, by the next day the Nautilus had left its home port and was navigating well out from any shore, a few meters beneath the waves of the Atlantic. Chapter 36 The Sargasso Sea The Nautilus didn't change direction. For the time being, then, we had to set aside any hope of returning to European seas. Captain Nemo kept his prow pointing south. Where was he taking us? I was afraid to guess. That day the Nautilus crossed an odd part of the Atlantic Ocean. No one is unaware of the existence of that great warm water current, known by the name as the Gulf Stream. After emerging from channels off Florida... It heads toward Spitsbergen. But before entering the Gulf of Mexico near latitude 44 degrees north, this current divides into two arms. Its chief arm makes for the shores of Ireland and Norway, while the second flexes southward at the level of the Azores. Then it hits the coast of Africa, sweeps in a long oval, and returns to the Caribbean Sea. Now then, this second arm, more accurately a collar, forms a ring of warm water around a section of cool, tranquil, motionless ocean called the Sargasso Sea. This is an actual lake in the open Atlantic, and the great current's waters take at least three years to circle it. Properly speaking, the Sargasso Sea covers every submerged part of Atlantis. Certain authors have even held that the many weeds strewn over this sea were torn loose from the prairies of that ancient continent, but it's more likely that these grasses, algae, and fucus plants were carried off from the beaches of Europe and America, then taken as far as this zone by the Gulf Stream. This is one of the reasons why Christopher Columbus assumed the existence of a new world. When the ships on that bold investigator arrived in the Sargasso Sea, they had great difficulty navigating in the midst of these weeds, which, much to their cruiser's dismay, slowed them down to a halt, and they wasted three long weeks crossing this sector. Such was the region our Nautilus was visiting just then, a genuine prairie, a tightly woven carpet of algae, gulfweed, and bladder rack so dense and compact a craft's stem post couldn't tear through it without difficulty. Accordingly, not wanting to entangle his propeller in this weed-choked mass, Captain Nemo stayed at a depth some meters below the surface of the waves. The name Sargasso comes from the Spanish word Sargasso, meaning gulfweed. This gulfweed, the swimming gulfweed or berry carrier, is the chief substance making up this immense shoal. And here's why these water plants collect in this placid Atlantic basin, according to the expert on the subject, Commander Murray, author of The Physical Geography of the Sea. 
The explanation he gives seems to entail a set of conditions that everybody knows. Now, Murray says, if bits of cork or chaff of any floating substance be put into a basin and a circular motion be given to the water, all the light substances will be found crowding together near the centre of the pool, where there is the least motion. Just such a basin is the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf Stream, and the Sargasso Sea is the centre of the whirl. I share Murray's view, and I was able to study the phenomenon in this exclusive setting where ships rarely go. Above us, huddled among the brown weeds, there floated objects originating from all over, tree trunks ripped from the Rocky Mountains or the Andes and sent floating down the Amazon or the Mississippi. Numerous pieces of wreckage, remnants of keels or undersides, bulwarks staved in and so weighed down with seashells and barnacles, they couldn't rise to the surface of the ocean. And the passing years will some day bear out Murray's other view that by collecting in this way over the centuries, these substances will be turned to stone by the action of the waters and will then form inexhaustible coal fields, valuable reserves prepared by far-seeing nature for that time when man will have exhausted his mines on the continents. In the midst of this hopelessly tangled fabric of weeds and fucus plants, I noted some delightful pink-coloured star-shaped Alcyon coral, sea anemone trailing the long tresses of their tentacles, some green, red, and blue jellyfish, and especially those big rhizostome jellyfish that Cuvier described, whose bluish parasols are trimmed with violet festoons. We spent the whole day of February 22 in the Sargasso Sea, where fish that dote on marine plants and crustaceans find plenty to eat. The next day the ocean resumed its usual appearance. From this moment on, for nineteen days from February 23 to March 12, the Nautilus stayed in the middle of the Atlantic, hustling us along at a constant speed of one hundred leagues every twenty-four hours. It was obvious that Captain Nemo wanted to carry out his underwater program, and I had no doubt that he intended, after doubling Cape Horn, to return to the Pacific South Seas. So Ned Land had good reason to worry. In these wide seas empty of islands, it was no longer feasible to jump ship. Nor did we have any way to counter Captain Nemo's whims. We had no choice but to acquiesce. But if we couldn't attain our inn through force or cunning, I liked to think we might achieve it through persuasion. Once this voyage was over, might not Captain Nemo consent to set us free in return for our promise never to reveal his existence? Our word of honour which we sincerely would have kept. However, this delicate question would have to be negotiated with the captain, but how would he receive our demands for freedom? At the very outset, and in no uncertain terms, hadn't he declared that the secret of his life required that we be permanently imprisoned on board the Nautilus? Wouldn't he see my four-month silence as a tacit acceptance of this situation? Would my returning to the subject arouse suspicions that could jeopardize our escape plans, if we had promising circumstances for trying again later on? I weighed all these considerations, turned them over in my mind, submitted them to Conseil, but he was as baffled as I was. In short, although I'm not easily discouraged, I realize that my chances of ever seeing my fellow men again were shrinking by the day especially at a time when Captain Nemo was recklessly racing toward the South Atlantic. During those nineteen days just mentioned, no unique incidents distinguished our voyage. I saw little of the captain. He was at work. In the library I often found books he had left open, especially books on natural history. He had thumbed through my work on the great ocean depths, and the margins were covered with his notes, which sometimes contradicted my theories and formulations but the captain remained content with this method of refining my work, and he rarely discussed it with me. Sometimes I heard melancholy sounds reverberating from the organ, which he played very expressively, but only at night, in the midst of the most secretive darkness, while the Nautilus slumbered in the wilderness of the ocean. During this part of our voyage, we navigated on the surface of the waves for entire days. The sea was nearly deserted, a few sailing ships laden for the East Indies were heading toward the Cape of Good Hope. 
One day we were chased by the longboats of a whaling vessel, which undoubtedly viewed us as some enormous baleen whale of great value. But Captain Nemo didn't want these gallant gentlemen wasting their time and energy, so he ended the hunt by diving beneath the waters. This incident seemed to fascinate Ned Land intensely. I'm sure the Canadian was sorry that these fishermen couldn't harpoon our sheet-iron cetacean and mortally wounded. During this period, the fish Conseil and I observed differed little from those we had already studied in other latitudes. Chief among them were specimens of that dreadful cartilaginous genus that divided into three subgenera, numbering at least thirty-two species. Striped sharks five meters long, the head squat and wider than the body, the caudal fin curved, the back with seven big black parallel lines running lengthwise, the pearland sharks, ash gray, pierced with seven gill openings, furnished with a single dorsal fin placed almost exactly in the middle of the body. Some big dogfish also passed by, a voracious species of shark if there ever was one. With some justice, fishermen's yarns aren't to be trusted, but here's what a few of them relate. Inside the corpse of one of these animals, there were found a buffalo head and a whole calf. In another, two tuna and a sailor in uniform, and yet another, a soldier with his saber. In another, finally, a horse with its rider. In Kandur, none of these sounds like divinely inspired truth. But the fact remains that not a single dogfish let itself get caught in the Nautilus's nets, so I can't vouch for their veracity. Schools of elegant, playful dolphins swam alongside for entire days. They went in groups of five or six, hunting in packs like wolves over the countryside. Moreover, they're just as voracious as dogfish, if I can believe a certain Copenhagen professor, who says that, from one dolphin's stomach, he removed thirteen porpoises and fifteen seals. True, it was a killer whale, belonging to the biggest known species, whose length sometimes exceeds twenty-four feet. The family Delphinia numbers ten genera, and the dolphins I saw were akin to the genus Delphinorhynchus, remarkable for an extremely narrow muzzle, four times as long as the cranium. Measuring three meters, their bodies were black on top, underneath a pinkish-white strewn with small, very scattered spots. From these seas I'll also mention some unusual specimens of croakers, a fish from the order Acanthopterygia, family Cyanidae. Some authors, more artistic than scientific, claim that these fish are melodious singers, that their voices in unison put on concerts unmatched by human choristers. I don't say nay, but to my regret these croakers didn't serenade us as we passed. Finally, to conclude, Conseil classified a large number of flying fish. Nothing could have made a more unusual sight than the marvellous timing with which dolphins hunt these fish. Whatever the range of its flight, however evasive its trajectory, even up and over the Nautilus, the hapless flying fish always found a dolphin to welcome it with open mouth. These were either flying gurnards or kite-like sea robins, whose lips glowed in the dark, at night scrawling fiery streaks in the air before plunging into the murky waters like so many shooting stars. Our navigating continued under these conditions until March 13. That day the Nautilus was put to work in some depth-sounding experiments that fascinated me deeply. By then, we had fared nearly 13,000 leagues from our starting point in the Pacific high seas. Our position fix placed us in latitude 45 degrees 37 south and longitude 37 degrees 53 west. These were the same waterways where Captain Dinham aboard the Herald paved out 14,000 meters of sounding line without finding bottom. It was here, too, that Lieutenant Parker, aboard the American frigate Congress, was unable to reach the underwater soil at 15,149 meters. Captain Nemo decided to take his Nautilus down to the lowest depths in order to double-check these different soundings. I got ready to record the results of this experiment. The panels in the lounge opened, and maneuvers began for reaching those strata so prodigiously far removed. It was apparently considered out of the question to die by filling the ballast tanks. Perhaps they wouldn't sufficiently increase the Nautilus's specific gravity. Moreover, in order to come back up, it would be necessary to expel the excess water, and our pumps might not have been strong enough to overcome the outside pressure. 
Captain Nemo decided to make for the ocean floor by submerging on an appropriately gradual diagonal with the help of his side fins, which were set at a 45-degree angle to the Nautilus's waterline. Then the propeller was brought to its maximum speed, and its four blades churned the waves with indescribable violence. Under this powerful thrust, the Nautilus's hull quivered like a resonating cord, and the ship sank steadily under the waters. Stationed in the lounge, the captain and I watched the needle swerving swiftly over the pressure gauge. Soon we had gone below the livable zone where most fish reside. Some of these animals can thrive only at the surface of the seas or rivers, but a minority can dwell at fairly great depths. Among the latter I observed a species of dogfish called the cow shark that's equipped with six respiratory slits, the telescope fish with its enormous eyes, the armoured gurnard with grey thoracic fins plus black pectoral fins, and the breastplate protected by pale red slabs of bone. Then finally the grenadier, living at a depth of 1,200 metres, by that point tolerating a pressure of 120 atmospheres. I asked Captain Nemo if he had observed any fish at more considerable depths. Fish? Rarely, he answered me. But, given the current state of marine science, who are we to presume? What do we really know about these depths? Just this, Captain. In going toward the ocean's lower strata, we know that vegetable life disappears more quickly than animal life. We know that moving creatures can still be encountered where water plants no longer grow. We know that oysters and pilgrim scallops live in 2,000 meters of water, and that Admiral McClintock, England's hero of the polar seas, pulled in a live sea star from a depth of 2,500 meters. We know that the crew of the Royal Navy's bulldog fished up a starfish from 2,620 fathoms, hence from a depth of more than one vertical league. Would you still say, Captain Nemo, that we really know nothing? No, Professor, the captain replied. I wouldn't be so discourteous. Yet I'll ask you to explain how these creatures can live at such depths. I'll explain it on two grounds, I replied. In the first place, because vertical currents, which are caused by differences in the water's salinity and density can produce enough motion to sustain the rudimentary lifestyles of sea lilies and starfish. True, the captain put in. In the second place, because oxygen is the basis of life, and we know that the amount of oxygen dissolved in salt water increases rather than decreases with depth, that the pressure in these lower strata helps to concentrate their oxygen content. Oh, we know that, do we? Captain Nemo replied in a tone of mild surprise. Well, Professor, we have good reason to know it, because it's the truth. I might add, in fact, that the air bladders of fish contain more nitrogen than oxygen. When these animals are caught at the surface of the water, and conversely, more oxygen than nitrogen when they're pulled up from the lower depths. Which bears out your formulation. But let's continue our observations. My eyes flew back to the pressure gauge. The instrument indicated a depth of 6,000 meters. Our submergence had been going on for an hour. The Nautilus slid downward on its slanting fin, still sinking. These deserted waters were wonderfully clear, with a transparency impossible to convey. An hour later we were at 13,000 meters, about three and a quarter vertical leagues, and the ocean floor was nowhere in sight. However... At 14,000 meters, I saw blackish peaks rising in the midst of the waters, but these summits could have belonged to mountains as high, or even higher than the Himalayas or Mont Blanc, and the extent of these depths remained incalculable. Despite the powerful pressure it was undergoing, the Nautilus sank still deeper. I could feel its sheet iron plates trembling down to their riveted joins. Metal bars arched, bulkheads groaned, the lounge windows seemed to be warping inward under the water's pressure, and this whole sturdy mechanism would surely have given way if, as its captain had said, it weren't capable of resisting like a solid block. While grazing these rocky slopes lost under the waters, I still spotted some seashells, tube worms, lively annelid worms from the genus Spirorbus, and certain starfish specimens. 
But soon these last representatives of animal life vanished, and three vertical leagues down the Nautilus passed below the limits of underwater existence, just as an air balloon rises above the breathable zones in the sky. We reached a depth of 16,000 meters, four vertical leagues, and by then the Nautilus's plating was tolerating a pressure of 1,600 atmospheres. In other words, 1,600 kilograms per each square centimeter on its surface. What an experience, I exclaimed, traveling these deep regions where no man has ever ventured before. Look, Captain, look at these magnificent rocks, these uninhabited caves, these last global haunts where life is no longer possible. What unheard of scenery, and why are we reduced to preserving it only as a memory? Would you like, Captain Nemo asked me, to bring back more than just a memory? What do you mean? I mean that nothing could be easier than taking a photograph of this underwater region. Before I had time to express the surprise that this new proposition caused me, a camera was carried into the lounge at Captain Nemo's request. The liquid setting, electrically lit, unfolded with perfect clarity through the wide-open panels. No shadows, no blurs, thanks to our artificial light. Not even sunshine could have been better for our purposes. With the thrust of its propeller curved by the slant of its fins, the Nautilus stood still. The camera was aimed at the scenery on the ocean floor, and in a few seconds we had a perfect negative. I attach a print of the positive. In it you can view these primordial rocks that have never seen the light of day. This neither granite that forms the powerful foundations of our globe, the deep caves cut into the stony mass, the outlines of incomparable distinctness, whose far edges stand out in black as if from the brush of certain Flemish painters. In the distance is a mountainous horizon, a wondrously undulating line that makes up the background of this landscape. The general effect of these smooth rocks is indescribable. Black polished without moss or other blemish, carved into strange shapes, sitting firmly on a carpet of sand that sparkled beneath our streams of electric light. Meanwhile, his photographic operations over, Captain Nemo told me, Let's go back up, Professor. We mustn't push our luck and expose the Nautilus too long to these pressures. Let's go back up, I replied. Hold on tight. Before I had time to realize why the captain made this recommendation, I was hurled to the carpet. Its fin set vertically, its propeller thrown in gear at the captain's signal, the Nautilus rose with lightning speed, shooting upward like an air balloon into the sky. Vibrating resonantly, it knifed through the watery mass. Not a single detail was visible. In four minutes it had cleared the four vertical leagues, separating it from the surface of the ocean, and after emerging like a flying fish, it fell back into the sea, making the waves leap to prodigious heights. Chapter 37 The Ice Bank The Nautilus resumed its unruffled southbound heading. It went along the 50th meridian with considerable speed. Would it go to the pole? I didn't think so, because every previous attempt to reach this spot of the globe had failed. Besides, the season was already quite advanced, since March 13 on Antarctic shores corresponds with September 13 in the northernmost regions, which marks the beginning of the equinoctial period. On March 14, at latitude 55 degrees, I spotted floating ice, plain, pale bits of rubble 20 to 25 feet long, which formed reefs over which the sea burst into foam. The Nautilus stayed on the surface of the ocean. Having fished in the Arctic seas, Ned Land was already familiar with the sight of icebergs. Conseil and I were marveling at them for the first time. In the sky toward the southern horizon, there stretched a dazzling white band. English whalers have given this the name Ice Bank. No matter how heavy the clouds may be, they can't obscure this phenomenon. It announces the presence of a pack or shoal of ice. Indeed, larger blocks of ice soon appeared, their brilliance varying at the whim of the mists. Some of these masses displayed green veins, as if scrawled with undulating lines of copper sulfate. 
Others looked like enormous amethysts, letting the light penetrate their insides. The latter reflected the sun's rays from the thousand facets of their crystals. The former, tinted with a bright limestone sheen, would have supplied enough building material to make a whole marble town. The farther down south we went, the more these floating islands grew in numbers and prominence. Polar birds nested on them by the thousands. These were petrels, cape pigeons or puffins, and their calls were deafening. Mistaking the nautilus for the corpse of a whale, some of them alighted on it and prodded its resonant sheet iron with pecks of their beaks. During this navigating in the midst of the ice, Captain Nemo often stayed on the platform. He observed these deserted waterways carefully. I saw his calm eyes sometimes perk up in these polar seas forbidden to man. Did he feel right at home, the lord of these unreachable regions? Perhaps. But he didn't say. He stood still, reviving only when his pilot's instincts took over. Then, steering his nautilus with consummate dexterity, he skillfully dodged the masses of ice, some of which measured several miles in length, their heights varying from seventy to eighty meters. Often, the horizon seemed completely closed off. Abreast of latitude sixty degrees, every passageway had disappeared. Searching with care, Captain Nemo soon found a narrow opening into which he brazenly slipped, well aware, however, that it would close behind him. Guided by his skillful hands, the Nautilus passed by all these different masses of ice, which are classified by size and shape, with the precision that enraptured Conseil. Icebergs or mountains, ice fields or smooth, limitless tracks, drift ice or floating flows, Packs or broken tracts, called patches when they're circular, and streams when they form long strips. The temperature was fairly low. Exposed to the outside air, the thermometer marked negative two degrees and negative three degrees centigrade. But we were warmly dressed in furs, for which seals and aquatic bears had paid the price. Evenly heated by all its electric equipment, the Nautilus's interior defied the most intense cold. Moreover, to find a bearable temperature, the ship had only to sink just a few meters beneath the waves. Two months earlier, we would have enjoyed perpetual daylight in this latitude, but night already fell for three or four hours, and later it would cast six months of shadow over these circumpolar regions. On March 15, we passed beyond the latitude of the South Shetland and South Orkney Islands. The captain told me that many tribes of seals used to inhabit these shores, but English and American whalers, in a frenzy of destruction, slaughtered all the adults, including penguin females, and where life and activity once existed, those fishermen left behind only silence and death. Going along the 55th meridian, the Nautilus cut the Antarctic Circle on March 16, near 8 o'clock in the morning. Ice completely surrounded us and closed off the horizon. Nevertheless, Captain Nemo went from passageway to passageway, always proceeding south. But where's he going, I asked. Straight ahead, Conseil replied. Ultimately, when he can't go any farther, he'll stop. I wouldn't bet on it, I replied. And in all honesty, I confess that this venturesome excursion was far from displeasing to me. I can't express the intensity of my amazement at the beauties of these new regions. The eye struck superb poses. Here, its general effect suggested an oriental town with countless mirinets and mosques. There, a city in ruins, flung to the ground by convulsions in the earth. These views were varied continuously by the sun's oblique rays, and were completely swallowed up by grey mists in the middle of blizzards. Then explosions, cave-ins, and great icebergs, somersaults, would occur all around us, altering the scenery like the changing landscape in a diorama. If the Nautilus was submerged during these losses of balance, we heard the resulting noises spread under the waters with frightful intensity, and the collapse of these masses created daunting eddies down to the ocean's lower strata. The Nautilus then rolled and pitched like a ship left to the fury of the elements. Often, no longer seeing any way out, I thought we were imprisoned for good, but Captain Nemo, guided by his instincts, discovered new passageways from the tiniest indications. 
He was never wrong when he observed slender threads of bluish water streaking through these ice fields. Accordingly, I was sure that he had already risked his Nautilus in the midst of the Antarctic seas. However, during the day of March 16, these tracks of ice completely barred our path. It wasn't the ice bank as yet, just huge ice fields cemented together by the cold. This obstacle couldn't stop Captain Nemo, and he launched his ship against the ice fields with hideous violence. The Nautilus went into these brittle masses like a wedge, splitting them with dreadful cracklings. It was an old-fashioned battering ram, propelled with infinite power. Hurled aloft, ice rubble fell back around us like hail. Through brute force alone, the submersible carved out a channel for itself. Carried away by its momentum, the ship sometimes mounted on top of these tracks of ice and crushed them with its weight. Or at other times, when cooped up beneath the ice fields, it split them with simple pitching movements, creating wide punctures. Violent squalls assaulted us during the daytime. Thanks to certain heavy mists, we couldn't see from one end of the platform to the other. The wind shifted abruptly to every point on the compass. The snow was piling up in such packed layers, it had to be chipped loose with blows from picks. Even in a temperature of merely negative five degrees centigrade, every outside part of the Nautilus was covered with ice. A ship's rigging would have been unusable, because all its tackle would have jammed in the grooves of the pulleys. Only a craft without sails, driving by an electric motor that needed no coal, could face such high latitudes. Under these conditions, the barometer generally stayed quite low. It fell as far as 73.5 centimeters. Our compass indications no longer offered any guarantees. The deranged needles would mark contradictory directions as we approached the southern magnetic pole, which doesn't coincide with the southern pole proper. In fact, according to the astronomer Hanstein, this magnetic pole is located fairly close to the latitude 70 degrees and longitude 130 degrees or abiding by the observations of Lui Isidore du Perry in longitude 135 degrees and latitude 70 degrees 30. Hence we had to transport compasses to different parts of the ship, take many readings, and strike an average. Often we could chart our course only by guesswork, a less than satisfactory method in the midst of these winding passageways whose landmarks change continuously. At last, on March 18, after twenty futile assaults, the Nautilus was decisively held in check. No longer was it an ice stream, patch, or field. It was an endless, immovable barrier formed by ice mountains fused to each other. The Ice Bank, the Canadian told me. For Ned Land, as well as for every navigator before us, I knew that this was the great insurmountable obstacle. When the sun appeared for an instant near noon... Captain Nemo took a reasonably accurate sight that gave our position as longitude 51 degrees 30 and latitude 76 degrees 39 south. This was a position already well along in these Antarctic regions. As for the liquid surface of the sea, there was no longer any semblance of it before our eyes. Before the Nautilus's spur there lay vast broken plains, a tangle of confused chunks with all the helter-skelter unpredictably typical of a river's surface a short while before its ice break up. But in this case the proportions were gigantic. Here and there stood sharp peaks, lean spires that rose as high as two hundred feet farther off, a succession of steeply cut cliffs sporting a greyish tint, huge mirrors that reflected the sparse rays of a sun half drowned in mist. Beyond, a stark silence reigned in this desolate natural setting, a silence barely broken by the flapping wings of petrels or puffins. By this point everything was frozen, even sound. So the Nautilus had to halt in its venturesome course among these tracks of ice. Sir, Ned Land told me that day, if your captain goes any farther, yes? He'll be a superman. How so, Ned? Because nobody can clear the ice bank. Your captain's a powerful man, but damnation, he isn't more powerful than nature. If she draws a boundary line, there you stop, like it or not. Correct, Ned Land, but I still want to know what's behind this ice bank. Behold my greatest source of irritation, a wall. Master is right, Conseil said. Walls were invented simply to frustrate scientists. All walls should be banned. 
Fine. The Canadian put in. But we already know what's behind this ice bank. What? I asked. Ice. Ice. And more ice. You may be sure of that, Ned, I answered. But I'm not. That's why I want to see for myself. Well, Professor, the Canadian replied. You can just drop that idea. You've made it to the ice bank, which is already far enough. But you won't get any farther, neither your Captain Nemo or his Nautilus. And whether he wants to or not, will head north again, in other words, to the land of sensible people. I had to agree that Ned Land was right, and until ships are built to navigate over tracks of ice, they'll have to stop at the ice bank. Indeed, despite its efforts, despite the powerful methods it used to split this ice, the Nautilus was reduced to immobility. Ordinarily, when someone can't go any farther, he still has the option of returning in his tracks. But here, it was just as impossible to turn back as to go forward, because every passageway had closed behind us, and if our submersible remained even slightly stationary, it would be frozen in without delay. Which is exactly what happened near two o'clock in the afternoon, and fresh ice kept forming over the ship's sides with astonishing speed. I had to admit that Captain Nemo's leadership had been most injudicious. Just then I was on the platform, observing the situation for some while. The captain said to me, Well, Professor, what think you? I think we're trapped, Captain. Trapped? What do you mean? I mean we can't go forward, backward, or sideways. I think that's the standard definition of trapped, at least in the civilized world. So, Professor Achona, you think the Nautilus won't be able to float clear? Only with the greatest difficulty, Captain, since the season is already too advanced for you to depend on a nice breakup. Oh, Professor. Captain Nemo replied in an ironic tone. You never change. You see only impediments and obstacles. I promise you, not only will the Nautilus float clear, it will go farther still. Farther south, I asked, gaping at the captain. Yes, sir. It will go to the pole. To the pole, I exclaimed, unable to keep back a movement of disbelief. Yes, the captain replied coolly. The Antarctic Pole, that unknown spot crossed by every meridian on the globe. As you know, I do whatever I like with my Nautilus. Yes, I did know that. I knew this man was daring to the point of being foolhardy. But to overcome all the obstacles around the South Pole, even more unattainable than the North Pole, which still hadn't been reached by the boldest navigators, wasn't this an absolutely insane undertaking, one that could occur only in the brain of a madman? It then dawned on me to ask Captain Nemo if he had already discovered this pole, which no human being had ever trod underfoot. No, sir, he answered me. But we'll discover it together. Where others have failed, I'll succeed. Never before has my Nautilus cruised so far into these southernmost seas, but I repeat, it will go farther still. I'd like to believe you, Captain, I went on in a tone of sarcasm. Oh, I do believe you. Let's forge ahead. There are no obstacles for us. Let's shatter this ice bank. Let's blow it up. And if it still resists, let's put wings on the Nautilus and fly over it. Over it, Professor? Captain Nemo replied serenely. No, not over it, but under it. Under it, I exclaimed. A sudden insight into Captain Nemo's plan had just flashed through my mind. I understood. The marvelous talents of his Nautilus would be put to work once again in this superhuman undertaking. I can see we're starting to understand each other, Professor. Captain Nemo told me with half a smile. You already glimpse the potential. Myself, I'd say the success of this attempt. Maneuvers that aren't feasible for an ordinary ship are easy for the Nautilus. If a continent emerges at the pole, we'll stop at that continent. But on the other hand, if open sea washes the pole, we'll go to that very place. Right, I said, carried away by the captain's logic. Even though the surface of the sea has solidified into ice, its lower strata are still open, 
thanks to that divine justice that puts the maximum density of salt water one degree above its freezing point. And if I'm not mistaken, the submerged part of this ice bank is in a four to one ratio to its emerging part. Very nearly, Professor. For each foot of iceberg above the sea, there are three more below. Now then, since these ice mountains don't exceed a height of 100 meters, they sink only to a depth of 300 meters. And what are 300 meters to the Nautilus? A mere nothing, sir. We could even go to greater depths and find that temperature layer common to all ocean water, and there we'd brave with impunity the negative 30 degrees or negative 40 degrees cold on the surface. True, sir. Very true, I replied with growing excitement. Our sole difficulty, Captain Nemo went on, lies in our staying submerged for several days without renewing our air supply. That's all, I answered. The Nautilus has huge air tanks. We'll fill them up, and they'll supply all the oxygen we need. Good thinking, Professor Achona, the captain replied with a smile. But since I don't want to be accused of foolhardiness, I'm giving you all my objections in advance. You have more? Just one. If a sea exists at the South Pole, it's possible this sea may be completely frozen over, so we couldn't come up to the surface. My dear sir, have you forgotten that the Nautilus is armed with a fearsome spur? Couldn't it be launched diagonally against those tracks of ice, which would break open from the impact? Ah, Professor... You're full of ideas today. Besides, Captain, I added with still greater enthusiasm, why wouldn't we find open sea at the South Pole just as at the North Pole? The cold temperature poles and the geographical poles don't coincide in either the Northern or Southern Hemispheres. And until proof to the contrary, we can assume these two spots on the Earth feature either a continent or an ice-free ocean. I think as you do, Professor Achona. Captain Nemo replied. I'll only point out that after raising so many objections against my plan, you're now crushing me under arguments in its favor. Captain Nemo was right. I was outdoing him in daring. It was I who was sweeping him to the pole. I was leading the way. I was out in front. But no, you silly fool. Captain Nemo already knew the pros and cons of this question, and it amused him to see you flying off into impossible fantasies. Nevertheless, he didn't waste an instant. At his signal, the chief officer appeared. The two men held a quick exchange in their incomprehensible language, and either the chief officer had been alerted previously, or he found the plan feasible, because he showed no surprise. But as emotional as he was, he couldn't have been more impeccably emotionless than Conseil when I told the fine lad our intention of pushing on to the South Pole. He greeted my announcement with the usual, as master wishes and I had to be content with that. As for Ned Land, no human shoulders ever executed a higher shrug than the pair belonging to our Canadian. Honestly, sir, he told me, you and your Captain Nemo, I pity you both. But we will go to the pole, Mr. Land, maybe. But you won't come back. And Ned Land re-entered his cabin, to keep from doing something desperate he said as he left me. Meanwhile, preparations for this daring attempt were getting underway. The Nautilus's powerful pumps forced air down into the tanks and stored it under high pressure. Near four o'clock, Captain Nemo informed me that the ice platform hatches were about to be closed. I took a last look at the dense ice bank we were going to conquer. The weather was fair, the skies reasonably clear, the cold quite brisk, namely negative twelve degrees centigrade. But after the wind had lulled, this temperature didn't seem too unbearable. Equipped with picks, some tin men climbed onto the Nautilus's sides and cracked loose the ice around the ship's lower plating, which was soon set free. This operation was swiftly executed because the fresh ice was still thin. We all re-entered the interior. The main ballast tanks were filled with the water that hadn't yet congealed at our line of flotation. The Nautilus submerged without delay. I took a seat in the lounge with Conseil. Through the open window we stared at the lower strata of this southernmost ocean. The thermometer rose again. The needle on the pressure gauge swerved over its dial. 
About three hundred meters down, just as Captain Nemo had predicted, we cruised beneath the undulating surface of the ice bank. But the Nautilus sank deeper still. It reached a depth of eight hundred meters. At the surface, this water gave a temperature of negative twelve degrees centigrade. But now it gave no more than negative ten degrees. Two degrees had already been gained. Thanks to its heating equipment, the Nautilus's temperature, needless to say, stayed at a much higher degree. Every maneuver was accomplished with extraordinary precision. With all due respect to Master, Conseil told me, we'll pass it by. I fully expect to, I replied in a tone of deep conviction. Now in open water, the Nautilus took a direct course to the pole without veering from the 52nd meridian. From 67 degrees 30 to 90 degrees, 22 and a half degrees of latitude were left across. In other words, slightly more than 500 leagues. The Nautilus adopted an average speed of 26 miles per hour, the speed of an express train. If it kept up this pace, 40 hours would do it for reaching the pole. For part of the night, the novelty of our circumstances kept Conseil and me at the lounge window. The sea was lit by our beacon's electric rays, but the depths were deserted. Fish didn't linger in these imprisoned waters. Here they found merely a passageway from going from the Antarctic Ocean to open sea at the pole. Our progress was swift. You could feel it in the vibrations of the long steel hull. Near two o'clock in the morning, I went to snatch a few hours of sleep. Conseil did likewise. I didn't encounter Captain Nemo while going down the gangways. I assumed that he was keeping to the pilot house. The next day, March 19 at five o'clock in the morning, I was back at my post in the lounge. The electric log indicated that the Nautilus had reduced speed. By then it was rising to the surface, but cautiously, while slowly emptying its ballast tanks. My heart was pounding. Would we emerge into the open and find the polar air again? No. A jolt told me that the Nautilus had bumped the underbelly of the ice bank, still quite thick to judge from the hollowness of the accompanying noise. Indeed, we had struck bottom, to use nautical terminology, but in the opposite direction, and at a depth of 3,000 meters. That gave us 4,000 feet of ice overhead, of which 1,000 feet emerged above water. So the ice bank was higher here than we had found it on the outskirts. A circumstance less than encouraging. Several times that day the Nautilus repeated the same experiment, and always it bumped against this surface that formed a ceiling above it. At certain moments the ship encountered ice at a depth of 900 meters, denoting a thickness of 1,200 meters, of which 300 meters rose above the level of the ocean. This height had tripled since the moment the Nautilus had dived beneath the waves. I meticulously noted these different depths, obtaining the underwater profile of this upside-down mountain chain that stretched beneath the sea. By evening there was still no improvement in our situation. The ice stayed between 400 and 500 meters deep. It was obviously shrinking, but what a barrier still lay between us and the surface of the ocean. By then it was eight o'clock. The air inside the Nautilus should have been renewed four hours earlier, following daily practice on board. But I didn't suffer very much, although Captain Nemo hadn't yet made demands on the supplementary oxygen in his air tanks. That night my sleep was fitful. Hope and fear besieged me by turns. I got up several times. The Nautilus continued groping. Near three o'clock in the morning, I observed that we encountered the ice bank's underbelly at a depth of only fifty meters. So only one hundred and fifty meters separated us from the surface of the water. Little by little, the ice bank was turning into an ice field again. The mountains were changing back into plains. My eyes didn't leave the pressure gauge. We kept rising on a diagonal, going along this shiny surface that sparkled beneath our electric rays. Above and below, the ice bank was subsiding in long gradients. Mile after mile, it was growing thinner. Finally, at six o'clock in the morning on that memorable day of March 19, the lounge door opened. Captain Nemo appeared. Open sea, he told me. Chapter 38 The South Pole I rushed up onto the platform. Yes, open sea! 
Barely a few sparse flows, some moving icebergs, a sea stretching into the distance, hosts of birds in the air and myriads of fish under the waters, which varied from intense blue to olive green, depending on the depth. The thermometer marked three degrees centigrade. It was as if a comparative springtime had been locked up behind that ice bank, whose distant masses were outlined on the northern horizon. Are we at the pole? I asked the captain, my heart pounding. I've no idea, he answered me. At noon we'll fix our position. But will the sun show through this mist? I said, staring at the grayish sky. No matter how faintly it shines, it will be enough for me, the captain replied. To the south, ten miles from the Nautilus, a solitary islet rose to a height of two hundred meters. We proceeded toward it, but cautiously, because the sea could have been strewn with reefs. In an hour we had reached the islet. Two hours later we had completed a full circle around it. It measured four to five miles in circumference. A narrow channel separated it from a considerable shore, perhaps a continent whose limits we couldn't see. The existence of this shore seemed to bear out Commander Murray's hypotheses. In essence, this ingenious American has noted that between the South Pole and the 60th parallel, the sea is covered with floating ice of dimensions much greater than any found in the North Atlantic. From this fact he drew the conclusion that the Antarctic Circle must contain considerable shores, since icebergs can't form on the high seas but only along coastlines. According to his calculations, this frozen mass enclosing the southernmost pole forms a vast ice cap whose width must reach 4,000 kilometers. Meanwhile, to avoid running aground, the Nautilus halted three cable links from a strand crowned by superb piles of rocks. The skiff was launched to sea, two crewmen carrying instruments, the captain, Conseil, and I were on board. It was ten o'clock in the morning. I hadn't seen Ned land. No doubt, in the presence of the South Pole, the Canadian hated having to eat his words. A few strokes of the oar brought the skiff to the sand, where it ran aground. Just as Conseil was about to jump ashore, I held him back. Sir, I told Captain Nemo, to you belongs the honor of first setting foot on this shore. Yes, sir, the captain replied. And if I have no hesitation in treading this polar soil... It's because no human being until now has left a footprint here. So saying, he leapt lightly onto the sand. His heart must have been throbbing with intense excitement. He scaled an overhanging rock that ended in a small promontory, and there, mute and motionless, with crossed arms and blazing eyes, he seemed to be laying claim to these southernmost regions. After spending five minutes in this trance, he turned to us. Whenever you're ready, sir. He called to me. I got out, Conseil at my heels, leaving the two men in the skiff. Over an extensive area, the soil consisted of that igneous gravel called tuff, reddish in color as if made from crushed bricks. The ground was covered with slag, lava flows, and pumice stones. Its volcanic origin was unmistakable. In certain localities, thin smoke holes gave off a sulfurous odor, showing that the inner fire still kept their wide-ranging power. Nevertheless, when I scaled a high escarpment, I could see no volcanoes within a radius of several miles. In these Antarctic districts, as is well known, Sir James Clark Ross had found the craters of Mount Erebus and Mount Terror in fully active condition on the 167th meridian at latitude 77 degrees 32. The vegetation on this desolate continent struck me as quite limited. A few lichens of the species Usnea melanoxanthra sprawled over the black rocks. The whole meagre flora of this region consisted of certain microscopic buds, rudimentary diatoms made up of a type of cell positioned between two quartz-rich shells, plus long purple and crimson fucus plants buoyed by small air bladders and washed up on the coast by the surf. The beach was strewn with mollusks, small mussels, limpets, smooth heart-shaped cockles, and especially some sea butterflies with oblong membrane-filled bodies, whose heads are formed from two rounded lobes. I also saw myriads of those northernmost sea butterflies three centimeters long, 
which a baleen whale can swallow by the thousands in one gulp. The open waters at the shoreline were alive with these delightful pteropods, true butterflies of the sea. Among other zoophytes present in these shallows, there were a few coral tree forms that, according to Sir James Clark Ross, live in these Antarctic seas at depths as great as 1,000 meters. Then small Alcyon coral, belonging to the species Procellaria pelagica. Also a large number of starfish, unique to these climes, plus some feather stars spangling the sand. But it was in the air that life was superabundant. These various species of birds flew and fluttered by the thousands, deafening us with their calls. Crowding the rocks, other fowl watched without fear as we passed, and pressed familiarly against our feet. These were ox, as agile and supple in water, where they are sometimes mistaken for fast bonito, as they are clumsy and heavy on land. They uttered outlandish calls and participated in numerous public assemblies that featured much noise but little action. Among other fowl I noted some sheath-bills from the wadding bird family, the size of pigeons white in color, the beak short and conical, the eyes framed by red circles. Conseil laid in a supply of them, because when they are properly cooked, these winged creatures make a pleasant dish. In the air there passed sooty albatross with four-meter wingspans, birds aptly dubbed vultures of the ocean, also gigantic petrels, including several with arching wings, enthusiastic eaters of seal that are known as quebranta huesos, and cape pigeons, a sort of small duck, the tops of their bodies black and white. In short, a whole series of petrels, some whitish with wings trimmed in brown, others blue and exclusive to these Antarctic seas, the former so oily, I told Conseil, that inhabitants of the Faroe Islands simply fit the bird with a wick, then light it up. With that manner addition, Conseil replied, these fowl would make perfect lamps. After this, we should insist that nature equip them with wicks and advance. Half a mile farther on, the ground was completely riddled with pigeon nests, egg-laying burrows, from which numerous birds emerged. Later, Captain Nemo had hundreds of them hunted because their black flesh is highly edible. They braid like donkeys, the size of a goose with slate-colored bodies, white undersides, and lemon-colored neckbands. These animals let themselves be stoned to death without making any effort to get away. Meanwhile, the mists didn't clear, and by eleven o'clock the sun still hadn't made an appearance. Its absence disturbed me. Without it, no sights were possible. Then how could we tell whether we had reached the pole? When I rejoined Captain Nemo, I found him leaning silently against a piece of rock and staring at the sky. He seemed impatient, baffled. But what could we do? This daring and powerful man couldn't control the sun as he did the sea. Noon arrived without the orb of day appearing for a single instant. You couldn't even find its hiding place behind the curtain of mist, and soon this mist began to condense into snow. Until tomorrow, the captain said simply, and we went back to the Nautilus amid flurries in the air. During our absence the nets had been spread, and I observed with fascination the fish just hauled on board. The Antarctic seas serve as a refuge for an extremely large number of migratory fish that flee from storms in the subpolar zones, in truth, only to slide down the gullets of porpoises and seals. I noted some one decimeter southern bullhead, a species of whitish, cartilaginous fish overrun with bluish-gray stripes and armed with stings, then some Antarctic rabbit fish three feet long, the body very slender, the skin a smooth silver white, the head rounded, the top side furnished with three fins, the snout ending in a trunk that curved back toward the mouth. I sampled its flesh, but found it tasteless, despite Conseil's views, which were largely approving. The blizzard lasted until the next day. It was impossible to stay on the platform. From the lounge where I was writing up the incidents of this excursion to the polar continent, I could hear the call of petrel and albatross cavorting in the midst of the turmoil. The Nautilus didn't stay idle, and cruising along the coast it advanced some ten miles farther south amid the half-light left by the sun as it skimmed the edge of the horizon. 
The next day, March 20, it stopped snowing. The cold was a little more brisk. The thermometer marked negative two degrees centigrade. The mist had cleared, and on that day I hoped our noon sights could be accomplished. Since Captain Nemo hadn't yet appeared, only Conseil and I were taken ashore by the skiff. The soil's nature was still the same. Volcanic. Traces of lava, slag, and basaltic rock were everywhere, but I couldn't find the crater that had vomited them up. There as yonder, myriads of birds enlivened this part of the polar continent, but they had to share their dominion with huge herds of marine mammals that looked at us with gentle eyes. These were seals of various species, some stretched out on the ground, others lying on drifting ice floes, several leaving or re-entering the sea. Having never dealt with man, they didn't run off at our approach, and I counted enough of them thereabouts to provision a couple hundred ships. Ye gods, Conseil said, it's fortunate that Ned Land didn't come with us. Why so, Conseil? Because that madcap hunter would kill every animal here. Every animal may be overstating it, but in truth, I doubt we could keep our Canadian friend from harpooning some of these magnificent cetaceans. Which would be an affront to Captain Nemo, since he hates to slay harmless beasts needlessly. He's right. Certainly, Conseil. But tell me, haven't you finished classifying these superb specimens of marine fauna? Master is well aware, Conseil replied, that I am not seasoned in practical application. When Master has told me these animals' names, their seals and walruses. To genera, our scholarly Conseil hastened to say, that belong to the family Pinepedia, or the Carnivora, group Unguiculata, subclass Monodelphia, class Mammalia, branch Vertebrata. Very nice, Conseil, I replied, but these two genera of seals and walruses are each divided into species, and if I'm not mistaken, we now have a chance to actually look at them. Let's. It was eight o'clock in the morning. We had four hours to ourselves before the sun could be productively observed. I guided our steps toward a huge bay that made a crescent-shaped incision in the granite cliff along the beach. There, all about us, I swear that the shores and ice floes were crowded with marine mammals as far as the eye could see and I involuntarily looked around for old Proteus, that mythological shepherd who guarded King Neptune's immense flocks. To be specific, these were seals. They formed distinct male and female groups, the father watching over his family, the mother suckling her little ones, the stronger youngsters emancipated a few paces away. When these mammals wanted to relocate, they moved in little jumps made by contracting their bodies, clumsily helped by their imperfectly developed flippers, which, as with their manatee relatives, form actual forearms. In the water, their ideal element, I must say these animals swim wonderfully thanks to their flexible backbones, narrow pelvises, close-cropped hair, and webbed feet. Resting on shore, they assumed extremely graceful positions. Consequently, their gentle features, their sensitive expressions equal to those of the loveliest women, their soft, limpid eyes, their charming poses led the ancients to glorify them by metamorphosing the males into sea gods and the females into mermaids. I drew Conseil's attention to the considerable growth of the cerebral lobes found in these intelligent cetaceans. No mammal except man has more abundant cerebral matter. Accordingly, seals are quite capable of being educated. They make good pets, and together with certain other naturalists, I think these animals can be properly trained to perform yeoman service as hunting dogs for fishermen. Most of these seals were sleeping on the rocks or the sand. Among those properly termed seals, which have no external ears, unlike sea lions whose ears protrude, I observed several varieties of the species Stenorhynchus, three meters long, with white hair, bulldog heads, and armed with tin teeth in each jaw. Four incisors in both the upper and lower, plus two big canines shaped like the fleur de lis. Among them slithered some sea elephants, a type of seal with a short, flexible trunk. These are the giants of the species, with a circumference of twenty feet and a length of ten meters. They didn't move as we approached. Are these animals dangerous? Conseil asked me. Only if they're attacked, I replied. 
But when these giant seals defend their little ones, their fury is dreadful. And it isn't rare for them to smash a fisherman's longboat to bits. They're within their rats, Conseil answered. I don't say nay. Two miles farther on, we were stopped by a promontory that screened the bay from southerly winds. It dropped straight down to the sea, and surf foamed against it. From beyond this ridge there came fearsome bellows, such as a herd of cattle might produce. Gracious, Conseil put in, a choir of bulls? No, I said, a choir of walruses. Are they fighting with each other? Either fighting or playing. With all due respect to master, this we must see. Then see it we must, Conseil. And there we were, climbing these blackish rocks amid sudden landslides and over stones slippery with ice. More than once I took a tumble at the expense of my backside. Conseil, more cautious or more stable, barely faltered and would help me up saying, If master's legs would kindly adopt a wider stance, master will keep his balance. Arriving at the topmost ridge of this promontory, I could see vast white plains covered with walruses. These animals were playing among themselves. They were howling not in anger but in glee. Walruses resemble seals in the shape of their bodies and the arrangement of their limbs, but their lower jaws lack canines and incisors, and as for their upper canines they consist of two tusks, eighty centimeters long with a circumference of thirty-three centimeters at the socket. Made of solid ivory, without striations, harder than elephant tusks, and less prone to yellowing, these teeth are in great demand. Accordingly, walruses are the victims of a mindless hunting that will soon destroy them all, since their hunters indiscriminately slaughter pregnant females and youngsters, and over four thousand individuals are destroyed annually. Passing near these unusual animals, I could examine them at my leisure, since they didn't stir. Their hides were rough and heavy, a tan color, leaning towards a reddish brown. Their coats were short and less than abundant. Some were four meters long. More tranquil and less fearful than their northern relatives, they posed no sentinels on guard duty at the approaches to their campsite. After examining this community of walruses, I decided to return in my tracks. It was eleven o'clock, and if Captain Nemo found conditions favorable for taking his sights, I wanted to be present at the operation. But I held no hopes that the sun would make an appearance that day. It was hidden from our eyes by clouds squeezed together on the horizon. Apparently the jealous orb didn't want to reveal this inaccessible spot on the globe to any human being. Yet I decided to return to the Nautilus. We went along a steep narrow path that ran over the cliff's summit. By 11.30 we had arrived at our landing place. The beached skiff had brought the captain ashore. I spotted him standing on a chunk of basalt. His instruments were beside him. His eyes were focused on the northern horizon, along which the sun was sweeping in its extended arc. I found a place near him and waited without speaking. Noon arrived, and just as on the day before, the sun didn't put in an appearance. It was sheer bad luck. Our noon sights were still lacking. If we couldn't obtain them tomorrow, we would finally have to give up any hope of fixing our position. In essence, it was precisely March 20. Tomorrow, the 21st, was the day of the equinox. The sun would disappear below the horizon for six months, not counting refraction, and after its disappearance the long polar night would begin. Following the September equinox, the sun had emerged above the northerly horizon, rising in long spirals until December 21. At that time, the summer solstice of these southernmost districts, the sun had started back down, and tomorrow it would cast its last rays. I shared my thoughts and fears with Captain Nemo. You're right, Professor Achona, he told me. If I can't take the sun's altitude tomorrow, I won't be able to try again for another six months. But precisely because sailor's luck has led me into these seas on March 21, it will be easy to get our bearings if the noonday sun does appear before our eyes. Why easy, Captain? Because when the orb of day sweeps in such long spirals, 
It's difficult to measure its exact altitude above the horizon, and our instruments are open to committing serious errors. Then what can you do? I use only my chronometer, Captain Nemo answered me. At noon tomorrow, March 21, if, after accounting for refraction, the sun's disk is cut exactly in half by the northern horizon, that will mean I'm at the South Pole. Right, I said. Nevertheless, it isn't mathematically exact proof, because the equinox needn't fall precisely at noon. No doubt, sir, but the error will be under 100 meters, and that's close enough for us. Until tomorrow, then. Captain Nemo went back on board. Conseil and I stayed behind until five o'clock, surveying the beach, observing and studying. The only unusual object I picked up was an ox egg of remarkable size, for which a collector would have paid more than a thousand pounds. Its cream-colored tint, plus the streaks and markings that decorated it like so many hieroglyphics, made it a rare trinket. I placed it in Conseil's hands, and holding it like precious porcelain from China, that cautious, sure-footed lad got it back to the Nautilus in one piece. There I put this rare egg inside one of the glass cases in the museum. I ate supper, feasting with appetite on an excellent piece of seal liver, whose flavor reminded me of pork. Then I went to bed, but not without praying, like a good Hindu, for the favors of the radiant orb. The next day, March 21, bright and early at five o'clock in the morning, I climbed onto the platform. I found Captain Nemo there. The weather is clearing a bit, he told me. I have high hopes. After breakfast, we'll make our way ashore and choose an observation post. This issue settled, I went to find Ned Land. I wanted to take him with me. The obstinate Canadian refused, and I could clearly see that his tight-lipped mood and his bad temper were growing by the day. Under the circumstances, I ultimately wasn't sorry that he refused. In truth, there were too many seals ashore, and it would never do to expose this impulsive fisherman to such temptations. Breakfast over, I made my way ashore. The Nautilus had gone a few more miles during the night. It lay well out a good league from the coast, which was crowned by a sharp peak four hundred to five hundred meters high. In addition to me, the skiff carried Captain Nemo, two crewmen, and the instruments. In other words, a chronometer, a spyglass, and a barometer. During our crossing, I saw numerous baleen whales belonging to the three species unique to these southernmost seas. The bowhead whale, or right whale, according to the English, which has no dorsal fin. The humpback whale from the genus Balenoptera, in other words, winged whales. Beasts with wrinkled bellies and huge whitish fins, genus name regardless, do not yet form wings. And the finback whale, yellowish-brown, the swiftest of all cetaceans. This powerful animal is audible from far away when it sends up towering spouts of air and steam that resembles swirls of smoke. Herds of these different mammals were playing about in the tranquil waters, and I could easily see that this Antarctic polar basin now served as a refuge for those cetaceans too relentlessly pursued by hunters. I also noted long whitish strings of salps, a type of mollusk found in clusters, and some jellyfish of large size that swayed in the eddies of the billows. By nine o'clock we had pulled up to shore. The sky was growing brighter. Clouds were fleeing to the south. Mists were rising from the cold surface of the water. Captain Nemo headed toward the peak, which he no doubt planned to make his observatory. It was an arduous climb over sharp lava and pumice stones in the midst of air often reeking with sulfurous fumes from the smoke holes. For a man out of practice at treading land, the captain scaled the steepest slopes with a supple agility I couldn't equal, and which would have been envied by the hunters of Pyrenees mountain goats. It took us two hours to reach the summit of this half-crystal, half-basalt peak, from there our eyes scanned a vast sea, which scrawled its boundary line firmly against the background of the northern sky. At our feet, dazzling tracks of white. Over our heads, a pale azure clear of mists. North of us, the sun's disk like a ball of fire already cut into by the edge of the horizon. From the heart of the waters, 
jets of liquid rising like hundreds of magnificent bouquets, far off like a sleeping cetacean the Nautilus. Behind us, to the south and east, an immense shore, a chaotic heap of rocks and ice whose limits we couldn't see. Arriving at the summit of this peak, Captain Nemo carefully determined its elevation by means of his barometer, since he had to take this factor into account in his noon sights. At 11.45 the sun, by then seen only by refraction, looked like a golden disk, dispersing its last rays over this deserted continent and down to the seas not yet ploughed by the ships of man. Captain Nemo had brought a spyglass with a rectangular eyepiece, which corrected the sun's refraction by means of a mirror, and he used it to observe the orb sinking little by little along a very extended diagonal that reached below the horizon. I held the chronometer. My heart was pounding mightily. If the lower half of the sun's disk disappeared, just as the chronometer said noon, we were right at the pole. Noon, I called. The South Pole, Captain Nemo replied in a solemn voice, handing me the spyglass, which showed the orb of day cut into two exactly equal parts by the horizon. I stared at the last rays wreathing this peak, while shadows were gradually climbing its gradients. Just then, resting his hand on my shoulder, Captain Nemo said to me, In 1600, sir, the Dutchman Heretic was swept by storms and currents, reaching latitude 64 degrees south, and discovering the South Shetland Islands. On January 17, 1773, the famous Captain Cook went along the 38th meridian, arriving at latitude 67 degrees 30, and on January 30, 1774, along the 109th meridian, he reached latitude 71 degrees 15. In 1819 the Russian Bellinghausen lay on the 69th parallel, and in 1821 on the 66th at longitude 111 degrees west. In 1820, the Englishman Bransfield stopped at 65 degrees. That same year, the American Morel, whose reports are dubious, went along the 42nd meridian, finding open sea at latitude 70 degrees 14. In 1825, the Englishman Powell was unable to get beyond 62 degrees. That same year, a humble sea fisherman, the Englishman Weddell, went as far as latitude 72 degrees 14 on the 35th meridian, and as far as 74 degrees 15 on the 36th. In 1829, the Englishman Forrester, commander of the Chanticleer, laid claim on the Antarctic continent in latitude 63 degrees 26 and longitude 66 degrees 26. On February 1, 1831, the Englishman Biscoe discovered Enderby Land at latitude 68 degrees 50, Adelaide Land at latitude 67 degrees on February 5, 1832, and Graham Land at latitude 64 degrees 45 on February 21. In 1838, the Frenchman Dumont d'Urville stopped at the ice bank in latitude 62 degrees 57, sighting the Louis-Philippe Peninsula. On January 21, two years later, at a new southerly position of 66 degrees 30, he named the Adélie coast, and eight days later, the Clare coast at 64 degrees 40. In 1838, the American Wilkes advanced as far as the 69th parallel on the 100th meridian. In 1839, the Englishman Balleny discovered the Sabrina coast at the edge of the polar circle. Lastly, on January 12, 1842, with his ships, the Erebus and the Terror, the Englishman Sir James Clark Ross found Victorian land in latitude 70 degrees 56 and longitude 171 degrees 7 east. On the 23rd of that same month, he reached the 74th parallel, a position denoting the farthest south attained until then. On the 27th, he lay at 76 degrees 8. 
on the 28th at 77 degrees 32, on February 2nd at 78 degrees 4, and late in 1842 he returned to 71 degrees, but couldn't get beyond it. Well now, in 1868 on this 21st day of March, I myself, Captain Nemo, have reached the South Pole at 90 degrees, and I hereby claim this entire part of the globe equal to one-sixth of the known continents. In the name of which sovereign, Captain? In my own name, sir. So saying, Captain Nemo unfurled a black flag bearing a gold inn on its quartered bunting. Then, turning toward the orb of day, whose last rays were licking at the sea's horizon. Farewell, O sun, he called. Disappear, O radiant orb, retire beneath this open sea, and let six months of night spread their shadows over my new domain. Chapter 39 Accident or Incident the next day, March 22, at six o'clock in the morning, preparations for departure began. The last gleams of twilight were melting into night. The cold was brisk. The constellations were glittering with startling intensity. The wonderful Southern Cross Polar Star of the Antarctic regions twinkled at its zenith. The thermometer marked negative twelve degrees centigrade, and a fresh breeze left a sharp nip in the air. Ice flows were increasing over the open water. The sea was starting to congeal everywhere. Numerous blackish patches were spreading over its surface, announcing the imminent formation of fresh ice. Obviously, this southernmost basin froze over during its six-month winter and became utterly inaccessible. What happened to the whales during this period? No doubt they went beneath the ice bank to find more feasible seas. As for seals and walruses, they were accustomed to living in the harshest climates and stayed on in these icy waterways. These animals know by instinct how to gouge holes in the ice fields and keep them continually open. They go to these holes to breathe. Once the birds have migrated northward to escape the cold, these marine mammals remain as sole lords of the polar continent. Meanwhile, the ballast tanks filled with water, and the Nautilus sank slowly. At a depth of one thousand feet, it stopped. Its propeller churned the waves, and it headed due north at a speed of fifteen miles per hour. Near the afternoon, it was already cruising under the immense frozen carapace of the ice bank. As a precaution, the panels in the lounge stayed closed because the Nautilus's hull could run afoul of some submerged block of ice. So I spent the day putting my notes into final form. My mind was completely wrapped up in my memories of the pole. We had reached that inaccessible spot without facing exhaustion or danger, as if our seagoing passenger carriage had glided there on railroad tracks. And now we had actually started our return journey. Did it still have comparable surprises in store for me? I felt sure it did. So inexhaustible is this series of underwater wonders. As it was, in the five and a half months since fate had brought us on board, we had cleared fourteen thousand leagues. And over this track longer than the Earth's equator, so many fascinating or frightening incidents had beguiled our voyage. That hunting trip in the Crespo forests, our running aground in the Torres Strait, the coral cemetery, the pearl fisheries of Ceylon, the Arabic tunnel, the fires of Santorini, those millions in the Bay of Vigo, Atlantis, the South Pole. During the night, all these memories crossed over from one dream to the next, not giving my brain a moment's rest. At three o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by a violent collision. I sat up in bed, listening in the darkness, and then was suddenly hurled into the middle of my stateroom. Apparently the Nautilus had gone aground, then heeled over sharply. Leaning against the walls, I dragged myself down the gangways to the lounge, whose ceiling lights were on. 
The furniture had been knocked over. Fortunately, the glass cases were solidly secured at the base and had stood fast. Since we were no longer vertical, the starboard pictures were glued to the tapestries, while those to port had their lower edges hanging a foot away from the wall. So the Nautilus was lying on its starboard side, completely stationary to boot. In its interior, I heard the sound of footsteps and muffled voices, but Captain Nemo didn't appear. Just as I was about to leave the lounge, Ned Land and Conseil entered. What happened? I instantly said to them. I came to ask Master that, Conseil replied. Damnation! The Canadian exclaimed. I know full well what happened. The Nautilus has gone aground, and judging from the way it's listing, I don't think it'll pull through like that first time in the Torres Strait. But, I asked, are we at least back on the surface of the sea? We have no idea, Conseil replied. It's easy to find out, I answered. I consulted the pressure gauge. Much to my surprise, it indicated a depth of 360 meters. What's the meaning of this? I exclaimed. We must confer with Captain Nemo, Conseil said. But where do we find him? Ned Land asked. Follow me. I told my two companions. We left the lounge, nobody in the library, nobody by the central companionway or the crew's quarters. I assumed that Captain Nemo was stationed in the pilot house. Best to wait. The three of us returned to the lounge. I'll skip over the Canadian's complaints. He had good grounds for an outburst. I didn't answer him back, letting him blow off all the steam he wanted. We had been left to ourselves for twenty minutes, trying to detect the tiniest noise inside the Nautilus, when Captain Nemo entered. He didn't seem to see us. His facial features, usually so emotionless, revealed a certain uneasiness. He studied the compass and pressure gauge in silence, then went and put his finger on the world map at a spot in the sector depicting the southernmost seas. I hesitated to interrupt him. But some moments later, when he turned to me, I threw back at him a phrase he had used in the Torres Strait. An incident, Captain? No, sir, he replied. This time, an accident. Serious? Perhaps. Is there any immediate danger? No. The Nautilus has run aground? Yes. And this accident came about through nature's unpredictability, not man's incapacity. No errors were committed in our maneuvers. Nevertheless, we can't prevent a loss of balance from taking its toll. One may defy human laws, but no one can withstand the laws of nature. Captain Nemo had picked an odd time to philosophize. All in all, this reply told me nothing. May I learn, sir, I asked him, what caused this accident? An enormous block of ice, an entire mountain, has toppled over. He answered me, when an iceberg is eroded at the base by warmer waters or by repeated collisions, its center of gravity rises. Then at somersaults, it turns completely upside down. That's what happened here. When it overturned, one of these blocks hit the Nautilus as it was cruising under the waters. Sliding under our hull, this block then raised us with irresistible power, lifting us into less congested strata where we now lie on our side. But can't we float the Nautilus clear by emptying its ballast tanks to regain our balance? That, sir, is being done right now. You can hear the pumps working. Look at the needle on the pressure gauge. It indicates that the Nautilus is rising, but this block of ice is rising with us. And until some obstacle halts its upward movement, our position won't change. Indeed, the Nautilus kept the same heel to starboard, no doubt it would straighten up once the block came to a halt. But before that happened, who knew if we might not hit the underbelly of the ice bank and be hideously squeezed between two frozen surfaces? I mused on all the consequences of this situation. Captain Nemo didn't stop studying the pressure gauge. Since the toppling of this iceberg, the Nautilus had risen about 150 feet, but it still stayed at the same angle to the perpendicular. Suddenly, a slight movement could be felt over the hull. Obviously, the Nautilus was straightening a bit. Objects hanging in the lounge were visibly returning to their normal positions. The walls were approaching the vertical. Nobody said a word. 
Hearts pounding, we could see and feel the ship writing itself. The floor was becoming horizontal beneath our feet. Ten minutes went by. Finally, we're upright, I exclaimed. Yes, Captain Nemo said, heading to the lounge door. But will we float off, I asked him. Certainly, he replied. Since the ballast tanks aren't yet empty, and when they are, the Nautilus must rise to the surface of the sea. The captain went out, and soon I saw that at his orders the Nautilus had halted its upward movement. In fact, it soon would have hit the underbelly of the ice bank, but it had stopped in time and was floating in mid-water. That was a close call, Conseil then said. Yes, we could have been crushed between these masses of ice, or at least imprisoned between them. And then, with no way to renew our air supply... Yes... That was a close call. If it's over with, Ned Land muttered. I was unwilling to get into a pointless argument with the Canadian and didn't reply. Moreover, the panels opened just then, and the outside light burst through the uncovered windows. We were fully afloat, as I have said, but on both sides of the Nautilus, about ten meters away, there rose dazzling walls of ice. There also were walls above and below, above because the ice bank's underbelly spread over us like an immense ceiling, below because the somersaulting block, shifting little by little, had found points of purchase on both side walls and had gotten jammed between them. The Nautilus was imprisoned in a genuine tunnel of ice about twenty meters wide and filled with quiet water, so the ship could easily exit by going either ahead or astern sinking a few hundred meters deeper, and then taking an open passageway beneath the ice bank. The ceiling lights were off, yet the lounge was still brightly lit. This was due to the reflecting power of the walls of ice, which threw the beams of our beacon right back at us. Words cannot describe the effects produced by our galvanic rays on these huge, whimsically sculpted blocks, whose every angle, ridge, and facet gave off a different glow depending on the nature of the veins running inside the ice. It was a dazzling mine of gems, in particular sapphires and emeralds, whose jets of blue and green crisscrossed. Here and there opaline hues of infinite subtlety raced among sparks of light that were like so many fiery diamonds, their brilliance more than an eye could stand. The power of our beacon was increased a hundredfold, like a lamp shining through the biconvex lenses of a world-class lighthouse. How beautiful! Conseil exclaimed. Yes, I said. It's a wonderful sight, isn't it, Ned? Oh, damnation. Yes. Ned Land shot back. It's superb. I'm furious that I have to admit it. Nobody has ever seen the like. But this sight could cost us dearly, and in all honesty, I think we're looking at things God never intended for human eyes. Ned was right. It was too beautiful. All at once a yell from Conseil made me turn around. What is it? I asked. Master must close his eyes. Master mustn't look. With that, Conseil clapped his hands over his eyes. But what's wrong, my boy? I've been dazzled, struck blind. Involuntarily, my eyes flew to the window, but I couldn't stand the fire devouring it. I realized what had happened. The Nautilus had just started off at great speed. All the tranquil glimmers of the ice walls had then changed into blazing streaks. The sparkles from these myriads of diamonds were merging with each other. Swept along by its propeller, the Nautilus was traveling through a sheath of flashing light. Then the panels in the lounge closed. We kept our hands over our eyes, which were utterly saturated with those concentric gleams that swirl before the retina when sunlight strikes it too intensely. It took some time to calm our troubled vision. Finally, we lowered our hands. Ye gods, I never would have believed it, Conseil said, and I still don't believe it. The Canadian shot back. When we returned to shore, jaded from all these natural wonders, Conseil added, think how we look down on those pitiful landmasses, those puny works of man. No, the civilized world won't be good enough for us. 
Such words from the lips of this emotionless Flemish boy showed that our enthusiasm was near the boiling point. But the Canadian didn't fail to throw his dram of cold water over us. The civilized world, he said, shaking his head. Don't worry, Conseil, my friend. We're never going back to that world. By this point it was five o'clock in the morning. Just then there was a collision in the Nautilus's bow. I realized that its spur had just bumped a block of ice. It must have been a faulty maneuver because this underwater tunnel was obstructed by such blocks and didn't make for easy navigating. So I had assumed that Captain Nemo, in adjusting his course, would go around each obstacle or would hug the walls and follow the windings of the tunnel. In either case, our forward motion wouldn't receive an absolute check. Nevertheless, contrary to my expectations, the Nautilus definitely began to move backward. We are going astern, Conseil said. Yes, I replied. Apparently the tunnel has no way out at this end. And so? So, I said, our maneuvers are quite simple. We'll return in our tracks and go out the southern opening, that's all. As I spoke, I tried to sound more confident than I really felt. Meanwhile, the Nautilus accelerated its backward movement, and running with propeller in reverse, it swept us along at great speed. This'll mean a delay, Ned said. What are a few hours more or less, so long as we get out? Yes, Ned Land repeated. So long as we get out. I strolled for a little while from the lounge into the library. My companions kept their seats and didn't move. Soon I threw myself down on a couch and picked up a book, which my eyes skimmed mechanically. A quarter of an hour later, Conseil approached me, saying, It is deeply fascinating, this volume master is reading. Tremendously fascinating, I replied. I believe it. Master is reading his own book. My own book? Indeed, my hands were holding my own work on the great ocean depths. I hadn't even suspected. I closed the book and resumed my strolling. Ned and Conseil stood up to leave. Stay here, my friends, I said, stopping them. Let's stay together until we're out of this blind alley. As Master wishes, Conseil replied. The hours passed. I often studied the instruments hanging on the lounge wall. The pressure gauge indicated that the Nautilus stayed at a constant depth of three hundred meters. The compass that it kept heading south, the log that it was traveling at a speed of twenty miles per hour, an excessive speed in such a cramped area. But Captain Nemo knew that by this point there was no such thing as too fast, since minutes were now worth centuries. At 8.52... A second collision took place, this time astern. I grew pale. My companions came over. I clutched Conseil's hand. Our eyes questioned each other, and more directly than if our thoughts had been translated into words. Just then the captain entered the lounge. I went to him. Our path is barred to the south, I asked him. Yes, sir. When it overturned, that iceberg closed off every exit. We're boxed in. Yes. Chapter 40 Shortage of Air Thus around the Nautilus, above and below, was an impenetrable wall of ice. We were prisoners to the iceberg. I watched the captain... His countenance had resumed its habitual imperturbability. Gentlemen, he said calmly, there are two ways of dying in the circumstances in which we are placed. This puzzling person had the air of a mathematical professor lecturing to his pupils. The first is to be crushed. The second is to die of suffocation. I do not speak of the possibility of dying of hunger, for the supply of provisions in the Nautilus will certainly last longer than we shall. Let us, then, calculate our chances. As to suffocation, Captain, I replied, that is not to be feared because our reservoirs are full. Just so. But they will only yield two days' supply of air. 
Now, for thirty-six hours we have been hidden under the water, and already the heavy atmosphere of the Nautilus requires renewal. In forty-eight hours our reserve will be exhausted. Well, Captain, can we be delivered before forty-eight hours? We will attempt it, at least, by piercing the wall that surrounds us. On which side? Sound will tell us. I am going to run the Nautilus aground on the lower bank, and my men will attack the iceberg on the side that is least thick. Captain Nemo went out. Soon I discovered by a hissing noise that the water was entering the reservoirs. The Nautilus sank slowly and rested on the ice at a depth of 350 yards, the depth at which the lower bank was immersed. My friends, I said, our situation is serious, but I rely on your courage and energy. Sir, replied the Canadian, I am ready to do anything for the general safety. Good, Ed, and I held out my hand to the Canadian. I will add, he continued, that, being as handy with the pickaxe as the harpoon, if I can be useful to the captain, he can command my services. He will not refuse your help. Come, Ned. I led him to the room where the crew of the Nautilus were putting on their cork jackets. I told the captain of Ned's proposal, which he accepted. The Canadian put on his sea costume and was ready as soon as his companions. When Ned was dressed, I re-entered the drawing-room, where the panes of glass were open, and, posted near Conseil, I examined the ambient beds that supported the Nautilus. Some instants after, we saw a dozen of the crew set foot on the bank of ice, and among them Ned Land, easily known by his stature. Captain Nemo was with them. Before proceeding to dig the walls, he took the soundings, to be sure of working in the right direction. Long sounding lines were sunk in the side walls, but after fifteen yards they were again stopped by the thick wall. It was useless to attack it on the ceiling-like surface, since the iceberg itself measured more than four hundred yards in height. Captain Nemo then sounded the lower surface. There ten yards of wall separated us from the water, so great was the thickness of the ice field. It was necessary, therefore, to cut from it a piece equal in extent to the water line of the Nautilus. There were about six thousand cubic yards to detach, so as to dig a hole by which we could descend to the ice field. The work had begun immediately, and carried on with indefatigable energy. Instead of digging round the Nautilus, which would have involved greater difficulty, Captain Nemo had an immense trench made at eight yards from the port quarter, then the men set to work simultaneously with their screws on several points of its circumference. Presently the pickaxe attacked this compact matter vigorously, and large blocks were detached from the mass. By a curious effect of specific gravity, these blocks, lighter than water, fled, so to speak, to the vault of the tunnel that increased its thickness at the top in proportion as it diminished at the base. But that mattered little, so long as the lower part grew thinner. After two hours' hard work, Ned Land came in exhausted. He and his comrades were replaced by new workers, whom Conseil and I joined. The second lieutenant of the Nautilus superintended us. The water seemed singularly cold, but I soon got warm handling the pickaxe. My movements were free enough, although they were made under a pressure of thirsty atmospheres. When I re-entered, after working two hours to take some food and rest, I found a perceptible difference between the pure fluid with which the require-all engine supplied me and the atmosphere of the Nautilus, already changed with carbonic acid. The air had not been renewed for forty-eight hours, and its vivifying qualities were considerably feebled. However, after a lapse of twelve hours we had only raised a block of ice one yard thick, on the marked surface, which was about six hundred cubic yards. Reckoning that it took twelve hours to accomplish this much, it would take five nights and four days to bring this enterprise to a satisfactory conclusion. Five nights and four days, and we have only air enough for two days in the reservoirs. Without taking into account, said Ned, that 
even if we get out of this infernal prison, we shall also be imprisoned under the iceberg, shut out from all possible communication with the atmosphere. True enough. Who could then foresee the minimum of time necessary for our deliverance? We might be suffocated before the Nautilus could regain the surface of the waves. Was it destined to perish in this ice tomb with all those it enclosed? The situation was terrible, but everyone had looked to the danger in the face, and each was determined to do his duty to the last. As I expected, during the night a new block a yard square was carried away, and still further sank the immense hollow. But in the morning when... Dressed in my cork jacket, I traversed the slushy mass at a temperature of six or seven degrees below zero. I remarked that the side walls were gradually closing in. The beds of water farthest from the trench that were not warmed by the men's work showed a tendency to solidification. In presence of this new and imminent danger, what would become of our chances of safety? And how hinder the solidification of this liquid medium? that would burst the partitions of the nautilus like glass. I did not tell my companions of this new danger. What was the good of damping the energy they displayed in the painful work of escape? But when I went on board again, I told Captain Nemo of this grave complication. I know it, he said in that calm tone which could counteract the most terrible apprehensions. It is one danger more but I see no way of escaping it. The only chance of safety is to go quicker than solidification. We must be beforehand with it. That is all. On this day, for several hours, I used my pickaxe vigorously. The work kept me up. Besides, to work was to quit the Nautilus and breathe directly the pure air drawn from the reservoirs and supplied by our apparatus, and to quit the impoverished and vitiated atmosphere. Towards evening the trench was dug one yard deeper. When I returned on board I was nearly suffocated by the carbonic acid with which the air was filled. Ah, if we had only the chemical means to drive away this deleterious gas. We had plenty of oxygen. All this water contained a considerable quantity and by dissolving it with our powerful piles, it would restore the vivifying fluid. I had thought well over it, but of what good was that? Since the carbonic acid produced by our respiration had invaded every part of the vessel, to absorb it, it was necessary to fill some jars with caustic potash and to shake them incessantly. Now this substance was wanting on board, and nothing could replace it. On that evening, Captain Nemo ought to open the taps of his reservoirs and let some pure air into the interior of the Nautilus. Without this precaution, we could not get rid of the sense of suffocation. The next day, March 26th, I resumed my miner's work in beginning the fifth yard. The side walls and the lower surface of the iceberg thickened visibly. It was evident that they would meet before the Nautilus was able to disengage itself. Despair seized me for an instant. My pickaxe nearly fell from my bands. What was the good of digging if I must be suffocated, crushed by the water that was turning into stone? A punishment that the ferocity of the savages even would not have invented. Just then Captain Nemo passed near me. I touched his hand and showed him the walls of our prison. The wall to port had advanced to at least four yards from the hull of the Nautilus. The captain understood me and signed me to follow him. We went on board. I took off my cork jacket and accompanied him into the drawing room. Im Arjona, we must attempt some desperate means, or we shall be sealed up in this solidified water as in cement. Yes, but what is to be done? Ah, if my Nautilus were strong enough to bear this pressure without being crushed. Well, I asked, not catching the captain's idea. Do you not understand, he replied, that this congelation of water will help us? Do you not see that by its solidification 
It would burst through this field of ice that imprisons us, as, when it freezes, it bursts the hardest stones. Do you not perceive that it would be an agent of safety instead of destruction? Yes, Captain, perhaps. But whatever resistance to crushing the Nautilus possesses, it could not support this terrible pressure and would be flattened like an iron plate. I know it, sir. Therefore, we must not reckon on the aid of nature, but on our own exertions. We must stop this solidification. Not only will the side walls be pressed together, but there is not ten feet of water before or behind the Nautilus. The congelation gains on us on all sides. How long will the air in the reservoirs last for us to breathe on board? The captain looked in my face. After tomorrow, they will be empty. A cold sweat came over me. However, ought I to have been astonished at the answer? On March 22nd, the Nautilus was in the open polar seas. We were at 26 O. For five days we had lived on the reserve on board, and what was left of the respirable air must be kept for the workers. Even now, as I write, my recollection is still so vivid that an involuntary terror seizes me, and my lungs seem to be without air. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo reflected silently, and evidently an idea had struck him, but he seemed to reject it. At last, these words escaped his lips. Boiling water, he muttered. Boiling water, I cried. Yes, sir. We are enclosed in a space that is relatively confined. Would not jets of boiling water, constantly injected by the pumps, raise the temperature in this part and stay the congelation? Let us try it, I said resolutely. Let us try it, Professor. The thermometer then stood at seven outside. Captain Nemo took me to the galleys where the vast distillatory machine stood that furnished the drinkable water by evaporation. They filled these with water, and all the electric heat from the pipes was thrown through the worms bathed in the liquid. In a few minutes this water reached one hundred. It was directed toward the pumps, while fresh water replaced it in proportion. The heat developed by the troughs was such that cold water— drawing up from the sea after only having gone through the machines, came boiling into the body of the pump. The injection was begun, and three hours after the thermometer marked six below zero outside. One degree was gained. Two hours later, the thermometer only marked four. We shall succeed, I said to the captain, after having anxiously watched the result of the operation. I think, he answered, that we shall not be crushed. We have no more suffocation to fear. During the night, the temperature of the water rose to one o below zero. The injections could not carry it to a higher point. But, as the congelation of the sea water produces at least two o, I was at least reassured against the dangers of solidification. The next day, March 27th, six yards of ice had been cleared, twelve feet only remaining to be cleared away. There was yet forty-eight hours' work. The air could not be renewed in the interior of the Nautilus, and this day would make it worse. An intolerable weight oppressed me. Toward three o'clock in the evening this feeling rose to a violent degree. Yawns dislocated my jaws. My lungs panted as they inhaled this burning fluid, which became rarefied more and more. A moral torpor took hold of me. I was powerless, almost unconscious. My brave Conseil, though exhibiting the same symptoms and suffering in the same manner, never left me. He took my hand and encouraged me, and I heard him murmur, Oh, if I could only not breathe, so as to leave more air for my master. Tears came into my eyes on hearing him speak thus. In our situation to all was intolerable in the interior, with what haste and gladness would we put on our cork jackets to work in our turn? Pickaxes sounded on the frozen ice beds. Our arms ached, the skin was torn off our hands. But what were these fatigues? What did the wounds matter? Vital air came to the lungs. We breathed, we breathed! 
All this time no one prolonged his voluntary task beyond the prescribed time. His task accomplished, each one handed in turn to his panting companions the apparatus that supplied him with life. Captain Nemo set the example, and submitted first to this severe discipline. When the time came he gave up his apparatus to another, and returned to the vitiated air on board, calm, unflinching, unmurmuring. On that day the ordinary work was accomplished with unusual vigour. Only two yards remained to be raised from the surface. Two yards only separated us from the open sea. But the reservoirs were nearly emptied of air. The little that remained ought to be kept for the workers, not a particle for the Nautilus. When I went back on board I was half suffocated. What a night! I know not how to describe it. The next day my breathing was oppressed. Dizziness accompanied the pain in my head and made me like a drunken man. My companion showed the same symptoms. Some of the crew had rattling in the throat. On that day, the sixth of our imprisonment, Captain Nemo, finding the pickaxes work too slowly, resolved to crush the ice bed that still separated us from the liquid sheet. This man's coolness and energy never forsook him. He subdued his physical pains by moral force. By his orders the vessel was lightened, that is to say raised from the ice bed, by a change of specific gravity. When it floated they towed it, so as to bring it above the immense trench made on the level of the water line. Then, filling his reservoirs of water, he descended and shut himself up in the hole. Just then all the crew came on board, and the double door of communication was shut. The Nautilus then rested on the bed of ice, which was not one yard thick, and which the sounding leads had perforated in a thousand places. The taps of the reservoirs were then opened, and a hundred cubic yards of water was let in, increasing the weight of the Nautilus to eighteen hundred tons. We waited, we listened, forgetting our suffering and hope, our safety depended on this last chance. Notwithstanding the buzzing in my head, I soon heard the humming sound under the hull of the Nautilus. The ice cracked with a singular noise like tearing paper, and the Nautilus sank. We are off, murmured Conseil in my ear. I could not answer him. I seized his hand and pressed it convulsively. All at once, carried away by its frightful overcharge, the Nautilus sank like a bullet under the waters. That is to say, it fell as if it was in a vacuum. Then all the electric force was put on the pumps that soon began to let the water out of the reservoirs. After some minutes our fall was stopped. Soon, too, the manometer indicated an ascending movement. The screw, going at full speed, made the iron hull tremble to its very bolts and drew us towards the north. But if this floating under the iceberg is to last another day before we reach the open sea, I shall be dead first. Half stretched upon a divan in the library, I was suffocating. My face was purple, my lips blue, my faculties suspended. I neither saw nor heard. All notion of time had gone from my mind. My muscles could not contract. I do not know how many hours passed thus, but I was conscious of the agony that was coming over me. I felt as if I was going to die. Suddenly I came to. Some breaths of air penetrated my lungs. Had we risen to the surface of the waves? Were we free of the iceberg? No. Ned and Conseil, my two brave friends, were sacrificing themselves to save me. Some particles of air still remained at the bottom of one apparatus. Instead of using it, they had kept it for me, and while they were being suffocated, they gave me life drop by drop. I wanted to push back the thing. They held my hands, and for some moments I breathed freely. I looked at the clock. It was eleven in the morning. It ought to be the twenty-eighth of March. The Nautilus went at a frightful pace, forty miles an hour. It literally tore through the water. Where was Captain Nemo? Had he succumbed? Were his companions dead with him? At the moment the manometer indicated that we were not more than twenty feet from the surface. A mere plate of ice separated us from the atmosphere. Could we not break it? Perhaps, in any case, the Nautilus was going to attempt it. I felt that it was in an oblique position, lowering the stern and raising the bows. The introduction of water had been the means of disturbing its equilibrium. Then, 
Impelled by its powerful screw, it attacked the ice field from beneath like a formidable battering ram. It broke it by backing and then rushing forward against the field, which gradually gave way, and at last, dashing suddenly against it, shot forwards on the ice field that crushed beneath its weight. The panel was opened, one might say torn off, and the pure air came in in abundance to all parts of the Nautilus. Chapter 41 From Cape Horn to the Amazon How I got onto the platform I have no idea. Perhaps the Canadian had carried me there, but I breathed, I inhaled the vivifying sea air. My two companions were getting drunk with the fresh particles. The other unhappy men had been so long without food that they could not with impunity indulge in the simplest ailments that were given them. We, on the contrary, had no end to restrain ourselves. We could draw this fresh air freely into our lungs, and it was the breeze, the breeze alone, that filled us with this keen enjoyment. Ah, said Conseil, how delightful this oxygen is. Master need not fear to breathe it. There is enough for everybody. Ned Land did not speak, but he opened his jaws wide enough to frighten a shark. Our strength soon returned, and, when I looked round me, I saw we were alone on the platform. The foreign seamen in the Nautilus were contented with the air that circulated in the interior. None of them had come to drink in the open air. The first words I spoke were words of gratitude and thankfulness to my two companions. Ned and Conseil had prolonged my life during the last hours of this long agony. All my gratitude could not repay such devotion. My friends, said I, we are bound one to the other for ever, and I am under infinite obligations to you, which I shall take advantage of, exclaimed the Canadian. What do you mean? said Conseil. I mean that I shall take you with me when I leave this infernal Nautilus. Well, said Conseil, after all this, are we going right? Yes, I replied, for we are going the way of the sun, and here the sun is in the north. No doubt, said Ned Land, but it remains to be seen whether he will bring the ship into the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, that is, into frequented or deserted seas. I could not answer that question, and I feared that Captain Nemo would rather take us to the vast ocean that touches the coasts of Asia and America at the same time. He would thus complete the tour round the submarine world, and return to those waters in which the Nautilus could sail freely. We ought, before long, to settle this important point. The Nautilus went at a rapid pace, the polar circle was soon passed, and the course shaped for Cape Horn. We were off the American point, March 31st, at seven o'clock in the evening. Then all our past sufferings were forgotten. The remembrance of that imprisonment in the ice was effaced from our minds. We only thought of the future. Captain Nemo did not appear again, either in the drawing room or on the platform. The point shown each day on the planisphere and, marked by the lieutenant, showed me the exact direction of the Nautilus. Now... On that evening it was evident, to my great satisfaction, that we were going back to the north by the Atlantic. The next day, April 1st, when the Nautilus ascended to the surface some minutes before noon, we sighted land to the west. It was Terra del Fuego, which the first navigators named thus from seeing the quantity of smoke that rose from the natives' huts. The coast seemed low to me, but in the distance rose high mountains. I even thought I had a glimpse of Mount Sarmiento that rises 2,070 yards above the level of the sea, with a very pointed summit which, according as it is misty or clear, is a sign of fine or of wet weather. At this moment the peak was clearly defined against the sky. The Nautilus, diving again under the water, approached the coast, which was only some few miles off. From the glass windows in the drawing room, I saw long seaweeds and gigantic fusai and varech, of which the open polar sea contained so many specimens with their sharp, polished filaments. They measured about three hundred yards in length. Real cables thicker than one's thumb and having great tenacity, they are often used as ropes for vessels. 
another weed known as velp, with leaves four feet long, buried in the coral concretions, hung at the bottom. It serves as nest and food for myriads of crustacea and mollusks, crabs and cuttlefish. The seas and otters had splendid repasts, eating the flesh of fish with sea vegetables, according to the English fashion. Over this fertile and luxuriant ground the Nautilus passed with great rapidity. Towards evening it approached the Falkland Group, the rough summits of which I recognized the following day. The depth of the sea was moderate. On the shores our nets brought in beautiful specimens of seaweed, and particularly a certain fucus, the roots of which were filled with the best mussels in the world. Geese and ducks fell by dozens on the platform, and soon took their place in the pantry on board. When the last heights of the Falklands had disappeared from the horizon, the Nautilus sank to between twenty and twenty-five yards, and following the American coast. Captain Nemo did not show himself. Until the 3rd of April we did not quit the shores of Patagonia, sometimes under the ocean, sometimes at the surface. The Nautilus passed beyond the large estuary formed by the Uruguay. Its direction was northwards, and followed the long windings of the coast of South America. We had then made 1,600 miles since our embarkation in the seas of Japan. About eleven o'clock in the morning the Tropic of Capricorn was crossed on the 37th meridian, and we passed Cape Frio standing out to sea. Captain Nemo, to Ned Land's great displeasure, did not like the neighborhood of the inhabited coasts of Brazil, for we went at a giddy speed. Not a fish, not a bird of the swiftest kind could follow us, and the natural curiosities of these seas escaped all observation. This speed was kept up for several days, and in the evening of the ninth of April we sighted the most westerly point of South America that forms Cape San Roque. But then the Nautilus swerved again, and sought the lowest depth of a submarine valley, which is between this cape and Sierra Leone, on the African coast. This valley bifurcates to the parallel of the Antilles, and terminates at the mouth of the enormous depression of 9,000 yards. In this place the geological basin of the ocean forms, as far as the Lesser Antilles, a cliff to three and a half miles perpendicular in height, and, at the parallel of Cape Verde Islands, another wall not less considerable, that encloses thus all the sunk continent of the Atlantic. The bottom of this immense valley is dotted with some mountains that give to these submersible places a picturesque aspect. I speak, moreover, from the manuscript charts that were in the library of the Nautilus, charts evidently due to Captain Nemo's hand, and made after his personal observations. For two days the desert and deep waters were visited by means of the inclined plains. The Nautilus was furnished with long diagonal broadsides, which carried it to all elevations. But on the 11th of April it rose suddenly, and land appeared at the mouth of the Amazon River a vast estuary, the embouchure of which is so considerable that it freshens the sea water for the distance of several leagues. Chapter 42 The Devilfish For several days the Nautilus kept off from the American coast. Evidently it did not wish to risk the tides of the Gulf of Mexico or of the Sea of the Antilles. April 16th, we sighted Martinique and Guadeloupe from a distance of about thirty miles. I saw their tall peaks for an instant. The Canadian, who counted on carrying out his projects in the Gulf, by either landing or hailing one of the numerous boats that coast from one island to another, was quite disheartened. Flight would have been quite practicable if Ned Land had been able to take possession of the boat without the captain's knowledge but in the open sea it could not be thought of. The Canadian Conseil and I had a long conversation on this subject. For six months we had been prisoners on board the Nautilus. We had travelled 17,000 leagues, and, as Ned Land said, there was no reason why it should come to an end. We could hope nothing from the captain of the Nautilus, but only from ourselves. Besides, for some time past he had become graver, more retired, less sociable. He seemed to shun me. I met him rarely. 
Formerly he was pleased to explain the submarine marvels to me. Now he left me to my studies and came no more to the saloon. What change had come over him? For what cause? For my part, I did not wish to bury with me my curious and novel studies. I had now the power to write the true book of the sea, and this book, sooner or later, I wished to see daylight. The land nearest us was the archipelago of the Bahamas. There rose high submarine cliffs covered with large weeds. It was about eleven o'clock when Ned Land drew my attention to a formidable pricking, like the sting of an ant, which was produced by means of large seaweeds. Well, I said, these are proper caverns for polyps, and I should not be astonished to see some of these monsters. What? said Conseil. Cuttlefish, real cuttlefish of the cephalopod class? No, I said, polyps of huge dimensions. I will never believe that such animals exist, said Ned. Well, said Conseil, with the most serious air in the world, I remember perfectly to have seen a large vessel drawn under the waves by an octopus's arm. You saw that, said the Canadian. Yes, Ned. With your own eyes? With my own eyes. Where, pray, might that be? At St. Malo, answered Conseil. In the port, said Ned, ironically. No, in a church, replied Conseil. In a church, cried the Canadian. Yes, friend Ned, in a picture representing the polyp in question. <laughs> Good, said Ned Land, bursting out laughing. He is quite right, I said. I have heard of this picture, but the subject represented is taken from a legend, and you know what to think of legends in the matter of natural history. Besides, when it is a question of monsters, the imagination is apt to run wild. Not only is it supposed that these polyps can draw down vessels, but a certain Olaus Magnus speaks of an octopus a mile long that is more like an island than an animal. It is also said that the bishop of Nidrus was building an altar on an immense rock. Mass finished, the rock began to walk and returned to the sea. The rock was a polyp. Another bishop, Pontopidon, speaks also of a polyp on which a regiment of cavalry could maneuver. Lastly, the ancient naturalists speak of monsters whose mouths were like gulfs, and which were too large to pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. But how much is true of these stories? asked Conseil. Nothing, my friends, at least of that which passes the limit of truth to get to fable or legend. Nevertheless, there must be some ground for the imagination of the storyteller. One cannot deny that polyps and cuttlefish exist of a large species, inferior, however, to the cetaceans. Aristotle has stated the dimensions of a cuttlefish as five cubits, or nine feet, two inches. Our fishermen frequently see some that are more than four feet long. Some skeletons of polyps are preserved in the museums of Trieste and Montpellier, that measure two yards in length. Besides, according to the calculations of some naturalists, one of these animals only six feet long would have tentacles twenty-seven feet long. That would suffice to make a formidable monster. Do they fish for them in these days? asked Ned. If they do not fish for them, sailors see them at least. One of my friends, Captain Paul Beau of Havre, has often affirmed that he met one of these monsters of colossal dimensions in the Indian seas. But the most astonishing fact, and which does not permit of the denial of the existence of these gigantic animals, happened some years ago in 1861. What is the fact? asked Ned Land. This is it. In 1861, to the northeast of Tenerife, very nearly in the same latitude we are in now, the crew of the dispatch boat Elector perceived a monstrous cuttlefish swimming in the waters. Captain Bouguer went near to the animal and attacked it with harpoon and guns, without much success, for balls and harpoons glided over the soft flesh. After several fruitless attempts, the crew tried to pass a slipknot round the body of the mollusk. The noose slipped as far as the tail fins, and there stopped. They tried then to haul it on board, but its weight was so considerable that the tightness of the cord separated the tail from the body, and, deprived of this ornament, he disappeared under the water. Indeed, is that a fact? 
an indisputable fact, my good Ned. They proposed to name this polyp Bouguet's cuttlefish. What length was it? asked the Canadian. Did it not measure about six yards? said Conseil, who, posted at the window, was examining again the irregular windings of the cliff. Precisely, I replied. Its head, rejoined Conseil, was it not crowned with eight tentacles that beat the water like a nest of serpents? Precisely. Had not its eyes placed at the back of its head considerable development? Yes, Conseil. And was not its mouth like a parrot beak? Exactly, Conseil. Very well. No offense to master, he replied quietly. If this is not Bouguet's cuttlefish, it is at least one of its brothers. I looked at Conseil. Ned Land hurried to the window. What a horrible beast! he cried. I looked in my turn and could not repress a gesture of disgust. Before my eyes was a horrible monster worthy to figure in the legends of the marvelous. It was an immense cuttlefish being eight yards long. It swam crossways in the direction of the Nautilus with great speed, watching us with its enormous staring green eyes, its eight arms, or rather feet, fixed to its head, that have given the name of cephalopod to these animals, were twice as long as its body, and were twisted like the fury's hair. One could see the two hundred and fifty air holes on the inner side of the tentacles. The monster's mouth, a horned beak like a parrot's, opened and shut vertically. Its tongue, a horned substance, furnished with several rows of pointed teeth, came out quivering from this veritable pair of shears. What a freak of nature, a bird's beak on a mollusk! Its spindle-like body formed a fleshy mass that might weigh four thousand to five thousand pounds. The varying color, changing with great rapidity, according to the irritation of the animal, passed successively from livid gray to reddish-brown. What irritated this mollusk? No doubt the presence of the Nautilus, more formidable than itself, and on which its suckers or its jaws had no hold. Yet... What monsters these polyps are! What vitality the Creator has given them! What vigor in their movements! And they possess three hearts! Chance had brought us in presence of this cuttlefish, and I did not wish to lose the opportunity of carefully studying this specimen of cephalopods. I overcame the horror that inspired me, and, taking a pencil, began to draw it. Perhaps this is the same which the Elector saw, said Conseil. No replied the Canadian, for this is whole, and the other had lost its tail. That is no reason, I replied. The arms and tails of these animals are reformed by renewal, and in seven years the tail of Bouguet's cuttlefish has no doubt had time to grow. By this time other polyps appeared at the port light. I counted seven. They formed a procession after the Nautilus, and I heard their beaks gnashing against the iron hull. I continued my work. These monsters kept in the water with such precision that they seemed immovable. Suddenly the Nautilus stopped. A shock made it tremble in every plate. Have we struck anything, I asked. In any case, replied the Canadian, we shall be free for we are floating. The Nautilus was floating, no doubt, but it did not move. A minute passed. Captain Nemo, followed by his lieutenant, entered the drawing room. I had not seen him for some time. He seemed dull. Without noticing or speaking to us, he went to the panel, looked at the polyps, and said something to his lieutenant. The latter went out. Soon the panels were shut, the ceiling was lighted. I went towards the captain. A curious collection of polyps, I said. Yes, indeed, Mr. Naturalist. He replied, and we are going to fight them, man to beast. I looked at him. I thought I had not heard aright. Man to beast? I repeated. Yes, sir. The screw is stopped. I think that the horny jaws of one of the cuttlefish is entangled in the blades. That is what prevents our moving. What are you going to do? Rise to the surface and slaughter the vermin. A difficult enterprise? Yes, indeed. 
The electric bullets are powerless against the soft flesh, where they do not find resistance enough to go off. But we shall attack them with the hatchet. And the harpoon, sir, said the Canadian, if you do not refuse my help. I will accept it, Master Land. We will follow you, I said, and following Captain Nemo we went towards the central staircase. There, about ten men with boarding hatchets were ready for the attack. Corsay and I took two hatchets. Ned Land seized a harpoon. The Nautilus had then risen to the surface. One of the sailors, posted on the top ladder step, unscrewed the bolts of the panels. But hardly were the screws loosed when the panel rose with great violence, evidently drawn by the suckers of a polyp's arm. Immediately one of these arms slid like a serpent down the opening and twenty others were above. With one blow of the axe, Captain Nemo cut this formidable tentacle that slid wriggling down the ladder. Just as we were pressing one on the other to reach the platform, two other arms lashing the air came down on the seaman placed before Captain Nemo and lifted him up with irresistible power. Captain Nemo uttered a cry and rushed out. We hurried after him. What a scene! The unhappy man seized by the tentacle and fixed to the suckers was balanced in the air at the caprice of this enormous trunk. He rattled in his throat. He was stifled. He cried, Help! Help! These words, spoken in French, startled me. I had a fellow countryman on board, perhaps several. That heart-rendering cry, I shall hear it all my life. The unfortunate man was lost. Who could rescue him from that powerful pressure? However, Captain Nemo had rushed to the polyp, and with one blow of the axe had cut through one arm. His lieutenant struggled furiously against other monsters that crept on the flanks of the Nautilus. The crew fought with their axes. The Canadian Corsay and I buried our weapons in the fleshy masses. A strong smell of musk penetrated the atmosphere. It was horrible. For one instant I thought the unhappy man, entangled with the polyp, would be torn from its powerful suction. Seven of the eight arms had been cut off, only one wriggled in the air, brandishing the victim like a feather. But just as Captain Nemo and his lieutenant threw themselves on it, the animal ejected a steam of black liquid. We were blinded with it. When the cloud dispersed, the cuttlefish had disappeared, and my unfortunate countrymen with it. Ten or twelve polyps now invaded the platform and sides of the Nautilus. We rolled pell and mell into the midst of this nest of serpents that wriggled on the platform in the waves of blood and ink. It seemed as though these slimy tentacles sprang up like the hydra's heads. Ned Land's harpoon at each stroke was plunged into the staring eyes of the cuttlefish. But my bold companion was suddenly overturned by the tentacles of a monster he had not been able to avoid. Ah, how my heart beat with emotion and horror. The formidable beak of a cuttlefish was open over Ned Land. The unhappy man would be cut in two. I rushed to his succor. But Captain Nemo was before me. His axe disappeared between the two enormous jaws and, miraculously saved, the Canadian rising plunged his harpoon deep into the triple heart of the polyp. I owed myself this revenge, said the captain to the Canadian. Ned bowed without replying. The combat had lasted a quarter of an hour. The monsters, vanquished and mutilated, left us at last, and disappeared under the waves. Captain Nemo, covered with blood, nearly exhausted, gazed upon the sea that had swallowed up one of his companions, and great tears gathered in his eyes. Chapter 43 The Gulf Stream this terrible scene of the 20th of April none of us can ever forget. I have written it under the influence of violent emotion. Since then I have revised the recital. I have read it to Conseil and to the Canadian. They found it exact as to facts, but insufficient as to effect. To paint such pictures one must have the pen of the most illustrious of our poets, the author of The Toilers of the Deep. I have said that Captain Nemo wept while watching the waves. His grief was great. It was the second companion he had lost since our arrival on board, and what a death! That friend, crushed, stifled, bruised by the dreadful arms of a polyp, pounded by his iron jaws, would not rest with his comrades in the peaceful coral cemetery. 
In the midst of the struggle it was the despairing cry uttered by the unfortunate man that had torn my heart. The poor Frenchman, forgetting his conventional language, had taken to his own mother tongue to utter a last appeal. Amongst the crew of the Nautilus, associated with the body and soul of the captain, recoiling like him from all contact with men, I had a fellow countryman. Did he alone represent France in this mysterious association, evidently composed of individuals of diverse nationalities? It was one of these insoluble problems that rose up unceasingly before my mind. Captain Nemo entered his room, and I saw him no more for some time. But that he was sad and irresolute I could see by the vessel, of which he was the soul, and which received all his impressions. The Nautilus did not keep on in its settled course. It floated about like a corpse at the will of the waves. It went at random. He could not tear himself away from the scene of the last struggle, from this sea that had devoured one of his men. Ten days passed thus. It was not till the first of May that the Nautilus resumed its northerly course, after having sighted the Bahamas at the mouth of the Bahama Canal. We were then following the current from the largest river to the sea, that has its banks, its fish, and its proper temperatures. I mean the Gulf Stream. It is really a river that flows freely to the middle of the Atlantic, and whose waters do not mix with the ocean waters. It is a salt river, saltier than the surrounding sea. Its mean depth is fifteen hundred fathoms, its mean breadth ten miles. In certain places the current flows with the speed of two miles and a half an hour. The body of its waters is more considerable than that of all the rivers in the globe. It was on this ocean river that the Nautilus then sailed. I must add that, during the night, the phosphorescent waters of the Gulf Stream rivaled the electric power of our watchlight, especially in the stormy weather that threatened us so frequently. May 8th, we were still crossing Cape Hatteras at the height of the North Carolina. The width of the Gulf Stream there is 75 miles, and its depth 210 yards. The Nautilus still went at random. All supervision seemed abandoned. I thought that, under these circumstances, escape would be possible. Indeed, the inhabited shores offered anywhere an easy refuge. The sea was incessantly ploughed by the steamers that ply between New York or Boston and the Gulf of Mexico, and overrun day and night by the little schooners coasting about the several parts of the American coast. We could hope to be picked up. It was a favourable opportunity, notwithstanding the thirty miles that separated the Nautilus from the coasts of the Union. One unfortunate circumstance thwarted the Canadians' plans. The weather was very bad. We were nearing those shores where tempests are so frequent, that country of water spouts and cyclones actually engendered by the current of the Gulf Stream. To tempt the sea in a frail boat was certain destruction. Ned Land owned this himself. He fretted, seized with nostalgia that flight only could cure. Master, he said that day to me, this must come to an end. I must make a clean breast of it. This Nemo is leaving land and going up to the north. But I declare to you that I have had enough of the South Pole, and I will not follow him to the north. What is to be done, Ned, since flight is impracticable just now? We must speak to the captain, said he. You said nothing when we were in your native seas. I will speak. Now we are in mine. When I think that before long the Nautilus will be by Nova Scotia, and that there near Newfoundland is a large bay, and into that bay the St. Lawrence empties itself, and that the St. Lawrence is my river, the river by Quebec, my native town, when I think of this I feel furious. It makes my hair stand on end. Sir, I would rather throw myself into the sea. I will not stay here. I am stifled. The Canadian was evidently losing all patience. His vigorous nature could not stand this prolonged imprisonment. His face altered daily. His temper became more surly. 
I knew what he must suffer, for I was seized with homesickness myself. Nearly seven months had passed without our having had any news from land. Captain Nemo's isolation, his altered spirits, especially since the fight with the polyps, his taciturnity, all made me view things in a different light. Well, sir, said Ned, seeing I did not reply. Well, Ned, do you wish me to ask Captain Nemo his intentions concerning us? Yes, sir. Although he has already made them known, yes. I wish it settled finally. Speak for me, in my name only, if you like. But I so seldom meet him. He avoids me. That is all the more reason for you to go see him. I went to my room. From thence I meant to go to Captain Nemo's. It would not do to let this opportunity of meeting him slip. I knocked at the door. No answer. I knocked again, then turned the handle. The door open, I went in. The captain was there, bending over his work table. He had not heard me. Resolved not to go without having spoken, I approached him. He raised his head quickly, frowned, and said roughly, You here, what do you want? To speak to you, captain. But I'm busy, sir. I'm working. I leave you at liberty to shut yourself up. Can I not be allowed the same? This reception was not encouraging, but I was determined to hear and answer everything. Sir, I said coldly, I have to speak to you on a matter that admits of no delay. What is that, sir? He replied ironically. Have you discovered something that has escaped me, or has the sea delivered up any new secrets? We were at cross purposes. But before I could reply, he showed me an open manuscript on his table and said, in a more serious tone, Here, Im Achona, is a manuscript written in several languages. It contains the sum of my studies of the sea. And, if it please God, it shall not perish with me. This manuscript, signed with my name, complete with the history of my life, will be shut up in a little floating case. The last survivor of all of us on board the Nautilus will throw this case into the sea, and it will go whither it is borne by the waves. This man's name, his history written by himself, his mystery would then be revealed some day. Captain, I said, I can but approve of the idea that makes you act thus. The result of your studies must not be lost, but the means you employ seem to be primitive. Who knows where the winds will carry this case, and in whose hands will it fall? Could you not use some other means? Could not you or one of yours? Never, sir, he said, hastily interrupting me. But I and my companions are ready to keep this manuscript in store, and if you will put us at liberty— At liberty, said the captain, rising. Yes, sir. That is the subject on which I wish to question you. For seven months we have been here on board, and I ask you today, in the name of my companions and in my own, if your intention is to keep us here always. Im Achona, I will answer you today as I did seven months ago. Whoever enters the Nautilus must never quit it. You impose actual slavery upon us. Give it what name you please. But everywhere the slave has the right to regain his liberty. Who denies you this right? Have I ever tried to chain you with an oath? He looked at me with his arms crossed. Sir, I said, to return a second time to this subject will be neither to your nor to my taste. But, as we have entered upon it, let us go through with it. I repeat, it is not only myself whom it concerns. Study is to me a relief, a diversion, a passion that could make me forget everything. Like you, I am willing to live obscure in the frail hope of bequeathing one day to future time the result of my labors. But it is otherwise with Ned Land. Every man worthy of the name deserves some consideration. Have you thought that love of liberty, hatred of slavery, can give rise to schemes of revenge in a nature like the Canadian's? That he could think, attempt, and try? 
I was silenced. Captain Nemo rose. Whatever Ned Land thinks of, attempts or tries, what does it matter to me? I did not seek him. It is not for my pleasure that I keep him on board. As for you, Im Achona, you are one of those who can understand everything, even silence. I have nothing more to say to you. Let this first time you have come to treat of this subject be the last. For a second time I will not listen to you. I retired. Our situation was critical. I related my conversation to my two companions. We know now, said Ned, that we can expect nothing from this man. The Nautilus is nearing Long Island. We will escape, whatever the weather may be. But the sky became more and more threatening. Symptoms of a hurricane became manifest. The atmosphere was becoming white and misty. On the horizon, fine streaks of cirrus clouds were succeeded by masses of cumuli. Other low clouds passed swiftly by. The swollen sea rose in huge billows. The birds disappeared with the exception of the petrels, those friends of the storm. The barometer fell sensibly and indicated an extreme extension of the vapors. The mixture of the storm glass was decomposed under the influence of the electricity that pervaded the atmosphere. The tempest burst on the 18th of May, just as the Nautilus was floating off Long Island, some miles from the port of New York. I can describe this strife of the elements, for instead of fleeing to the depths of the sea, Captain Nemo, by an unaccountable caprice, would brave it at the surface. The wind blew from the southwest at first. Captain Nemo, during the squalls, had taken his place on the platform. He had made himself fast, to prevent being washed overboard by the monstrous waves. I had hoisted myself up and made myself fast also, dividing my admiration between the tempest and this extraordinary man who was coping with it. The raging sea was swept by huge cloud drifts, which were actually saturated with the waves. The Nautilus, sometimes lying on its side, sometimes standing up like a mast, rolled and pitched terribly. About five o'clock a torrent of rain fell that lulled neither sea nor wind. The hurricane blew nearly forty leagues an hour. It is under these conditions that it overturns houses, breaks iron gates, displaces twenty-four pounders. However, the Nautilus, in the midst of the tempest, confirmed the words of a clever engineer. There is no well-constructed hull that cannot defy the sea. This was not a resisting rock. It was a steel spindle, obedient and movable, without rigging or masts, that braved its fury with impunity. However, I watched these raging waves attentively. They measured fifteen feet in height, and one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy-five yards long, and their speed of propagation was thirty feet per second. Their bulk and power increased with the depth of the water. Such waves as these at the Hebrides have displaced a mass weighing 8,400 pounds. They are they which, in the tempest of December 23, 1864, after destroying the town of Yedo in Japan, broke the same day on the shores of America. The intensity of the tempest increased with the night. The barometer, as in 1860, at Réunion during a cyclone, fell several tenths at the close of day. I saw a large vessel pass the horizon struggling painfully. She was trying to lie to under half steam to keep up above the waves. It was probably one of the steamers of the line from New York to Liverpool, or Havre. It soon disappeared in the gloom. At ten o'clock in the evening the sky was on fire. The atmosphere was streaked with vivid lightning. I could not bear the brightness of it, while the captain, looking at it, seemed to envy the spirit of the tempest. A terrible noise filled the air, a complex noise made up of the howls of the crushed waves, the roaring of the wind, and the claps of thunder. The wind veered suddenly to all points of the horizon, and the cyclone, rising in the east, returned after passing by the north, west, and south, in the inverse course pursued by the circular storm of the southern hemisphere. Ah, that gulf stream! It deserves its name of the King of Tempests. It is that which causes those formidable cyclones. 
by the difference of temperature between its air and its currents. A shower of fire had succeeded the rain. The drops of water were changed to sharp spikes. One would have thought that Captain Nemo was courting a death worthy of himself, a death by lightning. As the Nautilus, pitching dreadfully, raised its steel spur in the air, it seemed to act as a conductor, and I saw long sparks burst from it. Crushed and without strength, I crawled to the panel, opened it, and descended to the saloon. The storm was then at its height. It was impossible to stand upright in the interior of the Nautilus. Captain Nemo came down about twelve. I heard the reservoirs filling by degrees, and the Nautilus sank slowly beneath the waves. Through the open windows in the saloon I saw large fish terrified passing like phantoms in the water. Some were struck before my eyes. The Nautilus was still descending. I thought that at about eight fathoms deep we should find a calm. But no, the upper beds were too violently agitated for that. We had to seek repose at more than twenty-five fathoms in the bowels of the deep. But there, what quiet, what silence, what peace. Who could have told that such a hurricane had been let loose on the surface of that ocean? Chapter 44 In latitude 47 degrees 24 and longitude 17 degrees 28. In consequence of the storm, we had been thrown eastward once more. All hope of escape on the shores of New York or St. Lawrence had faded away. And poor Ned, in despair, had isolated himself like Captain Nemo. Conseil and I, however, never left each other. I said that the Nautilus had gone aside to the east. I should have said, to be more exact, the northeast. For some days it wandered first on the surface and then beneath it, amid those fogs so dreaded by sailors. What accidents are due to these thick fogs? What shocks up these reefs when the wind drowns the breaking of the waves? What collisions between vessels in spite of their warning lights, whistles and alarm bells? And the bottom of these seas look like a field of battle, where still lie all the conquered of the ocean some old and already encrusted, others fresh and reflecting from their iron bands and copper plates the brilliancy of our lantern. On the 15th of May we were at the extreme south of the bank of Newfoundland. This bank consists of alluvia, or large heaps of organic matter, brought either from the equator by the Gulf Stream, or from the North Pole by the countercurrent of cold water which skirts the American coast. There also are heaped up those erratic blocks which are carried along by the broken ice, and close by, a vast charnel house of mollusks, which perish here by millions. The depths of the sea is not great at Newfoundland, not more than some hundreds of fathoms. But towards the south is a depression of fifteen hundred fathoms. There the gulf stream widens, it loosens some of its speed and some of its temperature, but it becomes a sea. It was on the 17th of May, about 500 miles from heart's content, at a depth of more than 1,400 fathoms, that I saw the electric cable lying on the bottom. Conseil, to whom I had not mentioned it, thought at first that it was a gigantic sea serpent. But I undeceived the worthy fellow, and by way of consolation related several particulars in the laying of this cable. The first one was laid in the years 1857 and 1858, but, after transmitting about 400 telegrams, would not act any longer. In 1863 the engineers constructed another one, measuring 2,000 miles in length, and weighing 4,500 tons, which was embarked on the Great Eastern. This attempt also failed. On the 25th of May, the Nautilus, being at a depth of more than 1,918 fathoms, was on the precise spot where the rupture occurred which ruined the enterprise. It was within 638 miles of the coast of Ireland, and at half past two in the afternoon, they discovered that communication with Europe had ceased. The electricians on board resolved to cut the cable before finishing it up, and at eleven o'clock at night they had recovered the damaged part. They made another point and spliced it, and it was once more submerged. 
but some days after it broke again, and in the depths of the ocean could not be recaptured. The Americans, however, were not discouraged. Cyrus Field, the bold promoter of the enterprise, as he had sunk all his own fortune, set a new subscription on foot, which was at once answered, and another cable was constructed on better principles. The bundles of conducting wires were each enveloped in gutta percha, and protected by a wadding of hemp contained in a metallic covering. The Great Eastern sailed on the 13th of July, 1866. The operation worked well, but one incident occurred. Several times in unrolling the cable, they observed that nails had recently been forced into it, evidently with the motive of destroying it. Captain Anderson, the officers and engineers consulted together, and had it posted up that, if the offender was surprised on board, he would be thrown without further trial into the sea. From that time the criminal attempt was never repeated. On the 23rd of July the Great Eastern was not more than 500 miles from Newfoundland, when they telegraphed from Ireland the news of the armistice concluded between Prussia and Austria after Sadawa. On the 27th, in the midst of heavy fogs, they reached the port of Heart's Content. The enterprise was successfully terminated, and for its first dispatch, young America addressed old Europe in these words of wisdom so rarely understood. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. I did not expect to find the electric cable in its primitive state, such as it was on leaving the manufactory. The long serpent covered with the remains of shells, bristling with foraminiferae, was encrusted with a strong coating, which served as a protection against all boring mollusks. It lay quietly sheltered from the motions of the sea, and under a favourable pressure for the transmission of the electric spark, which passes from Europe to America in point thirty-two of a second. Doubtless this cable will last for a great length of time, for they find that the gutta percha covering is improved by the sea water. Besides, on this level so well chosen, the cable is never so deeply submerged as to cause it to break. The Nautilus followed it to the lowest depth, which was more than two thousand two hundred and twelve fathoms and there it lay without any anchorage. And then we reached the spot where the accident had taken place in 1863. The bottom of the ocean then formed a valley about a hundred miles broad, in which Mont Blanc might have been placed without its summit appearing above the waves. This valley is closed at the east by a perpendicular wall more than two thousand yards high. We arrived there on the 28th of May, and the Nautilus was then not more a hundred and twenty miles from Ireland. Was Captain Nemo going to land on the British Isles? No. To my great surprise, he made for the south, once more coming back towards European seas. In rounding the Emerald Isle, for one instance I caught sight of Cape Clear, and the light which guides the thousands of vessels leaving Glasgow or Liverpool. An important question then arose in my mind. Did the Nautilus dare entangle itself in the Manche? Ned Land, who had reappeared since we had been nearing land, did not cease to question me. How could I answer? Captain Nemo remained invisible. After having shown the Canadian a glimpse of American shores, was he going to show me the coast of France? But the Nautilus was still going southward. On the 30th of May it passed in sight of Land's End between the extreme point of England and the Sicily Isles, which were left to starboard. If we wished to enter the Manche, he must go straight to the east. He did not do so. During the whole of the 31st of May, the Nautilus described a series of circles on the water which greatly interested me. It seemed to be seeking a spot it had some trouble in finding. At noon, Captain Nemo himself came to work the ship's log, he spoke no word to me, but seemed gloomier than ever. What could sadden him thus? Was it his proximity to European shores? Had he some recollections of his abandoned country? If not, what did he feel? Remorse or regret? For a long while this thought haunted my mind, and I had a kind of presentiment that before long chance would betray the captain's secrets. 
The next day, the 1st of June, the Nautilus continued the same process. It was evidently seeking some particular spot in the ocean. Captain Nemo took the sun's altitude as he had done the day before. The sea was beautiful, the sky clear. About eight miles to the east, a large steam vessel could be discerned on the horizon. No flag fluttered from its mast, and I could not discover its nationality. Some minutes before the sun passed the meridian, Captain Nemo took his sextant and watched with great attention. The perfect rest of the water greatly helped the operation. The Nautilus was motionless. It neither rolled nor pitched. I was on the platform when the altitude was taken, and the captain pronounced these words. It is here. He turned and went below. Had he seen the vessel which was changing its course and seemed to be nearing us? I could not tell. I returned to the saloon. The panels closed. I heard the hissing of the water in the reservoirs. The Nautilus began to sink, following a vertical line, for its screw communicated no motion to it. Some minutes later it stopped at a depth of more than four hundred and twenty fathoms resting on the ground. The luminous ceiling was darkened, then the panels were opened, and through the glass I saw the sea brilliantly illuminated by the rays of our lantern for at least half a mile round us. I looked to the port side and saw nothing but an immensity of quiet waters, but to starboard on the bottom appeared a large protuberance, which at once attracted my attention. One would have thought it a ruin buried under a coating of white shells, much resembling a covering of snow. Upon examining the mass attentively, I could recognize the ever-thickening form of a vessel bare of its masts, which must have sunk. It certainly belonged to past times. This wreck, to be thus encrusted with the lime of the water, must already be able to count many years past at the bottom of the ocean. What was this vessel? Why did the Nautilus visit its tomb? Could it have been aught but a shipwreck which had drawn it under the water? I knew not what to think. When near me, in a slow voice, I heard Captain Nemo say, At one time, the ship was called the Marseillaise. It carried seventy-four guns and was launched in 1762. In 1778, the 13th of August, commanded by La Puepe Vietrio, it fought boldly against the Preston. In 1779, on the 4th of July, it was at the taking of Granada with the squadron of Admiral Estang. In 1781, on the 5th of September, it took part in the Battle of Comte de Croix in Chesapeake Bay. In 1794, the French Republic changed its name. On the 16th of April in the same year, it joined the squadron of Villarret Joyeuse at Brest, being entrusted with the escort of a cargo of corn coming from America, under the command of Admiral Van Stabel. On the eleventh and twelfth prairial of the second year, this squadron fell in with an English vessel. Sir, today is the thirteenth prairial, the first of June, 1868. It is now seventy-four years ago, day for day, on this very spot, in latitude forty-seven degrees twenty-four, longitude seventeen degrees twenty-eight, that this vessel, after fighting heroically, losing its three masts with the water in its hold, and the third of its crew disabled, preferred sinking with its three hundred and fifty-six sailors to surrendering, and nailing its colors to the poop, disappeared under the waves to the cry of long live the Republic. The Avenger, I exclaimed. Yes, sir, the Avenger, a good name, muttered Captain Nemo, crossing his arms. Chapter 45 A Mass Execution The way of describing this unlooked-for scene 
The history of the Patriot ship, told at first so coldly, and the emotion with which this strange man pronounced the last words, the name of the Avenger, the significance of which could not escape me, all impressed itself deeply on my mind. My eyes did not leave the captain, who, with his hand stretched out to sea, was watching with a glowing eye the glorious wreck. Perhaps I was never to know who he was, from whence he came, or where he was going to. But I saw the man move, and apart from the savant. It was no common misanthropy, which had shut Captain Nemo and his companions within the Nautilus, but a hatred, either monstrous or sublime, which time could never weaken. Did this hatred still seek for vengeance? The future would soon teach me that. But the Nautilus was rising slowly to the surface of the sea, and the form of the Avenger disappeared by degrees from my sight. Soon a slight rolling told me that we were in the open air. At that moment a dull boom was heard. I looked at the captain. He did not move. Captain, said I. He did not answer. I left him and mounted the platform. Conseil and the Canadian were already there. Where did that sound come from? I asked. It was a gunshot, replied Ned Land. I looked in the direction of the vessel I had already seen. It was nearing the Nautilus, and we could see that it was putting on steam. It was within six miles of us. What is that ship, Ned? By its rigging and the height of its lower masts, said the Canadian. I bet she is a ship of war. May it reach us, and if necessary, sink this cursed Nautilus. Fred Ned, replied Conseil, what harm can it do to the Nautilus? Can it attack it beneath the waves? Can it cannonade us at the bottom of the sea? Tell me, Ned, said I, can you recognize what country she belongs to? The Canadian knitted his eyebrows, dropped his eyelids, and screwed up the corners of his eyes, and for a few moments fixed a piercing look upon the vessel. No, sir, he replied. I cannot tell what nation she belongs to, for she shows no colors. But I can declare she is a man of war, for a long pennant flutters from her main mast. For a quarter of an hour we watched the ship which was steaming towards us. I could not, however, believe that she could see the Nautilus from that distance, and still less that she could know what this submarine engine was. Soon the Canadian informed me that she was a large, armoured, two-decker ram. A thick black smoke was pouring from her two funnels. Her closely furled sails were stopped to her yards. She hoisted no flag at her mizzen peak. The distance prevented us from distinguishing the colours of her pennant, which floated like a thin ribbon. She advanced rapidly. If Captain Nemo allowed her to approach, there was a chance of salvation for us. Sir, said Ned Land, if that vessel passes within a mile of us, I shall throw myself into the sea, and I should advise you to do the same. I did not reply to the Canadian suggestion, but continued watching the ship. Whether English, French, American, or Russian, she would be sure to take us in if we could only reach her. Presently a white smoke burst from the forepart of the vessel. Some seconds after, the water, agitated by the fall of a heavy body, splashed the stern of the Nautilus, and shortly afterwards a loud explosion struck my ear. "'What? They are firing at us!' I exclaimed. "'So please you, sir,' said Ned. "'They have recognized the unicorn, and they are firing at us.' "'But,' I exclaimed, "'surely they can see that there are men in the case.' "'It is perhaps because of that,' replied Ned Land, looking at me. "'A whole flood of light burst upon my mind. "'Doubtless they knew now how to believe the stories of the pretended monster. "'No doubt, on board the Abraham Lincoln when the Canadian struck it with the harpoon.' Commander Farragut had recognized in the supposed narwhale a submarine vessel, more dangerous than a supernatural cetacean. Yes, it must have been so. 
and on every sea they were now seeking this engine of destruction. Terrible indeed. If, as we supposed, Captain Nemo employed the Nautilus in works of vengeance. On the night when we were imprisoned in that cell, in the midst of the Indian Ocean, had he not attacked some vessel? The man buried in the coral cemetery, had he not been a victim to the shock caused by the Nautilus? Yes, I repeat it, it must be so. One part of the mysterious existence of Captain Nemo had been unveiled, and, if his identity had not been recognized, at least the nations united against him were no longer hunting a chimerical creature, but a man who had vowed a deadly hatred against them. All the formidable past rose before me. Instead of meeting friends on board the approaching ship, we could only expect pitiless enemies. But the shot rattled about us. Some of them struck the sea and ricocheted, losing themselves in the distance. But none touched the Nautilus. The vessel was not more than three miles from us. In spite of the serious cannonade, Captain Nemo did not appear on the platform. But if one of the conical projectiles had struck the shell of the Nautilus, it would have been fatal. The Canadian then said, Sir, we must do all we can to get out of this dilemma. Let us signal them. They will then perhaps understand that we are honest folks. Ned Land took his handkerchief to wave in the air, but he had scarcely displayed it when he was struck down by an iron hand and fell, in spite of his great strength, upon the deck. Fool! exclaimed the captain. Do you wish to be pierced by the spur of the Nautilus before it is hurled at this vessel? Captain Nemo was terrible to hear. He was still more terrible to see. His face was deadly pale with a spasm at his heart. For an instant it must have ceased to beat. His pupils were fearfully contracted. He did not speak, he roared. As with his body thrown forward, he wrung the Canadian's shoulders. Then, leaving him and turning to the ship of war, whose shot was still raining around him, he exclaimed with a powerful voice, Ah, ship of an accursed nation, you know who I am. I do not want your colors to know you by. Look, and I will show you mine. And on the forepart of the platform, Captain Nemo unfurled a black flag, similar to the one he had placed at the South Pole. At that moment a shot struck the shell of the Nautilus obliquely, without piercing it, and rebounding near the captain was lost in the sea. He shrugged his shoulders and, addressing me, said shortly, Go down, you and your companions, go down. Sir, I cried, are you going to attack this vessel? Sir, I am going to sink it. You will not do that. I shall do it. He replied coldly, and I advise you not to judge me, sir. Fate has shown you what you ought not to have seen. The attack has begun. Go down. What is this vessel? You do not know? Very well. So much the better. Its nationality to you, at least, will be a secret. Go down. We could but obey. About fifteen of the sailors surrounded the captain, looking with implacable hatred at the vessel nearing them. One could feel that the same desire of vengeance animated every soul. I went down at the moment another projectile struck the Nautilus, and I heard the captain exclaim, Strike, mad vessel! Shower your useless shot, and then you will not escape the spur of the Nautilus! But it is not here that you shall perish. I would not have your ruins mingle with those of the Avenger! I reached my room. The captain and his second had remained on the platform. The screw was set in motion, and the Nautilus, moving with speed, was soon beyond the reach of the ship's guns. But the pursuit continued, and Captain Nemo contented himself with keeping his distance. About four in the afternoon, being no longer able to contain my impatience, I went to the central staircase. The panel was open, and I ventured on to the platform. The captain was still walking up and down with an agitated step. He was looking at the ship which was five or six miles to leeward. He was going round it like a wild beast, and drawing it eastward he allowed them to pursue. But he did not attack. Perhaps he still hesitated? I wished to mediate once more. 
but I had scarcely spoken when Captain Nemo imposed silence, saying, I am the law, and I am the judge. I am the oppressed, and there is the oppressor. Through him I have lost all that I loved, cherished, and venerated. Country, wife, children, father, and mother. I saw all perish. All that I hate is there. Say no more. I cast a look at the man of war which was putting on steam, and rejoined Ned and Conseil. We will fly, I exclaimed. Good, said Ned. What is this vessel? I do not know, but whatever it is, it will be sunk before night. In any case, it is better to perish with it than to be made accomplices in a retaliation the justice of which we cannot judge. That is my opinion, too, said Ned Land coolly. Let us wait for night. Night arrived. Deep silence reigned on board. The compass showed that the Nautilus had not altered its course. It was on the surface rolling slightly. My companions and I resolved to fly when the vessel should be near enough, either to hear us or to see us. For the moon, which would be full in two or three days, shone brightly. Once on board the ship, if we could not prevent the blow which threatened it, we could, at least we would, do all that circumstances would allow. Several times I thought the Nautilus was preparing for attack, but Captain Nemo contended himself with allowing his adversary to approach, and then fled once more before it. Part of the night passed without any incident. We watched the opportunity for action. We spoke little, for we were too much moved. Ned Land would have thrown himself into the sea, but I forced him to wait. According to my idea, the Nautilus would attack the ship at her waterline, and then it would not only be possible, but easy to fly. At three in the morning, full of uneasiness, I mounted the platform. Captain Nemo had not left it. He was standing at the forepart near his flag, which a slight breeze displayed above his head. He did not take his eyes from the vessel. The intensity of his look seemed to attract and fascinate and draw it onward more surely than if he had been towing it. The moon was then passing the meridian. Jupiter was rising in the east. Amid this peaceful scene of nature, sky and ocean rivaled each other in tranquillity, the sea offering to the orbs of night the finest mirror they could ever have in which to reflect their image. As I thought of the deep calm of these elements compared with all those passions brooding imperceptibly within the Nautilus, I shuddered. The vessel was within two miles of us. It was ever nearing that phosphorescent light which showed the presence of the Nautilus. I could see its green and red lights and its white lantern hanging from the large foremast. An indistinct vibration quivered through its rigging, showing that the furnaces were heated to the uttermost. Sheaves of sparks and red ashes flew from the funnels, shining in the atmosphere like stars. I remained thus until six in the morning, without Captain Nemo noticing me. The ship stood about a mile and a half from us, and with the first dawn of day the firing began afresh. The moment could not be far off when, the Nautilus attacking its adversary, my companions and myself should forever leave this man. I was preparing to go down to remind them when the second mounted the platform, accompanied by several sailors. Captain Nemo either did not or would not see them. Some steps were taken which might be called the signal for action. They were very simple. The iron balustrade around the platform was lowered, and the lantern and pilot cages were pushed within the shell until they were flush with the deck. The long surface of the steel cigar no longer offered a single point to check its maneuvers. I returned to the saloon. The Nautilus still floated. Some streaks of light were flittering through the liquid beds. With the undulations of the waves, the windows were brightened by the red streaks of the rising sun, and this dreadful day of the 2nd of June had dawned. At five o'clock the log showed that the speed of the Nautilus was slackening, and I knew that it was allowing them to draw nearer. Besides, the reports were heard more distinctly, and the projectiles laboring through the ambient water 
were extinguished with a strange hissing noise. My friends, said I, the moment is come. One grasp of the hand, and may God protect us. Ned Land was resolute. Conseil calm, myself so nervous that I knew not how to contain myself. We all passed into the library, but the moment I pushed the door opening onto the central staircase, I heard the upper panel close sharply. The Canadian rushed on to the stairs, but I stopped him. A well-known hissing noise told me that the water was running into the reservoirs, and in a few minutes the Nautilus was some yards beneath the surface of the waves. I understood the maneuver. It was too late to act. The Nautilus did not wish to strike at the impenetrable cuirass, but below the water line, where the metallic covering no longer protected it. We were again imprisoned, unwilling witnesses of the dreadful drama that was preparing. We had scarcely time to reflect. Taking refuge in my room, we looked at each other without speaking. A deep stupor had taken hold of my mind. Thought seemed to stand still. I was in that painful state of expectation preceding a dreadful report. I waited, I listened, every sense was merged in that of hearing. The speed of the Nautilus was accelerated. It was preparing to rush. The whole ship trembled. Suddenly I screamed. I felt the shock, but comparatively light. I felt the penetrating power of the steel spur. I heard rattlings and scrapings. But the Nautilus, carried along by its propelling power, passed through the mass of the vessel like a needle through sailcloth. I could stand it no longer. Mad, out of my mind, I rushed from my room into the saloon. Captain Nemo was there, mute, gloomy, implacable. He was looking through the port panel. A large mass cast a shadow on the water, and that it might lose nothing of her agony, the Nautilus was going down into the abyss with her. Ten yards from me I saw the open shell through which the water was rushing with the noise of thunder, then the double line of guns and the netting. The bridge was covered with black agitated shadows. The water was rising. The poor creatures were crowding the ratlines, clinging to the masts, struggling under the water. It was a human ant heap overtaken by the sea. Paralyzed, stiffened with anguish, my hair standing on end, with eyes wide open, panting without breath and without voice, I too was watching. An irresistible attraction glued me to the glass. Suddenly an explosion took place. The compressed air blew up her decks, and if the magazines had caught fire, then the unfortunate vessel sank more rapidly. Her topmast laden with victims now appeared, then her spars bending under the weight of men, and last of all the top of her mainmast. Then the dark mass disappeared, and with it the dead crew drawn down by the strong eddy. I turned to Captain Nemo. That terrible avenger, a perfect archangel of hatred, was still looking. When all was over, he turned to his room, opened the door, and entered. I followed him with my eyes. On the end wall beneath his heroes, I saw the portrait of a woman, still young, and two little children. Captain Nemo looked at them for some moments, stretched his arms toward them, and, kneeling down, burst into deep sobs. Chapter 46 The Last Words of Captain Nemo The panels had closed on this dreadful vision, but light had not returned to the saloon. It was silence and darkness within the Nautilus. At wonderful speed, a hundred feet beneath the water, it was leaving this desolate spot. Whither was it going? To the north or south? Where was the man flying to after such dreadful retaliation? I had returned to my room when Ned and Conseil had remained silent enough. I felt an insurmountable horror for Captain Nemo. Whatever he had suffered at the hands of these men, he had no right to punish thus. He had made me, if not an accomplice, at least a witness of his vengeance. 
At eleven the electric light reappeared. I passed into the saloon. It was deserted. I consulted the different instruments. The Nautilus was flying northward at the rate of twenty-five miles an hour, now on the surface and now thirty feet below it. On taking the bearings by the chart, I saw that we were passing the mouth of the Manche, and that our course was hurrying us towards the northern seas at a frightful speed. That night we had crossed two hundred leagues of the Atlantic. The shadows fell, and the sea was covered with darkness until the rising of the moon. I went to my room, but could not sleep. I was troubled with dreadful nightmare. The horrible scene of destruction was continually before my eyes. From that day, who could tell into what part of the North Atlantic Basin the Nautilus would take us? Still with unaccountable speed, still in the midst of these northern fogs. Would it touch at Spitsbergen or on the shores of Nova Zembla? Should we explore those unknown seas, the White Sea, the Sea of Kara, the Gulf of Ob, the archipelago of Lirov, and the unknown coast of Asia? I could not say. I could no longer judge on the time that was passing. The clocks had been stopped on board. It seemed, as in polar countries, that night and day no longer followed their regular course. I felt myself being drawn into that strange region where the founded imagination of Edgar Poe roamed at will. Like the fabulous Gordon Pym, at every moment I expected to see that veiled human figure of larger proportions than those of any inhabitant of the earth thrown across the cataract which defends the approach to the pole. I estimated, though perhaps I may be mistaken, I estimated this adventurous course of the Nautilus to have lasted fifteen or twenty days, and I know not how much longer it might have lasted had it not been for the catastrophe which ended this voyage. Of Captain Nemo I saw nothing whatever now, nor of his second. Not a man of the crew was visible for an instant. The Nautilus was almost incessantly under water. When we came to the surface to renew the air, the panels opened and shut mechanically. There were no more marks in the planisphere. I knew not where we were, and the Canadian, too, his strength and patience at an end, appeared no more. Conseil could not draw a word from him, and, fearing that, in a dreadful fit of madness he might kill himself, watched him with constant devotion. One morning, what date it was I could not say, I had fallen into a heavy sleep towards the early hours, a sleep both painful and unhealthy, when I suddenly awoke. Ned Land was leaning over me, saying in a low voice, We are going to fly. I sat up. When shall we go? I asked. Tonight. All inspection on board the Nautilus seems to have ceased. All appear to be stupefied. Will you be ready, sir? Yes. Where are we? In sight of land, I took the reckoning this morning in the fog, twenty miles to the east. What country is it? I do not know, but whatever it is, we will take refuge there. Yes, Ned, yes. We will fly tonight, even if the sea should swallow us up. The sea is bad. The wind violent, but twenty miles in that light boat of the Nautilus does not frighten me. Unknown to the crew, I have been able to procure food and some bottles of water. I will follow you. But, continued the Canadian, if I am surprised, I will defend myself. I will force them to kill me. We will die together, friend Ned. I had made up my mind to all. The Canadian left me. I reached the platform on which I could with difficulty support myself against the shock of the waves. The sky was threatening. But, as land was in those thick brown shadows, we must fly. I returned to the saloon, fearing and yet hoping to see Captain Nemo, wishing and yet not wishing to see him. What could I have said to him? Could I hide the involuntary horror with which he inspired me? No. It was better that I should not meet him face to face, better to forget him. And yet... How long seemed that day, the last that I should pass in the Nautilus? I remained alone. Ned Land and Conseil avoided speaking, for fear of betraying themselves. 
At six I dined, but I was not hungry. I forced myself to eat in spite of my disgust, that I might not weaken myself. At half-past six Ned Land came to my room, saying, We shall not see each other again before our departure. At ten the moon will not be risen. We will profit by the darkness. Come to the boat. Conseil and I will wait for you. The Canadian went out without giving me time to answer. Wishing to verify the course of the Nautilus, I went to the saloon. We were running north-northeast at frightful speed, and more than fifty yards deep. I cast a look on these wonders of nature, on the riches of art heaped up in the museum, upon the unrivaled collection destined to perish at the bottom of the sea, with him who had formed it. I wished to fix an indelible impression of it in my mind. I remained an hour thus, bathed in the light of that luminous ceiling, and passing in review those treasures shining under their glasses. Then I returned to my room. I dressed myself in strong sea clothing. I collected my notes, placing them carefully about me. My heart beat loudly. I could not check its pulsations. Certainly my trouble and agitation would have betrayed me to Captain Nemo's eyes. What was he doing at this moment? I listened at the door of his room. I heard steps. Captain Nemo was there. He had not gone to rest. At every moment I expected to see him appear and ask me why I wished to fly. I was constantly on alert. My imagination magnified everything. The impression became at last so poignant that I asked myself if it would not be better to go to the captain's room, see him face to face, and brave him with look and gesture. It was the inspiration of a madman. Fortunately, I resisted the desire and stretched myself on my bed to quiet my bodily agitation. My nerves were somewhat calmer, but in my excited brain I saw over again all my existence on board the Nautilus, every incident, either happy or unfortunate, which had happened since my disappearance from the Abraham Lincoln. The submarine hunt, the Torres Strait, the savages of Papua, the running ashore, the coral cemetery, the passage of Suez, the island of Santorini, the Cretan diver, Vigo Bay, Atlantis, the iceberg, the South Pole, the imprisonment in the ice, the fight among the polyps, the storm in the Gulf Stream, the Avenger, and the horrible scene of the vessel sunk with all her crew. All these events passed before my eyes like scenes in a drama. Then Captain Nemo seemed to grow enormously, his features to assume superhuman proportions. He was no longer my equal, but a man of the waters, the genie of the sea. It was then half-past nine. I held my head between my hands to keep it from bursting. I closed my eyes. I would not think any longer. There was another half-hour to wait, another half-hour of a nightmare, which might drive me mad. At that moment I heard the distant strains of the organ, a sad harmony to an undefinable chant, the wail of a soul longing to break these earthly bonds. I listened with every sense, scarcely breathing, plunged like Captain Nemo in that musical ecstasy which was drawing him in spirit to the end of life. Then a sudden thought terrified me. Captain Nemo had left his room. He was in the saloon, which I must cross to fly. There I should meet him for the last time. He would see me, perhaps speak to me. A gesture of his might destroy me, a single word chain me on board. But Tin was about to strike. The moment had come for me to leave my room and join my companions. I must not hesitate, even if Captain Nemo himself should rise before me. I opened my door carefully, and even then, as it turned on its hinges, it seemed to me to make a dreadful noise. Perhaps it only existed in my own imagination. I crept along the dark stairs of the Nautilus, stopping at each step to check the beating of my heart. I reached the door of the saloon and opened it gently. It was plunged in profound darkness. The strains of the organ sounded faintly. Captain Nemo was there. He did not see me. 
In the full light I do not think he would have noticed me, so entirely was he absorbed in the ecstasy. I crept along the carpet, avoiding the slightest sound which might betray my presence. I was at least five minutes reaching the door at the opposite side opening into the library. I was going to open it when a sigh from Captain Nemo nailed me to the spot. I knew that he was rising. I could even see him, for the light from the library came through to the saloon. He came towards me silently, with his arms crossed gliding like a spectre rather than walking. His breast was swelling with sobs, and I heard him murmur these words, the last which ever struck my ear. Almighty God, enough, enough. Was it a confession of remorse which thus escaped from this man's conscience? In desperation I rushed through the library, mounted the central staircase, and, following the upper flight, reached the boat. I crept through the opening which had already admitted my two companions. Let us go! Let us go! I exclaimed. Directly, replied the Canadian. The orifice in the plates of the Nautilus was first closed and fastened down by means of a false key, with which Ned Land had provided himself. The opening in the boat was also closed. The Canadian began to loosen the bolts which still held us to the submarine boat. Suddenly a noise was heard. Voices were answering each other loudly. What was the matter? Had they discovered our flight? I felt Ned Land slipping a dagger into my hand. Yes, I murmured. We know how to die. The Canadian had stopped in his work, but one word many times repeated, a dreadful word, revealed the cause of the agitation spreading on board the Nautilus. It was not we the crew were looking after. The maelstrom, the maelstrom, could a more dreadful word in a more dreadful situation have sounded in our ears? We were then upon the dangerous coast of Norway. Was the Nautilus being drawn into this gulf at the moment our boat was going to leave its sides? We knew that at the tide the pent-up waters between the islands of Ferro and Lofoden rush with irresistible violence, forming a whirlpool from which no vessel ever escapes. From every point of the horizon enormous waves were meeting, forming a gulf justly called the navel of the ocean, whose power of attraction extends to a distance of twenty miles. There not only vessels but whales are sacrificed, as well as white bears from the northern regions. It is thither that the Nautilus voluntarily or involuntarily had been run by the captain. It was describing a spiral, the circumference of which was lessening by degrees, and the boat, which was still fastened to its side, was carried along with giddy speed. I felt that sicky giddiness which arises from long, continued whirling round. We were in dread. Our horror was at its height, circulation had stopped, all nervous influence was annihilated, and we were covered with cold sweat, like a sweat of agony. And what noise around our frail bark, what roarings repeated by the echo miles away, what an uproar was that of the waters broken on the sharp rocks at the bottom, where the hardest bodies are crushed and trees worn away, with all the fur rubbed off, according to the Norwegian phrase. What a situation to be in! We rocked frightfully. The Nautilus defended itself like a human being. Its steel muscles cracked. Sometimes it seemed to stand upright, and we with it. We must hold on, said Ned, and look after the bolts. We may still be saved if we stick to the Nautilus. He had not finished the words when we heard a crashing noise. The bolts gave way, and the boat, torn from its groove, was hurled like a stone from a sling into the midst of the whirlpool. My head struck on a piece of iron, and with the violent shock I lost all consciousness. Chapter 47 Conclusion Thus ends the voyage under the seas. What passed during that night, how the boat escaped from the eddies of the maelstrom, how Ned Land, Conseil, and myself ever came out of the gulf, I cannot tell. But when I returned to consciousness, I was lying in a fisherman's hut on the Lofoden Isles. My two companions, safe and sound, 
were near me, holding my hands. We embraced each other heartily. At that moment we could not think of returning to France. The means of communication between the north of Norway and the south are rare, and I am therefore obliged to wait for the steamboat running monthly from Cape North. And, among the worthy people who have so kindly received us, I revise my record of these adventures once more. Not a fact has been omitted, not a detail exaggerated. It is a faithful narrative of this incredible expedition, in an element inaccessible to man, but to which progress will one day open a road. Shall I be believed? I do not know. And it matters little, after all. What I now affirm is that I have a right to speak of these seas, under which, in less than ten months, I have crossed twenty thousand leagues in that submarine tour of the world, which has revealed so many wonders. But what has become of the Nautilus? Did it resist the pressure of the maelstrom? Does Captain Nemo still live, and does he still follow under the ocean those frightful retaliations? Or did he stop after the last hecatomb? Will the waves one day carry to him this manuscript containing the history of his life? Shall I ever know the name of this man? Will the missing vessel tell us by its nationality that of Captain Nemo? I hope so. And I also hope that his powerful vessel has conquered the sea at its most terrible gulf, and that the Nautilus has survived where so many other vessels have been lost. If it be so, if Captain Nemo still inhabits the ocean, his adopted country, may hatred be appeased in that savage heart, may the contemplation of so many wonders extinguish for ever the spirit of vengeance. May the judge disappear, and the philosopher continue the peaceful exploration of the sea. If his destiny be strange, it is also sublime. Have I not understood it myself? Have I not lived ten months of this unnatural life? And to the question asked by Ecclesiastes three thousand years ago, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Two men alone, of all now living, have the right to give an answer. Captain Nemo and myself.